Section 1 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 1. Dedications. By the Council of the Royal Society of London for Improving of Natural Knowledge, ordered that the book written by Robert Hooke, M.A., Fellow of this Society, entitled Micrographia, or Some Physiological Descriptions of Minute Bodies Made by Magnifying Glasses with Observations and Inquiries Thereupon, be printed by John Martin and James Allistry, printers to the said Society. November 23, 1664. Brunker, P.R.S. Micrographia, or some physiological descriptions of minute bodies, made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon, by R. Hook, Fellow of the Royal Society. Non posis oculo quantum contendere lincus, non temen in circo contemnus lippus inungui, Horatius epistularum liber primus. London printed by John Martin and James Allistry, printers to the Royal Society, and are to be sold at their shop at the Bell in St. Paul's Churchyard, 1665. To the King, Sir, I do here most humbly lay this small present at Your Majesty's royal feet, and though it comes accompanied with two disadvantages, the meanness of the author and of the subject, yet in both I am encouraged by the greatness of your mercy and your knowledge. By the one I am taught that you can forgive the most presumptuous offenders, and by the other that you will not esteem the least work of nature or art unworthy your observation. Amidst the many felicities that have accompanied your majesty's happy restoration in government, it is none of the least considerable that philosophy and experimental learning have prospered under your royal patronage. And as the calm prosperity of your reign has given us the leisure to follow these studies of quiet and retirement, so it is just that the fruits of them should, by way of acknowledgment, be returned to your majesty. There are, sir, several other of your subjects of your royal society now busy about nobler matters, the improvement of manufactures in agriculture, the increase of commerce, the advantage of navigation, in all which they are assisted by your majesty's encouragement and example. Amidst all those greater designs, I here presume to bring in that which is more proportional to the smallness of my abilities, and to offer some of the least of all visible things to that mighty king that has established an empire over the best of all invisible things of this world, the minds of men. Your Majesty's most humble and most obedient subject and servant, Robert Hooke. To the Royal Society after my address to our great founder and patron, I could not but think myself obliged, in consideration of those many engagements you have laid upon me, to offer these my poor labors to this most illustrious assembly. You have been pleased formally to accept of these rude drafts. I have since added to them some descriptions and some conjectures of my own. And therefore, together with your acceptance, I must also beg your pardon. The rules you have prescribed yourselves in your philosophical progress do seem the best that have ever yet been practiced, and particularly that of avoiding dogmatizing and the espousal of any hypothesis not sufficiently grounded and confirmed by experiments. This way seems the most excellent, and may preserve both philosophy and natural history from its former corruptions. In saying which, I may seem to condemn my own course in this treatise in which there may perhaps be some expressions which may seem more positive than your prescriptions will permit. And though I desire to have them understood only as conjectures and queries, which your method does not altogether disallow, yet if even in those I have exceeded, tis fit that I should declare that it was not done by your directions. For it is most unreasonable that you should undergo the imputation of the faults of my conjectures, seeing you can receive so small advantage of reputation by the slight observations of your most humble and most faithful servant, Robert Hooke. End of section 1. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 2 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 2. The Preface. Part 1. It is the great prerogative of mankind above other creatures that we are not only able to behold the works of nature, or barely to sustain our lives by them, but we have also the power of considering, comparing, altering, assisting, and improving them to various uses. And as this is the peculiar privilege of human nature in general, so it is capable of being so far advanced by the helps of art and experience, as to make some men excel others in their observations and deductions almost as much as they do beasts. By the addition of such artificial instruments and methods there may be in some manner a reparation made for the mischiefs and imperfection mankind has drawn upon itself, by negligence and intemperance, and a willful and superstitious deserting the prescripts and rules of nature, whereby every man, both from a derived corruption, innate and born with him, and from his inbreeding and converse with men, is very subject to slip into all sorts of errors. The only way which now remains for us to recover some degree of those former perfections seems to be by rectifying the operations of the sense, the memory, and reason, since upon the evidence the strength, the integrity, and the right correspondence of all these, all the light, by which our actions are to be guided is to be renewed and all our command over things is to be established. It is therefore most worthy of our consideration to recollect their several defects, so that we may the better understand how to supply them, and by what assistances we may enlarge their power and secure them in performing their particular duties. As for the actions of our senses, we cannot but observe them to be in many particulars much outdone by those of other creatures, and when at best to be far short of the perfection they seem capable of. And these infirmities of the senses arise from a double cause, either from the disproportion of the object to the organ, whereby an infinite number of things can never enter into them, or else from error in the perception, that many things which come within their reach are not received in a right manner. The like frailties are to be found in the memory. We often let many things slip away from us which deserve to be retained, and of those which we treasure up a great part is either frivolous or false, and if good and substantial, either in tract of time obliterated or at best so overwhelmed and buried under more frothy notions, that when there is need of them they are in vain sought for. The two main foundations being so deceivable, it is no wonder that all the succeeding works which we build upon them, of arguing, concluding, defining, judging, and all the other degrees of reason, are liable to the same imperfection, being at best either vain or uncertain so that the errors of the understanding are answerable to the two other, being defective both in the quantity and goodness of its knowledge. For the limits to which our thoughts are confined are small in respect of the vast extent of nature itself. Some parts of it are too large to be comprehended and some too little to be perceived. And from thence it must follow that not having a full sensation of the object, we must be very lame and imperfect in our conceptions about it, and in all the proportions which we build upon it. Hence we often take the shadow of things for the substance, small appearances for good similitudes, similitudes for definitions, and even many of those, which we think to be the most solid definitions, are rather expressions of our own misguided apprehensions than of the true nature of the things themselves. The effects of these imperfections manifested in different ways according to the temper and disposition of the several minds of men. Some they incline to gross ignorance and stupidity, and others to a presumptuous imposing on other men's opinions, and a confident dogmatizing on matters whereof there is no assurance to be given. Thus all the uncertainty and mistakes of human actions proceed either from the narrowness and wandering of our senses, from the slipperiness or delusion of our memory, from the confinement or rashness of our understanding, so that tis no wonder that our power over natural causes and effects is so slowly improved seeing we are not only to contend with the obscurity and difficulty of the things whereon we work and think, but even the forces of our own minds conspire to betray us. These being the dangers in the process of human reason, the remedies of them all can only proceed from the real, the mechanical, the experimental philosophy, which has this advantage over the philosophy of discourse and disputation that whereas that chiefly aims at the subtlety of its deductions and conclusions without much regard to the first groundwork, which ought to be well laid on the sense and memory, 
So this intends the right ordering of them all, and the making them serviceable to each other. The first thing to be undertaken in this weighty work is a watchfulness over the failings and an enlargement of the dominion of the senses. To which end it is requisite, first, that there should be a scrupulous choice and a strict examination of the reality, constancy, and certainty of particulars that we admit. This is the first rise whereon truth is to begin, and here the most severe and most impartial diligence must be employed. The storing up of all without any regard to evidence or use will only tend to darkness and confusion. We must not therefore esteem the riches of our philosophical treasure by the number only, but chiefly by the weight. The most vulgar instances are not to be neglected, but above all the most instructive are to be entertained. The footsteps of nature are to be traced, not only in her ordinary course, but when she seems to be put to her shifts, to make many doublings and turnings, and to use some kind of art in endeavouring to avoid our discovery. The next care to be taken, in respect of the senses, is a supplying of their infirmities with instruments, and, as it were, the adding of artificial organs to the natural. This in one of them has been of late years accomplished with prodigious benefit to all sorts of useful knowledge, by the invention of optical glasses. By the means of telescopes there is nothing so far distant but may be represented to our view, and by the help of microscopes there is nothing so small as to escape our inquiry. Hence there is a new visible world, discovered to the understanding. By this means the heavens are opened, and a vast number of new stars and new motions and new productions appear in them, to which all the ancient astronomers were utterly strangers. By this the earth itself, which lies so near us, under our feet, shows quite a new thing to us and in every little particle of its matter. We now behold almost as great a variety of creatures as we were able before to reckon up in the whole universe itself. It seems not improbable but that by these helps the subtlety of the composition of bodies, the structures of their parts, the various textures of their matter, the instruments and manner of their inward motions, and all the other possible appearances of things may come to be more fully discovered, all which the ancient peripatetics were content to comprehend in two general and unless further explained useless words of matter and form from whence there may arise many admirable advantages towards the increase of the operative, and the mechanic knowledge to which this age seems so much inclined, because we may perhaps be enabled to discern all the secret workings of nature almost in the same manner as we do those that are the production of art, and are managed by wheels, and engines, and springs, that were devised by human wit. In this kind I here present to the world my imperfect endeavours, which though they shall prove no other way considerable, yet I hope they may be in some measure useful to the main design of a reformation in philosophy, if it be only by showing that there is not so much required towards it, any strength of imagination, or exactness of method, or depth of contemplation, though the addition of these, where they can be had, must needs produce a much more perfect composure, as a sincere hand and a faithful eye to examine and to record the things themselves as they appear and I beg my reader to let me take the boldness to assure him that in this present condition of knowledge a man so qualified as I have endeavoured to be, only with resolution and integrity and plain intentions of employing his senses aright, may venture to compare the reality and the usefulness of his services towards the true philosophy with those of other men, that are of much stronger and more acute speculations, that shall not make use of the same method by the senses. The truth is, the science of nature has been already too long made only a work of the brain and the fancy. It is now high time that it should return to the plainness and soundness of observations on material and obvious things. It is said of great empires that the best way to preserve them from decay is to bring them back to the first principles and arts on which they did begin. The same is undoubtedly true in philosophy that by wandering far away into invisible notions has almost quite destroyed itself, and it can never be recovered or continued but by returning into the same sensible paths in which it did at first proceed. If therefore the reader expects from me any infallible deductions or certainty of axioms, I am to say for myself that these stronger works of wit and imagination are above my weak abilities, or if they had not been so, I would not have made use of them in this present subject before me. Whenever he finds that I have ventured at any small conjectures, 
at the causes of the things that I have observed, I beseech him to look upon them only as doubtful problems and uncertain guesses, and not as unquestionable conclusions or matters of unconfutable science. I have produced nothing here with intent to bind his understanding to an implicit consent. I am so far from that that I desire him not absolutely to rely upon these observations of my eyes, if he finds them contradicted by the future ocular experiments of other and impartial discoverers. As for my part, I have obtained my end if these my small labors shall be thought fit to take up some place in the large stock of natural observations which so many hands are busy in providing. If I have contributed the meanest foundations whereon others may raise nobler superstructures, I am abundantly satisfied, and all my ambition is that I may serve to the great philosophers of this age, as the makers and the grinders of my glasses did to me, that I may prepare and furnish them with some materials, which they may afterwards order and manage with better skill and to far greater advantage. The next remedies in this universal cure of the mind are to be applied to the memory, and they are to consist of such directions as may inform us what things are best to be stored up for our purpose, and which is the best way of so disposing them, that they may not only be kept in safety, but ready and convenient to be at any time produced for use, as occasion shall require. But I will not here present myself in what I may say in another discourse, wherein I shall make an attempt to propose some considerations of the manner of compiling a natural and artificial history, and of so ranging and registering its particulars into philosophical tables, as may make them most useful for the raising of axioms and theories. The last indeed is the most hazardous enterprise, and yet the most necessary, and that is to take such care that the judgment and the reason of man, which is the third faculty to be repaired and improved, should receive such assistance as to avoid the dangers to which it is by nature most subject, the imperfections which I have already mentioned, to which it is liable, do either belong to the extent or the goodness of its knowledge. And here the difficulty is the greater, least that which may be thought a remedy, for the one should prove destructive to the other, least by seeking to enlarge our knowledge, we should render it weak and uncertain, and least by being too scrupulous and exact about every circumstance of it, we should confine and straighten it too much. In both these the middle ways are to be taken. Nothing is to be omitted, and yet everything to pass a mature deliberation. No intelligence from men of all professions and quarters of the world to be slighted, and yet all to be so severely examined that there remain no room for doubt or instability, much rigor in admitting, much strictness in comparing, and above all much slowness in debating, and shyness in determining, is to be practiced. The understanding is to order all the inferior services of the lower faculties, but yet it is to do this only as a lawful master and not a tyrant. It must not encroach upon their offices, nor take upon itself the employments which belong to either of them. It must watch the irregularities of the senses, but it must not go before them or prevent their information. It must examine, range, and dispose of the bank which it laid up in the memory but it must be sure to make distinction between the sober and well-collected heap, and the extravagant ideas and mistaken images which there it may sometimes light upon. So many are the links upon which the true philosophy depends, of which, if any one be loose or weak, the whole chain is in danger of being dissolved. It is to begin with the hands and eyes, and to proceed on through the memory, to be continued by the reason, nor is it to stop there, but to come about to the hands and eyes again. And so, by a continual passage round from one faculty to another, it is to be maintained in life and strength, as much as the body of man is by the circulation of the blood through the several parts of the body, the arms, the feet, the lungs, the heart, and the head. If once this method were followed with diligence and attention, there is nothing that lies within the power of human wit, or which is far more effectual of human industry, which we might not compass. We might not only hope for inventions to equalize those of Copernicus, Galileo, Gilbert, Harvey, and of others, whose names are almost lost, that were the inventors of gunpowder, the seaman's compass, printing, etching, graving, microscopes, etc., but multitudes that may far exceed them, 
for even those discoveries seem to have been the products of some such method, though but imperfect. What may not be therefore expected from it if thoroughly prosecuted? Talking and contention of arguments would soon be turned into labors. All the fine dreams of opinions and universal metaphysical natures which the luxury of subtle brains has devised would quickly vanish and give place to solid histories, experiments, and works, and, as at first, mankind fell by tasting of the forbidden tree of knowledge, so we their posterity may be in part restored by the same way, not only by beholding and contemplating, but by tasting too those fruits of natural knowledge that were never yet forbidden. From hence the world may be assisted with variety of inventions, new matters for sciences may be collected, the old improved and their rust rubbed away, and as it is by the benefit of the senses that we receive all our skill in the works of nature, so they also may be wonderfully benefited by it, and may be guided to an easier and more exact performance of their offices. Tis not unlikely, but that we may find out wherein our senses are deficient, and as easily find ways of repairing them. The endeavors of skillful men have been most conversant about the assistance of the eye, and many noble productions have followed upon it, and from hence we may conclude that there is a way opened for advancing the operations not only of all the other senses, but even of the eye itself. That which has been already done ought not to content us, but rather to encourage us to proceed further, and to attempt greater things in the same and different ways. Tis not unlikely but that there may be yet invented several other helps for the eye, at much exceeding those already found, as those do the bare eye, such as by which we may perhaps be able to discover living creatures in the moon or other planets, the figures of the compounding particles of matter, and the particular schematisms and textures of bodies. And as glasses have highly promoted our seeing, so tis not improbable but that there may be found many mechanical inventions to improve our other senses, of hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Tis not impossible to hear a whisper of furlong's distance, it having been already done, and perhaps the nature of the thing would not make it more impossible, though that furlong should be ten times multiplied. And though some famous authors have affirmed it impossible to hear through the thinnest plate of Muscovy glass, yet I know a way by which tis easy enough to hear one speak through a wall a yard thick. It has not been yet thoroughly examined how far otacousticons may be improved, nor what other ways there may be of quickening our hearing or conveying sound through other bodies than the air. For that that is not the only medium I can assure the reader that I have by help of a distended wire propagated the sound to a very considerable distance in an instant, or with as seeming quick a motion as that of light, at least incomparably swifter than that which at the same time was propagated through the air, and this not only in a straight line or direct, but in one bended in many angles. Nor are the other three so perfect, but that diligence, attention, and many mechanical contrivances may also highly improve them. For since the sense of smelling seems to be made by the swift passage of the air, impregnated with the steams and effluvia of several odorous bodies, through the grisly meanders of the nose, whose surfaces are covered with a very sensible nerve, and moistened by a transudation from the processus, maximillaries of the brain, and some adjoining glandules, and by the moist steam of the lungs, with a liquor convenient for the reception of those effluvia, and by the adhesion and mixing of those steams with that liquor, and thereby affecting the nerve, or perhaps by insinuating themselves into the juices of the brain, after the same manner, as I have in the following observations intimated, the parts of salt to pass through the skins of efts and frogs. Since, I say, smelling seems to be made by some such way, tis not unprobable but that some contrivance for making a great quantity of air pass through the nose might at much promote the sense of smelling, as the anyways hindering that passage does dull and destroy it. Several trials I have made both of hindering and promoting this sense, and have succeeded in some according to expectation, and indeed to me it seems capable of being improved for the judging of the constitutions of many bodies. Perhaps we may thereby also judge, as other creatures seem to do, what is wholesome, what poison, and in a word what are the specific properties of bodies. 
There may be also some other mechanical ways found out of sensibly perceiving the effluvia of bodies, several instances of which, were it here proper, I could give of mineral streams and exhalations, and it seems not impossible but that by some such ways improved may be discovered what minerals lie buried under the earth without the trouble to dig for them. Some things to confirm this conjecture may be found in Agricola and other writers of minerals speaking of the vegetables that are apt to thrive or pine in these streams. Whether also these steams which seem to issue out of the earth and mix with the air and so to precipitate some aqueous exhalations wherewith tis impregnated may not be by some way detected before they produce the effect seems hard to determine yet something of this kind i am able to discover by an instrument i contrived to show all the minute variations in the pressure of the air by which i constantly find that before enduring the time of rainy weather the pressure of the air is less and in dry weather but especially when an eastern wind which having passed over vast tracts of land is heavy with earthy particles blows it is much more though these changes are varied according to very odd laws the instrument is this I prepare a pretty capacious bolt head A B with a small stem about two foot and a half long D C. Upon the end of this D I put on a small bended glass or brazen siphon D E F, open at D E and F, but to be closed with cement at F and E as occasion serves, whose stem F should be about six or eight inches long, but the bore of it not above half an inch diameter and very even. These I fix very strongly together by the help of very hard cement, and then fit the whole glass A, B, C, D, E, F into a long board or frame in such manner that almost half the head A, B may lie buried in a concave hemisphere cut into the board R, S. Then I place it so on the board R, S, as is expressed in the first figure of the first scheme and fix it very firm and steady in that posture so as that the weight of the mercury that is afterwards to be put into it may not in the least shake or stir it then drawing a line x y on the frame r t so that it may divide the ball into two equal parts or that it may pass as twere through the centre of the ball i begin from that and divide all the rest of the board towards u t into inches and the inches between the twenty five and the end e which need not be above two or three and thirty inches distant from the line x y i subdivide into decimals then stopping the end f with soft cement or soft wax i invert the frame placing the head downwards and the orifice e upwards and by it with a small funnel i fill the whole glass with quicksilver then by stopping the small orifice e with my finger i oftentimes erect and invert the whole glass and frame and thereby free the quicksilver and glass from all the bubbles or parcels of lurking air then inverting it as before i fill it top full with clear and well strained quicksilver and having made ready a small ball of pretty hard cement by heat made very soft i press it into the hole e and thereby stop it very fast and to secure this cement from flying out afterwards i bind over it a piece of leather that is spread over in the inside with cement and wound about it while the cement is hot having thus softened it i gently erect again the glass after this manner i first let the frame down edgeways till the edge r v touch the floor or lie horizontal and then in that edging posture raise the end r s this i do that if there chance to be any air hidden in the small pipe e it may ascend into the pipe f and not into the pipe d c having thus erected it and hung it by the whole q or fixed it perpendicularly by any other means i open the end f and by a small siphon i draw out the mercury so long till i find the surface of it a b in the head to touch exactly the line x y at which time i immediately take away the siphon and if by chance it be run somewhat below the line x y by pouring in gently a little mercury at f i raise it again to its desired height by this contrivance I make all the sensible rising and falling of the mercury to be visible in the surface of the mercury in the pipe F, and scarce any in the head AB. But because there really is some small change of the upper surface also, I find by several observations how much it rises in the ball and falls in the pipe F, 
to make the distance between the two surfaces an inch greater than it was before. And the measure that it falls in the pipe is the length of the inch by which I am to mark the parts of the tube F, or the board on which it lies, into inches and decimals. Having thus justened and divided it, I have a large wheel MNOP, whose outmost limb is divided into two hundred equal parts. This by certain small pillars is fixed on the frame RT, in the manner expressed in the figure. In the middle of this on the back side in a convenient frame is placed a small cylinder, whose circumference is equal to twice the length of one of those divisions, which I find answers to an inch of ascent or descent of mercury. This cylinder, I, is movable on a very small needle on the end of which is fixed a very light index, KL all which are so poised on the axis or needle that no part is heavier than another. Then about this cylinder is wound a small clue of silk with two small steel bullets at each end of it GH. One of these, which is somewhat the heavier, ought to be so big as freely to move to and fro in the pipe F by means of which contrivance every the least variable of the height of the mercury will be made exceedingly visible by the motion to and fro of the small index k l but this is but one way of discovering the effluvia of the earth mixed with the air there may be perhaps many others witness the hygroscope an instrument whereby the watery steams volatile in the air are discerned which the nose itself is not able to find this I have described in the following tract in the description of the beard of a wild oat. Others there are may be discovered both by the nose and by other ways also. Thus the smoke of burning wood is smelt, seen, and sufficiently felt by the eyes. The fumes of burning brimstone are smelt and discovered also by the destroying the colors of bodies as by the whitening of a red rose. And who knows but that the industry of man following this method may find out ways of improving this sense to as yet a great degree of perfection as it is in any animal, and perhaps yet higher. Tis not improbable also but that our taste may be very much improved either by preparing our taste for the body, as, after eating bitter things, wine or other vinous liquors are more sensibly tasted or else by preparing bodies for our taste, as the dissolving of metals with acid liquors makes them tasteable, which were before altogether insipid. Thus lead becomes sweeter than sugar, and silver more bitter than gall, copper and iron of most loathsome tastes. And indeed the business of this sense being to discover the presence of dissolved bodies in liquors put on the tongue, or in general to discover that a fluid body has some solid body dissolved in it, and what they are, Whatever contrivances makes this discovery improves this sense. In this kind the mixtures of chemical liquors afford many instances, as the sweet vinegar that is impregnated with lead may be discovered to be so by the effusion of a little of an alkalizate solution. The bitter liquor of aqua fortis and silver may be discovered to be charged with that metal by laying it in some plates of copper. Tis not improbable also, but there may be multitudes of other ways of discovering the parts of dissolved or dissoluble in liquors. And what is this discovery but a kind of secondary tasting? Tis not improbable also, but that the sense of feeling may be highly improved, for that being a sense that judges of the more gross and robust motions of the particles of body seems capable of being improved and assisted in very many ways. Thus for the distinguishing of heat and cold the weather glass and thermometer which I have described in this following treatise do exceedingly perfect it, by each of which the least variations of heat or cold which the most acute sense is not able to distinguish are manifested. This is oftentimes further promoted also by the help of burning glasses and the like, which collect and unite the radiating heat. Thus the roughness and smoothness of a body is made much more sensible by the help of a microscope than by the most tender and delicate hand. Perhaps a physician might, by several other tangible properties, discover the constitution of a body as well as by the pulse. I do but instance in these to show what possibility there may be of finding others, and what probability and hopes there were of finding them, if this method were followed. For the offices of the five senses being to detect either the subtle and curious motions propagated through all pellucid or perfectly homogeneous bodies, or the more gross and vibrative pulse communicated through the air and all other convenient mediums, whether fluid or solid, 
or the effluvia of bodies dissolved in the air, or the particles of bodies dissolved or dissoluble in liquors, or the more quick and violent shaking motion of heat in all or any of these, whatsoever does any ways promote any of these kinds of criteria does afford a way of improving with some one sense. And what a multitude of these would a diligent man meet with in his inquiries, and this for the helping and promoting the sensitive faculty only. Next, as for the memory or retentive faculty, we may be sufficiently instructed from the written histories of civil actions, what great assistance may be afforded the memory in the committing to writing things observable in natural operations. If a physician be therefore accounted the more able in his faculty because he has had long experience in practice, the remembrance of which, though perhaps very imperfect, does regulate all his after actions, what ought to be thought of that man that has not only a perfect register of his own experience but it grown old with the experience of many hundreds of years and many thousands of men and though of late men beginning to be sensible of this convenience have here and there registered and printed some few centuries yet for the most part they are set down very lamely and imperfectly and i fear many times not so truly they seeming several of them to be designed more for ostentation than public use for not to an instance that they do for the most part omit those experience they have made wherein their patients have miscarried it is very easy to be perceived that they do all along hyperbolically extol their own prescriptions and vilify those of others notwithstanding all which these kinds of histories are generally esteemed useful even to the ablest physician what may not be expected from the rational or deductive faculty that is furnished with such materials, and those so readily adapted and ranged for use that in a moment, as twere, thousands of instances serving for the illustration, determination, or invention of almost any inquiry, may be represented even to the sight? How near the nature of axioms must all those propositions be which are examined before so many witnesses? and how difficult will it be for any though never so subtle an error in philosophy to escape from being discovered after it has endured the touch and so many other trials what kind of mechanical way and physical invention also is there required that might not this way be found out the invention of a way to find the longitude of places is easily performed, and that to as great perfection as is desired, or to at great an accurateness as the latitude of places can be found at sea, and perhaps yet also to a greater certainty than that has been hitherto found, as I shall very speedily freely manifest to the world. The way of flying in the air seems principally unpracticable by reason of the want of strength in human muscles if therefore that could be supplied it were i think easy to make twenty contrivances to perform the offices of wings what attempts also i have made for the supplying of that defect and my successes therein which i think are wholly new and not inconsiderable i shall in another place relate tis not unlikely also but that the chemists if they follow this method might find out they're so much sought after for alkaheist what a universal menstruum which dissolves all sorts of sulphurous bodies i have discovered which hath not been before taking notice of as such i have shown in the sixteenth observation what a prodigious variety of inventions in anatomy has this latter age afforded even in our own bodies in the very heart by which we live and the brain which is the seat of our knowledge of other things witness all the excellent works of piquet bartholinus bilius and many others and at home of dr harvey dr ent dr willis dr glisson in celestial observations we have far exceeded all the ancients even the chaldeans and egyptians themselves whose vast plains high towers and clear air did not give them so great advantages over us as have over them by our glasses by the help of which they have been very much outdone by the famous galileo helvellius Zulicum, and our own countryman mr rook dr wren and the great ornament of our church and nation the lord bishop of exeter and to say no more in aerial discoveries there has been a wonderful progress made by the noble engine of the most illustrious mr boyle whom it becomes me to mention with all honour not only as my particular patron but as the patron of philosophy itself which he every day increases by his labours and adorns by his example 
The good success of all these great men and many others, and the now seeming great obviousness of most of their and divers other inventions, which were from the beginning of the world, have been, as t'were, trod on, and not yet minded till the last inquisitive ages, an argument that there may be yet behind multitudes of the like, puts me in mind to recommend such studies and the prosecution of them by such methods to the gentlemen of our nation whose leisure makes them fit to undertake, and the plenty of their fortunes to accomplish extraordinary things in this way. And I do not only propose this kind of experimental philosophy as matter of high rapture and delight of the mind, but even as a material and sensible pleasure. So vast is the variety of objects which will come under their inflections, so many different ways there are of handling them, so great is the satisfaction of finding out new things, that I dare compare the contentment which they will enjoy not only to that of contemplation, but even to that which most men prefer of the very senses themselves. And if they will please to take any encouragement from so mean and so imperfect endeavors as mine upon my own experience, I can assure them without arrogance that there has not been any inquiry or problem in mechanics that I have hitherto propounded to myself, but by a certain method, which I may on some other opportunity explain. I have been able presently to examine the possibility of it, and if so, as easy to excogitate divers ways of performing it. And indeed it is possible to do as much by this method in mechanics as by algebra can be performed in geometry. Nor can I at all doubt but that the same method is as applicable to physical inquiries and is likely to find and reap thence a plentiful crop of inventions, and indeed there seems to be no subject so barren but may with this good husbandry be highly improved. End of section two. Recording by Philip Gould. Section three of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section two. Preface. Part two. Toward the prosecution of this method in physical inquiries, I have here and there gleaned up a handful of observations in the collection of most of which I made use of microscopes and some other glasses and instruments that improve the sense. Which way I have herein taken, not that there are not multitudes of useful and pleasant observables, yet uncollected, obvious enough without the helps of art, but only to promote the use of mechanical helps for the senses, both in the surveying the already visible world and for the discovery of many others hitherto unknown, and to make us with the great conqueror to be affected that we have not yet overcome one world when there are so many others to be discovered, every considerable improvement of telescopes or microscopes producing new worlds and terra incognitas to our view. The glasses I used were of our English make but though very good of the kind, yet far short of what might be expected, could we once find a way of making glasses elliptical, or of some more true shape. For though both microscopes and telescopes, as they now are, will magnify an object about a thousand times bigger than it appears to the naked eye, yet the apertures of the object glasses are so very small that very few rays are admitted, and even of those few there are so many false that the object appears dark and indistinct. And indeed these inconveniences are such as seem inseparable from spherical glasses, even when most exactly made. But the way we have hitherto made use of for that purpose is so imperfect that there may be perhaps ten wrought before one be made tolerably good, and most of those ten perhaps every one differing in goodness one from another, which is an argument that the way hitherto used is at least very uncertain. So that these glasses have a double defect the one that very few of them are exactly true wrought, the other that even of those that are best among them none will admit a sufficient number of rays to magnify the object beyond a determinate bigness, against which inconveniences the only remedies I have hitherto met with are these. First, for microscopes, where the object we view is near and within our power, the best way of making it appear bright in the glass is to cast a great quantity of light on it by means of convex glasses, for thereby, though the aperture be very small, yet there will throng in through it such multitudes that an object will by this means endure to be magnified as much again as it would be without it. The way for doing which is this. I make choice of some room that has only one window open to the south, 
and at about three or four foot distance from this window on a table, I place my microscope, and then so place either a round globe of water, or a very deep, clear, plano convex glass, whose convex side is turned towards the window, that there is a great quantity of rays collected and thrown upon the object. Or if the sun shine, I place a small piece of oily paper very near the object, between that and the light. Then with a good large burning glass I so collect and throw the rays on the paper, that there may be a very great quantity of light passed through it to the object. Yet I so proportion that light that it may not singe or burn the paper. Instead of which paper there may be made use of a small piece of looking-glass plate, one of whose sides is made rough by being rubbed on a flat tool with very fine sand. This will, if the heat be leisurely cast on it, endure a much greater degree of heat and consequently very much augment a convenient light. By all which means the light of the sun or of a window may be so cast on an object as to make it twice as light as it would otherwise be without it and that without any inconvenience of glaring which the immediate light of the sun is very apt to create in most objects. For by this means the light is so equally diffused that all parts are alike enlightened. But when the immediate light of the sun falls on it, the reflections from some few parts are so vivid that they drown the appearance of all the other, and are themselves also by reason of the inequality of light indistinct and appear only radiant spots. But because the light of the sun, and also that of a window, is in continual variation, and so many objects cannot be viewed long enough by them to be thoroughly examined, besides that, oftentimes the weather is so dark and cloudy that for many days together nothing can be viewed, and because also there are many objects to be met with in the night, which cannot so conveniently be kept perhaps till the day, therefore to procure and cast a sufficient quantity of light on an object in the night, I thought of and often used this expedient. I procured me a small pedestal, such as is described in the fifth figure of the first scheme on the small pillar AB of which were two movable arms, CD, which by means of the screws EF I could fix in any part of the pillar. On the undermost of these I placed a pretty large globe of glass G, filled with exceedingly clear brine, stopped, inverted, and fixed in the manner visible in the figure out of the side of which arm proceeded another arm H, with many joints, to the end of which was fastened a deep plain convex glass I, which by means of this arm could be moved to and fro and fixed in any posture. On the upper arm was placed a small lamp K, which could be to moved upon the end of the arm, as to be set in a fixed posture to give light through the ball. By means of this instrument duly placed, as is expressed in the figure, with the small flame of a lamp may be cast as great and convenient a light on the object as it will well endure, and being always constant and to be had at any time, I found most proper for drawing the representations of those small objects I had occasion to observe. None of all which ways, though much beyond any other hitherto made use of by any I know, do afford a sufficient help, but after a certain degree of magnifying they leave us again in the lurch. Hence it were very desirable that some way were thought of for making the object glass of such a figure as would conveniently bear a large aperture. As for telescopes, the only improvement they seem capable of is the increasing of their length, for the object being remote there is no thought of giving it a greater light than it has, and therefore to augment the aperture the glass must be ground of a very large sphere, for by that means the longer the glass be the bigger aperture will it bear if the glasses be of an equal goodness in their kind. Therefore a six will endure a much larger aperture than a three-foot glass, and a sixty-foot glass will proportionally bear a greater aperture than a thirty, and will as much excel it also as a six-foot does a three-foot, as I have experimentally observed in one of that length made by Mr. Richard Reeves here at London, which will bear an aperture above three inches over, and yet make the object proportionally big and distinct, whereas there are very few thirty-foot glasses that will endure an aperture of more than two inches over. So that for telescopes, supposing we had a very ready way of making their object glasses of exactly spherical surfaces, we might by increasing the length of the glass magnify the object to any assignable bigness. And for performing both these I cannot imagine any way more easy and more exact than by this following engine, by means of which any glasses of what length soever may be speedily made. It seems the most easy, because with one and the same tool may be with care ground an object glass of any length or breadth requisite, 
and that with very little or no trouble in fitting the engine, and without much skill in the grinder. It seems to be the most exact, for to the very last stroke the glass does regulate and rectify the tool to its exact figure, and the longer or more the tool and glass are wrought together, the more exact will both of them be of the desired figure. Further, the motions of the glass and tool do so cross each other that there is not one point of either surface, but as thousands of cross motions thwarting it, so that there can be no kind of rings or gutters made either in the tool or glass. The contrivance of the engine is only to make the ends of two large mandrels so to move that the centers of them may be at any convenient distance asunder, and that the axis of the mandrels lying both in the same plane produced may meet each other in any assignable angle, both which requisites may be very well performed by the engine described in the third figure of the first scheme where A-B signifies the beam of a lath fixed perpendicularly or horizontally C-D, the two poppet heads fixed at about two foot distance, E-F an iron mandrel whose tapering neck F runs in an adapted tapering brass collar, the other end E runs on the point of a screw G, in a convenient place of this is fastened H, a pulley wheel, and into the end of it that comes through the poppet head C is screwed a ring of a hollow cylinder K, or some other conveniently shaped tool, of what wideness shall be thought most proper for the size of glasses, about which it is to be employed. As for object glasses, between twelve foot and an hundred foot long, the ring may be about six inches over, or indeed somewhat more for those longer glasses. It would be convenient also, and not very chargeable, to have four or five several tools, as one for all glasses between an inch and a foot, one for all glasses between a foot and ten foot long, and another for all between ten and a hundred, a fourth for all between a hundred and a thousand foot long, and if curiosity shall ever proceed so far, one for all lengths between a thousand and ten thousand foot long. For indeed the principle is such that supposing the mandrels well made and of a good length, and supposing great care be used in working and polishing them, I see no reason but that a glass of a thousand, nay of ten thousand foot long, may be as well made as one of ten. For the reason is the same, supposing the mandrels and tools be made sufficiently strong, so that they cannot bend, and supposing the glass out of which they are wrought to be capable of so great a regularity in its parts as to refraction, this hollow cylinder K is to contain the sand, and by being drove round very quick to and fro by means of a small wheel which may be moved with one's foot, serves to grind the glass. The other mandrel is shaped like this, but it has an even neck instead of a taper one and runs in a collar that by the help of a screw and a joint made like M in the figure, it can still be adjusted to the wearing or wasting neck. Into the end of this mandrel is screwed a chalk, N, on which with cement or glue is fastened the piece of glass Q that is to be formed, the middle of which glass is to be placed just on the edge of the ring and the lath OP is to be set and fixed by means of certain pieces and screws the manner whereof will be sufficiently evidenced by the figure, in such an angle as is requisite to the forming of such a sphere as the glass is designed to be of, the geometrical ground of which being sufficiently plain though not heated before, I shall for brevity's sake pass over. This last mandrel to be made, by means of the former or some other wheel, to run round very swift also, by which two cross motions the glass cannot choose, if care be used, but be wrought into a most exactly spherical surface. But because we are certain from the laws of refraction, which I have experimentally found to be so by an instrument I shall presently describe, that the lines of the angles of incidence are proportionate to the lines of the angles of refraction. Therefore, if glasses could be made of those kind of figures or some other, such as the most incomparable Descartes has invented and demonstrated in his philosophical and mathematical works, we might hope for a much greater perfection of optics than can be rationally expected from spherical ones. For though Caeteris Peribus, we find that the larger the telescope object glasses are and the shorter those of the microscope, the better they magnify, Yet both of them, besides such determinate dimensions, are by certain inconveniences rendered unuseful. For it will be exceedingly difficult to make and manage a tube above an hundred foot long, and it will be as difficult to enlighten an object less than an hundred part of an inch distant from the object glass. I have not as yet made any attempts of that kind, though I know two or three ways which, as far as I have yet considered, seem very probable and may invite me to make a trial as soon as I have an opportunity of which I may hereafter perhaps acquaint the world. 
In the interim I shall describe the instrument I even now mentioned, by which the refraction of all kinds of liquors may be most exactly measured, thereby to give the curious an opportunity of making what further trials of that kind they shall think requisite to any of their intended trials, and to let them see that the laws of refraction are not only notional. The instrument consisted of five rulers, or long pieces, placed together after the manner expressed in the second figure of the first scheme, where AB denotes a straight piece of wood about six foot and two inches long, about three inches over, and an inch and a half thick, on the back side of which was hung a small plummet by a line stretched from top to bottom, by which this piece was set exactly upright, and so very firmly fixed that in the middle of this was made a hole or centre into which one end of a hollow cylindrical brass box cc fashioned as i shall by and by describe was placed and could very easily and truly be moved to and fro the other end of this box being put into and moving in a hole made in a small arm dd into this box was fastened a long ruler ef about three foot and three or four inches long and at three foot from the above mentioned centres pp was a hole e cut through and crossed with two small threads and at the end of it was fixed a small sight g and on the back side of it was fixed a small arm h with a screw to fix it in any place on the ruler l m this ruler l m was moved on the centre b which was exactly three foot distance from the middle centre p and a line drawn through the middle of it l m was divided by a line of cords into some sixty degrees and each degree was subdivided into minutes so that putting the cross of the threads in E upon any part of this divided line, I presently knew what angle the two rules A, B, and E, F made with each other, and by turning the screw in H I could fix them in any position. The other ruler, also R, S, was made much after the same manner, only it was not fixed to the hollow cylindrical box, but by means of two small brass arms or ears it moved on the centers of it this also by means of the cross threads in the hole s and by a screw in k could be fastened on any division of another line of cords of the same radius drawn on in o and so by that means the angle made by the two rulers a b and r s was also known the brass box c c in the middle was shaped very much like the figure x that is it was a cylindrical box stopped close at either end off of which a part both of the sides and bottoms was cut out so that the box when the pipe and that was joined to it would contain the water when filled half full and would likewise without running over endure to be inclined to an angle equal to that of the greatest refraction of water and no more without running over the ruler e f was fixed very fast to the pipe v so that the pipe v directed the length of the ruler e f and the box and ruler were moved on the pin t t so as to make any desirable angle with the ruler a b the bottom of this pipe V was stopped with a small piece of exactly plain glass which was placed exactly perpendicular to the line of direction or access of the ruler EF. The pins, also TT, were drilled with small holes through the axis and through those holes was stretched and fastened a small wire. There was likewise a small pipe of tin loosely put on upon the end of V, and reaching down to the side of G, the use of which was only to keep any false rays of light from passing through the bottom of V and only admitting such to pass as pierced through the site g all things being placed together in the manner described in the figure that is the ruler a b being fixed perpendicular i filled the box c c with water or any other liquor whose refraction i intended to try till the wire passing through the middle of it were just covered then i moved and fixed the ruler f e at any assignable angle and placed the flame of a candle just against the site g and looking through the side I moved the ruler RS to and fro till I perceived the light passing through G to be covered, as twere, or divided by the dark wire passing through PP. Then turning the screw in K I fixed it in that posture, and through the whole S I observed what degree and part of it was cut by the cross threads in S. And this gave me the angle of inclination, APS answering to the angle of refraction BPE for the surface of the liquor in the box will be always horizontal and consequently a b will be a perpendicular to it the angle therefore a p s will measure or be the angle of inclination in the liquor next e p b must be the angle of refraction for the ray that passes through the site g passes also perpendicularly through the glass diaphragm at f 
and consequently also perpendicularly through the lower surface of the liquor contiguous to the glass, and therefore suffers no refraction till it meet with the horizontal surface of the liquor in CC, which is determined by the two angles. By means of this instrument I can with little trouble and a very small quantity of any liquor examine most accurately the refraction of it not only for one inclination but for all, and thereby am enabled to make very accurate tables several of which I have also experimentally made, and find that oil of turpentine is a much greater refraction than spirit of wine, though it be lighter, and that spirit of wine has a greater refraction than water, though it be lighter also but that salt water also has a greater refraction than fresh, though it be heavier, but alum water has a less refraction than common water, though heavier also. So that it seems as to the refraction made in a liquor the specific gravity is of no efficacy. By this I have also found that look what proportion the sign of the angle of the one inclination has to the sign of the angle of refraction. Correspondent to it, the same proportion have all the signs of other inclinations to the signs of their appropriate refractions. My way for measuring how much a glass magnifies an object placed at a convenient distance from my eye is this. Having rectified the microscope to see the desired object through it very distinctly, at the same time that I look upon the object through the glass with one eye, I look upon other objects at the same distance with my other bare eye by which means I am able, by the help of a ruler divided into inches and small parts, and laid on the pedestal of the microscope, to cast, as it were, the magnified appearance of the object upon the ruler, and thereby exactly to measure the diameter it appears of through the glass, which being compared with the diameter it appears of to the naked eye, will easily afford the quantity of its magnifying. The microscope which for the most part I made use of was shaped much like that in the sixth figure of the first scheme the tube being for the most part not above six or seven inches long, though by reason it had four drawers it could very much be lengthened as occasion required. This was contrived with three glasses, a small object glass at A, a thinner eye glass about B, and a very deep one about C. This I made use of only when I had occasion to see much of an object at once, the middle glass conveying a very great company of radiating pencils which would go another way, and throwing them upon the deep eyeglass. But whenever I had occasion to examine the small parts of a body more accurately, I took out the middle glass and only made use of one eyeglass with the object glass, for always the fewer the refractions are, the more bright and clear the object appears. And therefore tis not to be doubted, but could we make a microscope to have only one refraction, it would, chiteris paribus, far excel any other that had a greater number, and hence it is that if you take a very clear piece of a broken Venice glass, and in a lamp draw it out into very small hairs or threads, then holding the ends of these threads in the flame till they melt and run into a small round globule or drop, which will hang at the end of the thread, and if further you stick several of these upon the end of a stick with a little sealing wax, so as that the threads stand upwards, and then on a whetstone first grind off a good part of them, and afterward on a smooth metal plate, with a little tripoli, rub them till they come to be very smooth. If one of these be fixed with a little soft wax against a small needle hole, pricked through a thin plate of brass, lead, pewter, or any other metal, and an object placed very near be looked at through it, it will both magnify and make some objects more distinct than any of the great microscopes. But because these, though exceeding easy made, are yet very troublesome to be used, because of their smallness and the nearness of the object, therefore to prevent both these and yet have only two refractions, I provided me a tube of brass, shaped much like that in the fourth figure of the first scheme. Into the smaller end of this I fixed with wax a good plano convex object glass, with the convex side towards the object, and into the bigger end I fixed also with wax a pretty large plano convex glass, with the convex side towards my eye. Then by means of the small hole by the side I filled the intermediate space between these two glasses with very clear water, and with a screw stopped it in, and then putting on a cell for the eye, I could perceive an object more bright than I could when the intermediate space was only filled with air but this, for other inconveniences, I made but little use of. My way of fixing both the glass and object to the pedestal most conveniently was thus. Upon one side of a round pedestal A B in the sixth figure of the first scheme, 
was fixed a small pillar, CC. On this was fitted a small iron arm, D, which could be moved up and down and fixed in any part of the pillar by means of a small screw, E. On the end of this arm was a small ball fitted into a kind of socket, F, made in the side of the brass ring, G, through which the small end of the tube was screwed, by means of which contrivance I could place and fix the tube in what posture I desired, which for many observations was exceeding necessary, and adjusting it most exactly to any object. For placing the object I made this contrivance. Upon the end of a small brass link or staple, H, H, I so fastened a round plate, I, I, that it might be turned round upon its center, K, and going pretty stiff would stand fixed in any posture it was set. On the side of this was fixed a small pillar P, about three quarters of an inch high, and through the top of this was thrust a small iron pin M, whose top just stood over the center of the plate. On this top I fixed a small object, and by means of these contrivances I was able to turn it into all kinds of positions, both to my eye and the light. For by moving round the small plate on its center could move it one way, and by turning the pin M I could move it another way, and this without stirring the glass at all or at least but very little. The plate likewise I could move to and fro to any part of the pedestal, which in many cases was very convenient, and fix it also in any position by means of a nut N, which was screwed on upon the lower part of the pillar CC. All the other contrivances are obvious enough from the draft and will need no description. Now though this were the instrument I made most use of, yet I have made several other trials with other kinds of microscopes, which both for matter and form were very different from common spherical glasses. I have made a microscope with one piece of glass, both whose surfaces were planes. I have made another only with a plano concave without any kind of reflection, divers also by means of reflection. I have made others of water, gums, rosins, salts, arsenic, oils, and with divers other mixtures of watery and oily liquors. And indeed the subject is capable of a great variety, but I find generally none more useful than that which is made with two glasses such as I have already described. What the things are, I observe, the following descriptions will manifest. In brief, they were either exceeding small bodies or exceeding small pores, or exceeding small motions, some of each of which the reader will find in the following notes, and such as I presume, many of them at least, will be new and perhaps not less strange. Some specimen of each of which heads the reader will find in the subsequent delineations, and indeed of some more than I was willing there should be, which was occasioned by my first intentions to print a much greater number than I have since found time to complete. Of such, therefore, as I had, I selected only some few of every head, which for some particulars seem most observable, rejecting the rest as superfluous to the present design. What each of the delineated subjects are, the following descriptions annexed to each will inform, of which I shall here only once for all add that in divers of them the gravers have pretty well followed my directions and drafts, and that in making of them I endeavored, as far as I was able, first to discover the true appearance, and next to make a plain representation of it. This I mention the rather because of these kind of objects there is much more difficulty to discover the true shape than of those visible to the naked eye, the same object seeming quite differing in one position to the light from what it really is, and may be discovered in another. And therefore I never began to make any draft before by many examinations in several lights, and in several positions to those lights I had discovered the true form. For it is exceeding difficult in some objects to distinguish between a prominency and a depression, between a shadow and a black stain, or a reflection and a whiteness in the color. Besides, the transparency of most objects renders them yet much more difficult than if they were opacious. The eyes of a fly in one kind of light appear almost like a lattice, drilled through with abundance of small holes, which probably may be the reason why the ingenious Dr. Power seems to suppose them such. In the sunshine they look like a surface covered with golden nails, in another posture like a surface covered with pyramids, in another with cones, and in other postures of quite other shapes. But that which exhibits the best is the light collected on the object by those means I have already described. And this was undertaken in prosecution of the design which the Royal Society has proposed to itself. For the members of the assembly, having before their eyes so many fatal instances of the errors and falsehoods in which the greatest part of mankind has so long wandered, 
because they relied upon the strength of human reason alone, have begun anew to correct all hypotheses by sense, as seamen do their dead reckonings by celestial observations. And to this purpose it has been their principal endeavor to enlarge and strengthen the senses by medicine, and by such outward instruments as are proper for their particular works. By this means they find some reason to suspect that those efforts of bodies which have been commonly attributed to qualities, and those confessed to be occult, are performed by the small machines of nature which are not to be discerned without these helps, seeming the mere products of motion, figure, and magnitude, and that the natural textures which some call the plastic faculty may be made in looms which a greater perfection of optics may make discernible by these glasses. So as now they are no more puzzled about them than the vulgar are to conceive how tapestry or flowered stuffs are woven. In the ends of all these inquiries they intend to be the pleasure of contemplative minds but above all the ease and dispatch of the labors of men's hands. They do indeed neglect no opportunity to bring all the rare things of remote countries within the compass of their knowledge and practice. But they still acknowledge their most useful informations to arise from common things, and from diversifying their most ordinary operations upon them. They do not wholly reject experiments of mere light and theory, but they principally aim at such, whose applications will improve and facilitate the present way of manual arts. And though some men who are perhaps taken up about less honorable employments are pleased to censure their proceedings, yet they can show more fruits of their first three years wherein they have assembled than any other society in Europe can for a much larger space of time. Tis true such undertakings as theirs do commonly meet with small encouragement, because men are generally rather taken with the plausible and discursive than the real and the solid part of philosophy. Yet by the good fortune of their institution in an age of all others the most inquisitive, they have been assisted by the contribution and presence of very many of the chief nobility and gentry, and others who are some of the most considerable in their several professions. But that that yet farther convinces me of the real esteem that the more serious part of men have of this society, is that several merchants, men who act in earnest, whose object is meum and tuum, that great rudder of human affairs, have adventured considerable sums of money to put in practice what some of our members have contrived, and have continued steadfast in their good opinions of such endeavors, when not one of a hundred of the vulgar have believed their undertakings are feasible. And it is also fit to be added that they have one advantage peculiar to themselves, that very many of their number are men of converse and traffic, which is a good omen that their attempts will bring philosophy from words to action, seeing the men of business have had so great a share in their first foundation. And of this kind I ought not to conceal one particular generosity which more nearly concerns myself. It is the munificence of Sir John Cutler in endowing a lecture for the promotion of mechanic arts to be governed and directed by this society. This bounty I mention for the honorableness of the thing itself, and for the expectation which I have of the efficacy of the example for it cannot now be objected to them that their designs will be esteemed frivolous and vain, when they have such a real testimony of the approbation of a man that is such an eminent ornament of this renowned city, and one who, by the variety and the happy success of his negotiations, has given evident proofs that he is not easy to be deceived. This gentleman has well observed that the arts of life have been too long imprisoned in the dark shops of mechanics themselves, and there hindered from growth either by ignorance or self-interest, and he has bravely freed them from these inconveniences. He hath not only obliged tradesmen, but trade itself. He has done a work that is worthy of London, and has taught the chief city of commerce in the world the right way how commerce is to be improved. We have already seen many other great signs of liberality in a large mind from the same hand, for by his diligence about the corporation for the poor, by his honorable subscription for the rebuilding of St. Paul's, by his cheerful disbursement for the replanting of Ireland, and by many other such public works, he has shown by what means he endeavors to establish his memory. And now by this last gift he has done that which became one of the wisest citizens of our nation to accomplish, seeing one of the wisest of our statesmen, the Lord Verulam, first propounded it. But to return to my subject from a digression which I hope my reader will pardon me, seeing the example is so rare that I can make no more such digressions. If these my first labors shall be any ways useful to inquiring men, I must attribute the encouragement and promotion of them to a very reverend and learned person, 
of whom this ought in justice to be said, that there is scarce any one invention which this nation has produced in our age, but it has some way or other been set forward by his assistance. My reader, I believe, will quickly guess that it is Dr. Wilkins that I mean. He is indeed a man born for the good of mankind and for the honor of his country. In the sweetness of whose behavior, in the calmness of his mind, in the unbounded goodness of his heart, we have an evident instance what the true and the primitive unpassionate religion was before it was soured by particular faction. In a word, his zeal has been so constant and effectual in advancing all good and profitable arts, that as one of the ancient Romans said of Scipio, that he thanked God that he was a Roman, because where Scipio had been born, there had been the seat of an empire of the world. So I may thank God that Dr. Wilkins was an Englishman, for wherever he had lived there had been the chief seat of generous knowledge and true philosophy. To the truth of this there are so many worthy men living that will subscribe that I am confident what I have here said will not be looked upon by any ingenious reader as a panegyric, but only as a real testimony. By the advice of this excellent man I first set upon this enterprise, yet still came to it with much reluctancy, because I was to follow the footsteps of so eminent a person as Dr. Wren, who was the first that attempted anything of this nature, whose original drafts do now make one of the ornaments of that great collection of rarities in the king's closet. This honor which his first beginnings of this kind have received to be admitted into the most famous place of the world did not so much encourage as the hazard of coming after Dr. Wren did affright me. For of him I must affirm that since the time of Archimedes there scarce ever met in one man in so great a perfection such a mechanical hand and so philosophical a mind. But at last being assured both by Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Wren himself that he had given over his intention of prosecuting it, and not finding that there was any else designed the pursuing of it, I set upon this undertaking, and was not a little encouraged to proceed with it by the honor the Royal Society was pleased to favor me with, in approving of those drafts which, from time to time as I had an opportunity of describing, I presented to them, and particularly by the incitements of divers of those noble and excellent persons of it, which were my more especial friends, who were not less urgent with me for the publishing than for the prosecution of them. After I had almost completed these pictures and observations, having had divers of them engraven and was ready to send them to the press, I was informed that the ingenious physician Dr. Henry Power had made several microscopical observations which had I not afterwards, upon our interchangeably viewing each other's papers, found that they were for the most part differing from mine, either in the subject itself, or in the particulars taken notice of, and that his design was only to print observations without pictures, I had even then suppressed what I had so far proceeded in. But being further excited by several of my friends in compliance with their opinions, that it would not be unacceptable to several inquisitive men, and in hoping also that I should thereby discover something new to the world, I have at length cast in my might into the vast treasury of a philosophical history. And it is my hope, as well as belief, that these my labors will be no more comparable to the production of many other natural philosophers, who are now everywhere busy about greater things, than my little objects are to be compared to the greater and more beautiful works of nature, a flea, a mite, a gnat, to an horse, an elephant, or a lion. End of section 2. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 4 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in January 2018. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 4. Observation 1 of the Point of a Sharp Small Needle. As in geometry, the most natural way of beginning is from a mathematical point, so is the same method in observations and natural history the most genuine, simple, and instructive. We must first endeavor to make letters and draw single strokes true before we venture to write whole sentences or to draw large pictures. And in physical inquiries we must endeavor to follow nature in the more plain and easy ways she treads in the most simple and uncompounded bodies, 
to trace her steps and be acquainted with her manner of walking there, before we venture ourselves into the multitude of meanders she has in bodies of a more complicated nature, lest, being unable to distinguish and judge of our way, we quickly lose both nature our guide, and ourselves too, and are left to wander in the labyrinth of groundless opinions, wanting both judgment, that light, and experience, that claw, which should direct our proceedings. We will begin these our inquiries, therefore, with the observations of bodies of the most simple nature first, and so gradually proceed to those of a more compounded one. In prosecution of which method we shall begin with a physical point, of which kind the point of a needle is commonly reckoned for one, and is indeed for the most part made so sharp that the naked eye cannot distinguish any parts of it. It very easily pierces and makes its way through all kinds of bodies softer than itself. But if viewed with a very good microscope, we may find that the top of a needle, though as to the sense very sharp, appears a broad, blunt, and very irregular end, not resembling a cone, as is imagined, but only a piece of a tapering body, with a great part of the top removed or deficient. The points of pins are yet more blunt, and the points of the most curious mathematical instruments do very seldom arrive at so great a sharpness. How much, therefore, can be built upon demonstrations made only by the productions of the ruler and compasses, he will be better able to consider that shall but view those points and lines with a microscope. Now, though this point be commonly accounted the sharpest, whence when we would express the sharpness of a point the most superlatively we say as sharp as a needle, yet the microscope can afford us hundreds of instances of points many thousand times sharper, such as those of the hairs and bristles and claws of multitudes of insects, the thorns or crooks or hairs of leaves and other small vegetables, nay the ends of the styrie or small parallelipipeds of amianthus and alumen plumosum of many of which though the points are so sharp as not to be visible though viewed with a microscope which magnifies the object in bulk above a million of times yet i doubt not but were we able practically to make microscopes according to the theory of them we might find hills and dales and pores and a sufficient breadth or expansion to give all those parts elbow room even in the blunt top of the very point of any of these so very sharp bodies for certainly the quantity or extension of any body may be divisible in infinitum though perhaps not the matter but to proceed the image we have here exhibited in the first figure was the top of a small and very sharp needle, whose point AA nevertheless appeared through the microscope above a quarter of an inch broad, not round nor flat, but irregular and uneven, so that it seemed to have been big enough to have afforded a hundred armed mites room enough to be ranged by each other without endangering the breaking one another's necks by being thrust off on either side. The surface of which, though appearing to the naked eye very smooth, could not nevertheless hide a multitude of holes and scratches and ruggednesses from being discovered by the microscope to invest it, several of which inequalities, as A, B, C seemed holes made by some small specks of rust, and D some adventitious body that struck very close to it, were casual. All the rest that roughened the surface were only so many marks of the rudeness and bungling of art. So unaccurate it is in all its productions, even in those which seem most neat, that if examined with an organ more acute than that by which they were made, the more we see of their shape, the less appearance will there be of their beauty, whereas in the works of nature the deepest discoveries show us the greatest excellencies. An evident argument that he that was the author of all these things was no other than omnipotent, 
being able to include as great a variety of parts and contrivances in the yet smallest discernible point as in those vaster bodies which comparatively are called also points such as the earth sun or planets nor need it seem strange that the earth itself may be by analogy called a physical point for as its body though not so near us as to fill our eyes and fancies with a sense of the vastness of it may by a little distance and some convenient diminishing glasses be made vanish into a scarce visible speck or point as i have often tried on the moon and when not too bright on the sun itself so could a mechanical contrivance successfully answer our theory we might see the least spot as big as the earth itself and discover as descartes also conjectures as great a variety of bodies in the moon or planets as in the earth but leaving these discoveries to future industries we shall proceed to add one observation more of a point commonly so called that is the mark of a full stop or period and for this purpose i observed many both printed ones and written and among multitudes i found few of them more round or regular than this which i have delineated in the third figure of the second scheme but very many abundantly more disfigured and for the most part if they seemed equally round to the eye i found those points that had been made by a copper plate and roll press to be as misshapen as those which had been made with types the most curious and smoothly engraven strokes and points looking but as so many furrows and holes and their printed impressions but like smutty daubings on a mat or uneven floor with a blunt extinguished brand or a stick's end and as for points made with a pen they were much more ragged and deformed nay having viewed certain pieces of exceeding curious writing of the kind one of which in the breadth of a two pence comprised the lord's prayer the apostles creed the ten commandments and about half a dozen verses besides of the bible whose lines were so small and near together that i was unable to number them with my naked eye a very ordinary microscope i had then about me enabled me to see that what the writer of it had asserted was true but withal discovered of what pitiful bungling scribbles and scrawls it was comprised arabian and china characters being almost as well shaped yet thus much i must say for the man that it was for the most part legible enough though in some places there wanted a good fancy well preposest to help one through if this manner of small writing were made easy and practicable and i think i know such a one but have never yet made trial of it whereby one might be enabled to write a great deal with much ease and accurately enough in a very little room it might be of very good use to convey secret intelligence without any danger of discovery or mistrusting but to come again to the point the irregularities of it are caused by three or four coadjutors one of which is the uneven surface of the paper which at best appears no smoother than a very coarse piece of shagged cloth next the irregularity of the type or engraving and a third is the rough daubing of the printing ink that lies upon the instrument that makes the impression to all which add the variation made by the different lights and shadows and you may have sufficient reason to guess that a point may appear much more ugly than this which i have here presented which though it appeared through the microscope grey like a great splash of london dirt about three inches over yet to the naked eye it was black and no bigger than that in the midst of the circle a and could i have found room in this plate to have inserted an o you should have seen that the letters were not more distinct than the points of distinction nor a drawn circle more exactly so than we have now shown a point to be a point end of section four section five of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Abai in January 2018. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 5. Observation 2. Of the edge of a razor. The sharpest edge hath the same kind of affinity to the sharpest point in physics as a line hath to a point in mathematics, and therefore the treaty concerning this may very properly be annexed to the former. A razor doth appear to be a body of a very neat and curious aspect, till more closely viewed by the microscope, and there we may observe its very edge to be of all kind of shapes, except what it should be. For examining that of a very sharp one, I could not find that any part of it had anything of sharpness in it, but it appeared a rough surface of a very considerable breadth from side to side, the narrowest part not seeming thinner than the back of a pretty thick knife. Nor is it likely that it should appear any otherwise, since, as we just now showed that a point appeared a circle, tis rational a line should be a parallelogram. Now for the drawing this second figure, which represents a part of the edge about half a quarter of an inch long of a razor well set, I so placed it between the object glass and the light that there appeared a reflection from the very edge, represented by the white line ABCDEF, in which you may perceive it to be somewhat sharper than elsewhere about D, to be indented or pitted about B, to be broader and thicker about C, and unequal and rugged about E, and pretty even between AB and EF. Nor was that part of the edge GHIK so smooth as one would imagine so smooth bodies as a hone and oil should leave it, for besides those multitudes of scratches, which appear to have raised the surface GHIK, and to cross each other every way which are not half of them expressed in the figure, there were several great and deep scratches or furrows, such as GH and IK, which made the surface yet more rugged, caused perhaps by some small dust casually falling on the hone, or some harder or more flinty part of the hone itself. The other part of the razor, LL, which is polished on a grinding stone, appeared much rougher than the other, looking almost like a ploughed field, with many parallels, ridges and furrows, and a cloddy, as it were, or an uneven surface. Nor shall we wonder at the roughnesses of those surfaces, since even in the most curious wrought glasses for microscopes and other optical uses, I have, when the sun has shone well on them, discovered their surface to be variously raised or scratched, and to consist of an infinite of small broken surfaces which reflect the light of very various and differing colours. And indeed it seems impossible by art to cut the surface of any hard and brittle body smooth, since putt, or even the most curious powder that can be made use of to polish such a body, must consist of little hard rough particles, and each of them must cut its way, and consequently leave some kind of gutter or furrow behind it. And though nature does seem to do it very readily in all kinds of fluid bodies, yet perhaps future observators may discover even these also rugged, it being very probable, as I elsewhere show, that fluid bodies are made up of small solid particles, variously and strongly moved, and may find reason to think that there is scarce a surface in rerum natura perfectly smooth. The black spot M N I guess to be some small speck of rust, for that I have oft observed to be the manner of the working of corrosive juices. To conclude, this edge and piece of a razor, if it had been really such as it appeared through the microscope, would scarcely have served to cleave wood, much less to have cut off the hair of beards, unless it were after the manner that Lucian merrily relates Charon to have made use of, when with a carpenter's axe he chopped off the beard of a sage philosopher, whose gravity he very cautiously feared would endanger the oversetting of his wary. 
End of section 5. Section 6 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 6. Observation 3. Of fine lawn or linen cloth. This is another product of art, a piece of the finest lawn I was able to get, so curious that the threads were scarce discernible by the naked eye, and yet, through an ordinary microscope, you may perceive what a goodly place of coarse matting it is, what proportionable cords each of the threads are, being not unlike, both in shape and size, the bigger and coarser kind of single rope yarn, whereof they usually make cables. That which makes the lawn so transparent is by the microscope, nay, by the naked eye, if attentively viewed, plainly enough evident to be the multitude of square holes which are left between the threads, appearing to have much more holes in respect to the intercurrent parts than is for the most part left in a lattice window, which it does a little resemble, only the crossing parts are round and not flat. These threads that compose the fine texture, though they are as small as those that constitute the finer sorts of silks, have notwithstanding nothing of their glossy, pleasant and lively reflection. Nay, I have been informed, both by the inventor himself and several other eyewitnesses, that though the flax, out of which is made, has been, by a singular art, of that excellent person and noble virtuoso, Mr. Charles Howard, brother to the Duke of Norfolk, so curiously dressed and prepared, as to appear both to the eye and the touch, full as fine and as glossy, and to receive all kinds of colors as well as sleeve silk yet when this silken flax is twisted into threads it quite loseth its former luster and becomes as plain and base a thread to look on as one of the same bigness made of common flax the reason of which odd phenomenon seems no other than this though the curiously dressed flax has its parts so exceedingly small as to equalize if not to be much smaller than the clue of the silkworm especially in thinness yet the differences between the figures of the constituting filaments are so great and their substance so various that whereas those of the silk are small round hard transparent and to their bigness proportionally stiff so as each filament preserve its proper figure and consequently its vivid reflection entire though twisted into a thread if not too hard those of flax are flat limber softer and less transparent and in twisting into a thread they join and lie so close together as to lose their own and destroy each other's particular reflections there seems therefore three particular very requisite to make the so dressed flax appear silk also when spun into threads first that the substance of it should be made more clear and transparent flax retaining it in a kind of opacitating brown or yellow and the parts of the whitest kind i have yet observed with a microscope appearing white like flawed horn or glass rather than like clear horn or glass next that the filaments should each of them be rounded that could be done which yet is not so very necessary if the first be performed and the third which is that each of the small filaments be stiffened for though they be square or flat provided they be transparent and stiff much the same appearances must necessary follow no though i have not yet made trial yet i doubt not but that both these properties may be also induced upon the flax and perhaps two by one and the same expedient which some trials may quickly inform any ingenious attemper of who from the use and profit of such an invention may find sufficient argument to be prompted to such inquiries as for a tendency of the substance of flax out of which the thread is made it seems much inferior to that one of silk the one being a vegetable the other an animal substance and whether it proceed from the better concoction or the more homogeneous constitution of animal substances above those of vegetables i do not here determine since i generally find that vegetable substances do not equalize the tendency of animal nor these the tendency of some purified mineral substances i am very apt to think that the tendency of bodies does not proceed from the hamus or hooked particles as the epicureans and some modern philosophers have imagined but from the more exact congruity of the constituent parts which are contiguous to each other and so bulky as not to be easily separated or shattered by any small poles or concussions of heat end of section six Section 7 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 7. Observation 4. Fine walled silk or taffety. 
This is the appearance of a piece of very fine taffety ribbon in the bigger magnifying glass, which you see exhibit it like a very convenient substance to make bed mats or doormats of, or to serve for beehives, corn scuttles, chairs or corn tops. It being not unlike that kind of work, wherewith in many parts of England they make such utensils of straw, a little weft and bound together with thongs of brambles. For in this contexture, each little filament, fiber, or clue of the silk worm seemed about the bigness of an ordinary straw, as appears by the little irregular pieces A, B, C, D, and E, F. The warp, or the thread that ran across the ribbon, appeared like a single rope of an inch diameter, but the woof, or the thread that ran at the length of the ribbon, appeared not half so big. Each inch of sixpenny brown ribbon appeared no less than a piece of matting inch and a half thick and twelve foot square. A few yards of this would be enough to floor the long gallery of the Loire at Paris. But to return to our piece of ribbon, it affords us a not unpleasant object, appearing like a bundle or weft of very clear and transparent cylinders, if the silk be white and curiously tinct, if it be coloured, each of those small horny cylinders affording in some place or another of them as vivid a reflection as if it had been sent from a cylinder of glass or horn. In so much that the reflections of red appeared as if coming from so many granites or rubies. The loveliness of the colours of silk above those of hairy stuffs or linen consisting as i elsewhere intimate chiefly in the transparency and vivid reflections from the concave or inner surface of the transparent cylinder as are also the colors of precious stones for most of the reflections from each of these cylinders come from the concave surface of the air which is as twere the foil that encompasses the cylinder the colors with which each of these cylinders are tinged seem partly to be superficial and sticking to the outsides of them and partly to be imbibed or sunk into the substance of them for silk seeming to be little else than a dried thread of glue may be supposed to be very easily relaxed and softened by being steeped in warm nay cold if penetrant juices or liquors and thereby those tinctures though they tink perhaps but a small part of the substance yet being so highly impregnated with the colour as almost to be black with it may leave an impression strong enough to exhibit the desired colour a pretty kind of artificial stuff i have seen looking almost like transparent parchment horn or isling glass and perhaps some such a thing may be made of which being transparent and of a glutinous nature and easily mollified by keeping in water as i found upon trial had imbibed and did remain tinged with a great variety of very vivid colours and to the naked eye it looked very like the substance of the silk and i have often thought that probably there might be a way found out to make artificial glutinous composition much resembling if not full as good nay better than the excrement or whatever other substance it be out of which the silkworm wire draws his glue if such a composition were found it were certainly an easy matter to find very quick ways of drawing it out into small wires for use i need not mention the use of such an invention nor the benefit that is likely to accrue to the finder they being sufficiently obvious this hint therefore may i hope give some ingenious inquisitive person an occasion of making some trials which if successful i have my aim and suppose he will have no occasion to be displeased End of section seven. section eight of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hook, Section 8, Observation 5 of Watered Silks or Stuffs. There are but few artificial things that are worth observing with a microscope, and therefore I shall speak but briefly concerning them for the productions of art are such rude misshapen things that when viewed with a microscope is little else observable but their deformity the most curious carvings appearing no better than those rude russian images we find mentioned in purchase where three notches at the end of a stick stood for a face and the most smooth and burnished surfaces appear most rough and unpolished so that my first reason why i shall add but a few observations of them 
is their misshapen form, and the next is their uselessness. For why should we trouble ourselves in the examination of that form or shape, which is all we are able to reach with a microscope, which we know was designed for no higher a use than what we were able to view with our naked eye? Why should we endeavor to discover mysteries in that which has no such thing in it? And like rabbins find out cabalisms and enigmas in the figure and placing of letters where no such thing lies hid, whereas in natural forms there are some so small and so curious and their designed business so far removed beyond the reach of our sight that the more we magnify the object, the more excellencies and mysteries do appear. And the more we discover the imperfections of our senses and the omnipotency and infinite perfections of the great Creator, I shall therefore only add one or two observations, more artificial things, and then come to the treaty concerning such matters as are the productions of a more curious workman. One of these shall be that of a piece of watered silk represented in the second figure of the third scheme as it appeared through the least magnifying glass a b signifying the long way of the stuff and c d broad way this stuff if the right side of it be looked upon appears to the naked eye all over so waved undulated or grained with a curious though irregular variety of brighter and darker parts that it adds no small gracefulness to the gloss of it it is so known a propriety that it needs but little explication. But it is observable, which perhaps every one has not considered, that those parts which appear the darker part of the wave in one position to the light, in another appears the lighter and the contrary, and by this means the undulations become transient, and in a continual change, according as the position of the parts in respect of the incident beams of light is varied, the reason of which odd phenomena, to one that has but diligently examined it even with his naked eye, will be obvious enough, but he that observes it with a microscope may more easily perceive what this proteus is, and how it comes to change its shape. He may very easily perceive that it proceeds only from the variety of the reflections of light, which is caused by the various shape of the particles or little protuberant parts of the thread that compose the surface, and that those parts of the waves that appear the brighter throw towards the eye a multitude of small reflections of light, whereas the darker scarce afford any, the reason of which reflection the microscope plainly discovers, as appears by the figure, in which you may perceive that the brighter parts of the surface consist of an abundance of large and strong reflections, denoted by a a a a a etc for the surfaces of those threads that run the long way are by the mechanical process of watering creased or angled in another kind of posture than when they were by the weaving for by the weaving they are only bent round the warping threads but by the watering they are bent with an angle or elbow that is instead of lying or being bent round the threads, as in the third figure, A, 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 are about B, 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 representing the ends, as twere of the cross threads, they are bent about. They are creased on the top of those threads with an angle, as in the fourth figure, and that with all imaginable variety so that whereas before they reflected the light only from one point of the round surface as about c c c they now when watered reflect the beams from more than half the whole surface as d e d e d e and in other postures 
they return no reflections at all from those surfaces. Hence, in one posture, they compose the brighter parts of the waves, in another the darker. And these reflections are also varied, according as the particular parts are variously bent, the reason of which, creasing, we shall next examine. And here we must fetch our information from the mechanism or manner of proceeding in this operation, which, as I have been informed, is no other than this. They double all the stuff that is to be watered, that is, they crease it just through the middle of it, the whole length of the piece, leaving the right side of the stuff inward, and placing the two edges or selvages just upon one another, and as near as they can, place the whale so in the doubling of it that the whale of the one side may lie very near, parallel, or even with the whale of the other. For the nearer that posture they lie, the greater will the watering appear, and the more obliquely or across to each other they lie, the smaller are the waves. Their way for folding it for a great whale is thus. They take a pin and begin at one side of the piece in any whale, and so moving it towards the other side, thereby directing their hands to the opposite ends of the whale, and then, as near as they can, place the two opposite ends of the same whale together, and so double or fold the whole piece, repeating this enquiry with a pin at every yard or two's distance through the whole length. Then they sprinkle it with water and fold it the long ways, placing between every fold a piece of pasteboard, by which means all the wrong side of the watered stuff becomes flat and with little whales, and the whales on the other side become the more protuberant, whence the creasings or angular bendings of the whales become the more perspicuous. Having folded it in this manner, they place it with an interjacent pasteboard into an hot press, where it is kept very violently pressed till it be dry and stiff by which means the whales of either contiguous sides leave their own impressions upon each other, as is very manifest by the second figure, where it is obvious enough that the whale of the piece A, B, C, D runs parallel between the pricked lines E, F, E, F, E, F, and as manifest to discern the impressions upon these whales, left by those that were pressed upon them, which lying not exactly parallel with them, but a little athwart them, as is denoted by the lines of O O O O G H G H G H, between which the other whales did lie parallel. They are so variously and irregularly creased, that being put into that shape when wet, and kept so till they be dry, they so let each other's threads that the mouldings remain almost as long as the stuff lasts. Hence it may appear to any one that attentively considers the figure why the parts of the whale A A A A A A should appear bright, and why the parts B B B B B B B should appear shadowed or dark, why some as D D D D, D should appear partly light and partly dark, the varieties of which reflections and shadows are the only cause of the appearance of watering in silks or any other kind of stuffs. From the variety of reflection may also be deduced the cause why a small breeze or gale of wind ruffling the surface of a smooth water makes it appear black, as also on the other side why the smoothing or burnishing the surface of whitened silver makes it look black, and multitudes of other phenomena might hereby be solved, which are too many to be here insisted on. End of section 8 Section 9 of Micrographia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 6 of small glass canes. That I may be satisfied whether it were not possible to make an artificial pore as small as any natural I had yet found, I made several attempts with small glass pipes melted in the flame of a lamp and then very suddenly drawn out into a great length. And by that means, without much difficulty, I was able to draw some almost as small as a cobweb, which yet, with a microscope, I could plainly perceive to be perforated, both by looking on the ends of it and by looking on it against the light, which was much the easier way to determine whether it were solid or perforated. For taking a small pipe of glass and closing one end of it, then filling it half full of water and holding it against the light, I could, by this means, very easily find what was the different aspect of a solid and a perforated piece of glass, and so easily distinguish, without seeing either end, whether any cylinder of glass I looked on were a solid stick or a hollow cane. And by this means I could also presently judge of any small filament of glass, whether it were hollow or not, which would have been exceeding tedious to examine by looking on the end. And many such like ways I was fain to make use of in the examining of divers other particulars related in this book, which would have been no easy task to have determined, merely by the more common way of looking on or viewing the object. For if we consider first the very faint light wherewith the object is enlightened, whence many particles appear opacous, which, when more enlightened, appear very transparent, so that I was fain to determine its transparency by one glass and its texture by another. Next, the unmanageableness of most objects by reason of their smallness. 3. The difficulty of finding the desired point and of placing it so as to reflect the light conveniently for the inquiry. Lastly, one being able to view it but with one eye at once, they will appear no small obstructions, nor are they easily removed without many contrivances. But to proceed, I could not find that water or some deeply tinged liquors would in small ones rise so high as one would expect, and the highest I have found it yet rise in any of the pipes I have tried was to 21 inches above the level of the water in the vessel for though I found that in the small pipes it would nimbly enter at first and run about six or seven inches upwards, yet I found it then to move upwards so slow that I have not yet had the patience to observe it above that height of twenty-one inches, and that was in a pretty large pipe in comparison of those I formerly mentioned for I could observe the progress of a very deep-tinged liquor in it with my naked eye, without much trouble, whereas many of the other pipes were so very small that unless in a convenient posture to the light, I could not perceive them. But tis very probable that a greater patience and assiduity may discover the liquors to rise, at least to remain suspended, at heights that I should be loath now even to guess at, if at least there be any proportion kept between the heights of the ascending liquor and the bigness of the holes of the pipes. An attempt for the explication of this experiment. My conjecture that the unequal height of the surfaces of the water proceeded from the greater pressure made up on the water by the air without the pipes a b c then by that within them i shall endeavour to confirm from the truth of the two following propositions the first of which is 
that an unequal pressure of the incumbent air will cause an unequal height in the water surfaces, and the second is that in this experiment there is such an unequal pressure that the first is true the following experiment will evince for if you take any vessel so contrived as that you can at pleasure either increase or diminish the pressure of the air upon this or that part of the superficies of the water the equality of the height of those parts will presently be lost and that part of the superficies that sustains the greater pressure will be inferior to that which undergoes the less a fit vessel for this purpose will be an inverted glass siphon such an one as is described in the sixth figure for if into it you put water enough to fill it as high as a b and gently blow in at d you shall depress the superficies b and thereby raise the opposite superficies a to a considerable height and by gently sucking you may produce clean contrary effects next that there is such an unequal pressure i shall prove from this that there is a much greater incongruity of air to glass and some other bodies than there is of water to the same by congruity i mean a property of a fluid body whereby any part of it is readily united with any other part either of itself or of any other similar fluid or solid body and by incongruity a property of a fluid by which it is hindered from uniting with any dissimilar fluid or solid body this last property any one that hath been observingly conversant about fluid bodies cannot be ignorant of for not now to mention several chemical spirits and oils which will very hardly if at all be brought to a mix with one another insomuch that there may be found some eight or nine or more several distinct liquors which swimming one upon another will not presently mix we need seek no further for examples of this kind of fluids than to observe the drops of rain falling through the air and the bubbles of air which are by any means conveyed under the surface of the water or a drop of common salad oil swimming upon water in all which and many more examples of this kind that might be enumerated the incongruity of two fluids is easily discernible and as for the congruity or incongruity of liquids with several kind of firm bodies they have long since been taken notice of and called by the names of dryness and moisture though these two names are not comprehensive enough being commonly used to signify only the adhering or not adhering of water to some other solid bodies of this kind we may observe that water will more readily wet some woods than others and that water let fall upon a feather the whiter side of a colwort and some other leaves or upon almost any dusty, unctuous, or resinous superficies will not at all adhere to them, but easily tumble off from them like a solid ball. Whereas if dropped upon linen, paper, clay, green wood, etc., it will not be taken off without leaving some part of it being adhering to them. So quicksilver, which will very hardly be brought to stick to any vegetable body will readily adhere to and mingle with several clean metalline bodies and that we may better find what the cause of congruity and incongruity in bodies is it will be requisite to consider first what is the cause of fluidness and this i conceive to be nothing else but a certain pulse or shake of heat for heat being nothing else but a very brisk and vehement agitation 
of the parts of a body, as I have elsewhere made probable, the parts of a body are thereby made so loose from one another that they easily move any way and become fluid. That I may explain this a little by a gross similitude, let us suppose a dish of sand set upon some body that is very much agitated and shaken with some quick and strong vibration motion, as on a millstone turned round upon the understone very violently whilst it is empty, or on a very stiff drum head which is vehemently or very nimbly beaten with the drumsticks. By this means the sand in the dish which before lay like a dull and unactive body becomes a perfect fluid and e can no sooner make a hole in it with your finger but it is immediately filled up again and the upper surface of it leveled nor can you bury a light body as a piece of cork under it but it presently emerges or swims as twere on top nor can you lay a heavier on the top of it as a piece of lead but it is immediately buried in sand and as twere sinks to the bottom nor can you make a hole in the side of the dish but the sand shall run out of it to a level not an obvious property of a fluid body as such but this does imitate and all this merely caused by the vehement agitation of the containing vessel, for by this means each sand becomes to have a vibrative or dancing motion, so as no other heavier body can rest on it, unless sustained by some other on either side. Nor will it suffer any body to be beneath it, unless it be a heavier than itself. Another instance of the strange loosening nature of a violent jarring motion, or a strong and nimble vibrative one, we may have from a piece of iron grated on very strongly with a file. For if into that a pin screwed so firm and hard, that though it has a convenient head to it, yet can by no means be unscrewed by the fingers, if I say you attempt to unscrew this whilst grated on by the file, it will be found to undo and turn very easily. The first of these examples manifests how a body actually divided into small parts becomes a fluid, and the latter manifests by what means the agitation of heat so easily loosens and unties the parts of solid and firm bodies nor need we suppose he to be anything else besides such motion for supposing we could mechanically produce such a one quick and strong enough we need not spend fuel to melt a body now that i do not speak this altogether groundless i must refer the reader to the observations i have made upon the shining sparks of steel for there he shall find that the same effects are produced upon small chips or parcels of steel by the flame and by a quick and violent motion and if the body of steel may be thus melted as i there shew it may i think we have little reason to doubt that almost any other may not also every smith can inform one how quickly both his file and the iron grows hot with filing and if you rub almost any two hard bodies together they will do the same and we know that a sufficient degree of heat causes fluidity in some bodies much sooner and in others later that is the parts of the body of some are so loose from one another and so unapt to cohere, and so minute and little, that a very small degree of agitation keeps them always in the state of fluidity. Of this kind, I suppose the ether, that is, the medium or fluid body, 
in which all other bodies do, as it were, swim and move, and particularly the air, which seems nothing else but a kind of a tincture or solution of terrestrial and aqueous particle dissolved into it and agitated by it, just as a tincture of cochineal is nothing but some finer dissoluble parts of that concrete licked up or dissolved by the fluid water. And from this notion of it, we may easily give a more intelligible reason how the air becomes so capable of rarefaction and condensation. For, as in tinctures, one grain of some strongly tinging substance may sensibly color some hundred thousand grains of appropriated liquors, so as every drop of it has its proportionate share, and can be sensibly tinged, as I have tried both with logwood and cochineal, and as some few grains of salt is able to infect as great a quantity as may be found by precipitations, though not so easily by the sight or taste. So the air, which seems to be but as twere a tincture or saline substance, dissolved and agitated by the fluid and agile either, may disperse and expand itself into a vast space, if it had room enough, and infect, as it were, every part of that space. But, as on the other side, if there be but some few grains of the liquor, it may extract all the color of the tinging substance, and may dissolve all the salt, and thereby become much more impregnated with those substances. So may all the air that sufficed in a rarefied state to fill some hundred thousand spaces of either be comprised in only one, but in a position proportionable dense. And though we have not yet found out such strainers for tinctures and salts as we have for the air, being yet unable to separate them from their dissolving liquors by any kind of filter without precipitation, as we are able to separate the air from the ether by glass and several other bodies, and though we are yet unable and ignorant of the ways of precipitating air out of the ether, as we can tinctures and salts out of several dissolvents, yet neither of these seeming impossible from the nature of things, nor so improbable but that some happy future industry may find out ways to effect them. Nay, further, since we find that nature does really perform, though by what means we are not certain, both these actions, namely by precipitating the air in rain and dews, and by supplying the streams and rivers of the world with fresh water, strained through secret subterraneous caverns, and since that in very many other properties they do so exactly, seem of the same nature. Till further observations or trials do inform us of the contrary, we may safely enough conclude them of the same kind. For it seldom happens that any two natures have so many properties coincident or the same as I have observed solutions and air to have, and to be different in the rest. And therefore I think it neither impossible, irrational, nay nor difficult to be able to predict what is likely to happen in other particulars also besides those which observation or experiment have declared thus or thus, especially if the circumstances that do often very much conduce to the variation of the effects by duly weighed and considered. And indeed, were there not a probability of this, our inquiries would be endless, our trials vain, and our greatest inventions would be nothing 
but the mere products of chance and not of reason and like mariners in an ocean destitute both of a compass and the sight of the celestial guides we might indeed by chance steer directly towards our desired port but tis a thousand to one but we miss our aim but to proceed we may hence also give a plain reason how the air comes to be darkened by the clouds and etc which are nothing but a kind of precipitation and how those precipitations fall down in showers hence also could i very easily and i think truly deduce the cause of the curious six angular figures of snow and the appearance of hollows etc and the sudden thickening of the sky with clouds and the vanishing and disappearing of those clouds again for all these things may be very easily imitated in a glass of liquor with some slight chemical preparations as i have often tried and may somewhere else more largely relate but have not no time to set them down but to proceed there are other bodies that consist of particle more gross and of a more apt figure for cohesion and this requires somewhat greater agitation such i suppose mercury fermented venous spirits several chemical oils which are much of a kin to those spirits etc others yet require a greater as water and so others much greater for almost infinite degrees for i suppose there are very few bodies in the world that may not be made aliquotinous fluid by some or other degree of agitation or heat having therefore in short set down my notion of a fluid body i come in the next place to consider what congruity is and this as i said before being a relative property of a fluid whereby it may be said to be like or unlike to this or that other body whereby it does or does not mix with this or that body we will again have recourse to our former experiment though but a rude one and here if we mix in the dish several kinds of sands some of bigger other of less and finer bulks we shall find that by the agitation the fine sand will eject and throw out of itself all those bigger bulks of small stones and the like and those will be gathered together all into one place and if there be other bodies in it of other natures those also will be separated into a place by themselves and united or tumbled up together and though these do not come up to the highest property of congruity which is a cohesion of the parts of the fluid together or a kind of attraction and tenacity yet this does as to shadow it out and somewhat resemble it for just after the same manner i suppose the pulse of heat to agitate the small parcels of matter and those that are of a like bigness and figure and matter will hold or dance together and those which are of a differing kind will be thrust or shoved out from between them for particles that are similar will like so many equal musical strings equally stretch vibrate together in a kind of harmony or unison whereas others that are dissimilar upon what account soever unless the disproportion be otherwise counterbalanced will like so many strings out of tune to those unisons though they have the same agitating pulse yet make quite differing kinds of vibrations and repercussions so that though they may be both moved yet are their vibrations so different and so untuned 
as twere to each other that they cross and jar against each other, and consequently cannot agree together, but fly back from each other to their similar particles. Now, to give you an instance how the disproportion of some bodies in one respect may be counterbalanced by a contrary disproportion of the same body in another respect, whence we find that the subtle venous spirit is congruous or does readily mix with water, which in many properties is of a very different nature, we may consider that a unison may be made either by two strings of the same bigness, length and tension, or by two strings of the same bigness, but of differing length and a contrary differing tension, or thirdly, by two strings of unequal length and bigness and of a differing tension, or of equal length and differing bigness and tension, and several other such varieties to which three properties in strings will correspond three properties also in sand, or the particles of bodies, their matter or substance, their figure or shape, and their body or bulk. And from the varieties of these three may arise infinite varieties in fluid bodies, though all agitated by the same pulse or vibrative motion. And there may be as many ways of making harmonies and discords with these, as there may be with musical strings. Having therefore seen what is the cause of congruity or incongruity, those relative properties of fluids we may, from what has been said, very easily collect what is the reason of those relative properties also between fluid bodies and solid for since all bodies consist of particles of such a substance figure and bulk but in some they are united together more firmly than to be loosened from each other by every vibrative motion though i imagine that there is no body in the world but that some degree of agitation may as i hinted before agitate and loosen the particles so as to make them fluid. Those cohering particles may vibrate in the same manner almost as those that are loose and become unisons or discords, as I may so speak to them. Now that the parts of all bodies, though never so solid, do yet vibrate, I think we need go no further for proof than that all bodies have some degree of heat in them, and that there has not been yet found anything perfectly cold. Nor can I believe, indeed, that there is any such thing in nature as a body whose particles are at rest, or lazy and unactive, in the great theatre of the world, it being quite contrary to the grand economy of the universe. We see, therefore, what is the reason of the sympathy or uniting of some bodies together, and of the antipathy or flight of others from each other? For congruity seems nothing else but a sympathy, and incongruity an antipathy of the bodies. Hence similar bodies, once united, will not easily part, and dissimilar bodies, once disjoined, will not easily unite again. From hence may be very easily deducted the reason of the suspension of water and quicksilver above their usual station, as I shall more at large a non shoe. These properties, therefore, always the concomitants of fluid bodies, produce these following visible effects. First, they unite the parts of a fluid to its similar solid, or keep them separate from its dissimilar. Hence, quicksilver will, as we noted before, stick to gold, silver, tin, lead, etc., and unite with them, but roll off from wood, stone, glass, etc., 
if never so little, situated out of its horizontal level. And water that will wet salt and dissolve it will slip off from tallow or the like, without at all adhering, as it may likewise be observed to do upon a dusty superficies, and next they cause the parts of homogeneal fluid bodies readily to adhere together and mix, and of heterogeneal to be exceeding averse thereunto. Hence we find that two small drops of water on any superficies they can roll on will, if they chance to touch each other, readily unite and mix into a third drop. The like may be observed with two small balls of quicksilver upon a table or glass, provided their surfaces be not dusty, and with two drops of oil upon fair water, etc. And further, water put unto wine, salt water, vinegar, spirit of wine, or the like, does immediately, especially if they be shaken together, disperse itself all over them. Hence, on the contrary, we also find that oil of tartar poured upon quicksilver and spirit of wine on that oil, and oil of turpentine on that spirit, and air upon that oil, though they be stopped closely up into a bottle and shaken never so much, they will by no means long suffer any of their bigger parts to be united or included within any of the other liquors, by which recited liquors may be plainly enough represented by the four peripatetical elements, and the more subtle ether above all. From this property tis that a drop of water does not mingle with or vanish into air, but is driven by that fluid equally protrudent on every side and forced into as little a space as it can possibly be contained in, namely into a round globule. So likewise a little air blown under the water is united or thrust into a bubble by the ambient water, and a parcel of quicksilver enclosed with air, water, or almost any other liquor is formed into a round ball. Now the cause why all these included fluids, newly mentioned, or as many others as are wholly included within a heterogeneous fluid, are not exactly of a spherical figure, seeing that if caused by these principles only, it could be of no other, must proceed from some other kind of pressure against the two opposite flatted sides. This adventitious or accidental pressure may proceed from diverse causes, and accordingly must diversify the figure of the included heterogeneous fluid, foreseeing that a body may be included either with a fluid only, or only with a solid, or partly with a fluid and partly with a solid, or partly with one fluid and partly with another there will be found a very great variety of the terminating surfaces, much differing from a spherical, according to the various resistance or pressure that belongs to each of these encompassing bodies, which properties may in general be deduced from two heads, vis a vis motion and rest. For either this globular figure is altered by a natural motion, such as is gravity, or a violent, such as is any accidental motion of the fluids, as we see in the wind ruffling up the water, and the purlings of streams, and foaming of cataracts, and the like. Or thirdly, by the rest, firmness and stability of the ambient solid. For if the including solid be of an angular or any other irregular form, the included fluid will be near of the like, as a pint pot full of water, or a bladder full of air. 
and next if the including or included fluid have a greater gravity one than another then will the globular form be depressed into an elliptico-spherical as if for example we suppose the circle ABCD in the fourth figure to represent a drop of water, quicksilver or the like, included with the air or the like, which supposing there were no gravity at all in either of the fluids, or that the contained and containing were of the same weight, would be equally compressed into an exactly spherical body the ambient fluid forcing equally against every side of it, but supposing either a greater gravity in the included, by reason whereof the parts of it being pressed from A towards B, and thereby the whole put into motion, and that motion being hindered by the resistance of the subjacent parts of the ambient, the globular figure ADBC will be depressed into the elliptico-spherical EGFH, for the side A is detruded to E by the gravity, and B to F by the resistance of subjacent medium, and therefore C must necessarily be thrust to G, and D to H, or else supporting a greater gravity in the ambient by whose more than ordinary pressure against the underside of the included globule b will be forced to f and by its resistance of the motion upwards the side a will be depressed to e and therefore c being thrust to g and d to h the globular figure by this means also will be made an elliptico spherical next if a fluid be included partly with one and partly with another fluid it will be found to be shaped diversely according to the proportion of the gravity and incongruity of the three fluids one to another as in the second figure let the upper m m m by air the middle LMNO by common oil, the lower OOO by water, the oil will be formed, not into a spherical figure, such as is represented by the pricked line, but into such a figure as LMNO, whose side LMN will be of a flatter elliptical figure, by reason of the great disproportion between the gravity of oil and air and the side l o m of a rounder because of the smaller difference between the weight of oil and water lastly the globular figure will be changed if the ambient be partly fluid and partly solid and here the termination of the encompassed fluid towards the encompassing is shaped according to the proportion of the congruity or incongruity of the fluids to the solids and of the gravity and incongruity of the fluids one to another as suppose the subjacent medium that hinders an included fluids descent be a solid as let k i in the fourth figure represent the smooth superfaces of a table e g f h a parcel of running mercury the side g f h will be more flatted according to the proportion of the incongruity of the mercury and air to the wood and of the gravity of the mercury and air one to another the side g e h will likewise be a little more depressed by reason the subjacent parts are now at rest which were before in motion or further in the third figure let a i l d represent an including solid medium of a cylindrical shape as suppose a small glass jar 
let FGEMM represent a contained fluid as water. This towards the bottom and sides is figured according to the concavity of the glass. But its upper surface, which by reason of its gravity, not considering at all the air above it, and so neither the congruity or incongruity of either of them to the glass, should be terminated by part of a sphere whose diameter should be the same with that of the earth which to our sense would appear a straight line as f g e or which by reason of its having a greater congruity to glass than air has not considering its gravity would be thrust into a concave sphere as c h b whose diameter would be the same with that of the concavity of the vessel its upper surface i say by reason of its having a greater gravity than the air and having likewise a greater congruity to glass than the air has is terminated by a concave elliptico-spherical figure as c k b for by its congruity it easily conforms itself and adheres to the glass and constitutes as it were one containing body with it and therefore should thrust the contained air on that side it touches it into a spherical figure as bhc but the motion of gravity depressing a little the corners b and c reduces it into the aforesaid figure ckb now that it is the greater congruity of one of the two contiguous fluids than of the other to the containing solid that causes the separating surfaces to be thus or thus figured, and that it is not because this or that figurated surface is more proper, natural, or peculiar to one of these fluid bodies than to the other, will appear from this, that the same fluids will, by being put into differing solids, change their surfaces, for the same water which in a glass or wooden vessel will have a concave surface upwards and will rise higher in a smaller than a greater pipe the same water i say in the same pipes greased over or oiled will produce quite contrary effects for it will have a protuberant and convex surface upwards and will not try so high and small as in bigger pipes nay in the very same solid vessel you may make the very same two contiguous liquids to alter their surfaces for taking a small wine glass or such like vessel and pouring water gently into it you shall perceive the surface of the water all the way concave till it rise even with the top when you shall find it if you gently and carefully pour in more to grow very protuberant and convex the reason of which is plain for that the solid sides of the containing body are no longer extended to which the water does more readily adhere than the air but it is henceforth to be included with air which would reduce it into a hemisphere but by reason of its gravity it is flatted into an oval quicksilver also which to glass is more incongruous than air and thereby being put into a glass pipe will not adhere to it but by the more congruous air will be forced to have a very protuberant surface and to rise higher in a greater than a lesser pipe this quicksilver to clean metal especially to gold silver tin lead and terra iron excepted is more congruous than air and will not only stick to it but have a concave surface like water and rise higher in a less than in a greater pipe in all these examples it is evident that there is an extraordinary and adventitious force by which the globular figure 
of the contained heterogeneous fluid is altered, neither can it be imagined how it should otherwise be of any other figure than globular. For being by the heterogeneous fluid equally protruded every way, whatsoever part is protuberant will be thereby depressed. From this cause it is that in its effects it does very much resemble a round spring, such as a hoop, for as in a round spring there is required an additional pressure against two opposite sides to reduce it into an oval form, or to force it in between the sides of a hole, whose diameter is less than that of a spring, there must be a considerable force of protrusion against the concave or inner side of the spring. So to alter this spherical constitution of an included fluid body, there is required more pressure against opposite sides to reduce it into an oval and to press it into a hole less in diameter than itself, it requires a greater protrusion against all the other sides. What degrees of force are requisite to reduce them into longer and longer ovals, or press them into less and less holes, I have not yet experimentally calculated, but thus much by experiment I find in general that there is always required a greater pressure to close them into longer ovals or protrude them into smaller holes. The necessity and reason of this, were it requisite, I could easily explain, but being not so necessary and requiring more room and time than I have for it at present, I shall here omit it, and proceed to shew that this may be presently found true if experiment be made with a round spring, the way of making which trials is obvious enough, and with fluid bodies of mercury, air, etc., the way of trying which will be somewhat more difficult, and therefore I shall in brief describe it. He, therefore, that would try with air, must first be provided of a glass pipe made of the shape of that in the fifth figure, whereof the side AB represents a straight tube of about three foot long. C represents another part of it, which consists of a round bubble, so ordered that there is left a passage or a hole at the top, into which may be fastened with cement several small pipes of determinate cylindrical cavities as let hollow of f b one quarter of an inch g one six h one eighth i one twelfth k one sixteenth l one twenty fourth m one thirty two and etc there may be added as many more as the experimenter shall think fit with holes continually decreasing by known quantities, so far as his senses are able to help him. I say so far, because there may be made pipes so small that it will be impossible to perceive the perforation with one's naked eye, though by the help of a microscope it may easily enough be perceived. Nay, I have made a pipe perforated from end to end so small that with my naked eye I could very hardly see the body of it, insomuch that I have been able to knit it up into a knot without breaking, and more accurately, examining one with my microscope, I found it not so big as a sixteenth part of one of my smaller hairs of my head which was of the smaller and finer sort of hair, so that sixteen of these pipes, bound faggot-wise together, would but have equalized one single hair. How small, therefore, must its perforation be? It appears to me through the microscope to be a proportionably thick-sided pipe. To proceed, then, for the trial of the experiment, the experimenter must place the tube AB perpendicular, 
and fill the pipe F, cemented into the hole E, with water, but leave the bubble C full of air, and then gently pouring in water into the pipe AB, he must observe diligently how high the water will rise in it, before it protrude the bubble of air C through the narrow passage of F, and denote exactly the height of the cylinder of the water, then cementing in a second pipe as G and filling it with water. He may proceed as with the former, denoting likewise the height of the cylinder of water, able to protrude the bubble C through the passage of G. The like may he do with the next pipe, and the next, and etc., as far as he is able. Then, comparing the several heights of the cylinders with the several holes through which each cylinder did force the air, having due regard to the cylinder of water in the small tubes, it will be very easy to determine what force is requisite to press the air into such and such a hole, or to apply it to our present experiment. How much of the pressure of the air is taken off by its ingress into smaller and smaller holes, from the application of which to the entering of the air into the bigger hole of the vessel and into the smaller hole of the pipe, we shall clearly find that there is a greater pressure of the air upon the water in the vessel or greater pipe than there is upon that in the lesser pipe. For since the pressure of the air every way is found to be equal, that is, as much as he is able to press up and sustain a cylinder of quicksilver of two foot and a half high, or thereabouts, and since of this pressure so many more degrees are required to force the air into a smaller than into a greater hole that is full of a more congruous fluid, and lastly, since those degrees that are requisite to press it in are thereby taken off from the air within, and the air within left with so many degrees of pressure less than the air without, it will follow that the air in the less tube or pipe will have less pressure against the superficies of the water therein than the air in the bigger, which was the minor proposition to be proved. The conclusion, therefore, will necessarily follow vis-à-vis -vis, that this unequal pressure of the air caused by its ingress into unequal holes is a cause sufficient to produce this effect without the help of any other concurrent. Therefore, is probably the principal, if not the only, cause of this phenomena. End of section 9 Recording by Mike Botez. Section 10 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Botez. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 6 of Small Glass Canes Part 2 This, therefore, be and thus explained, there will be diverse phenomena explicable thereby, as the rising of liquors in a filter, the rising of spirit of wine, oil, melted tallow, etc., in the wick of a lamp, though made of small wire, threads of asbestos, strings of glass or the like, the rising of liquors in a sponge, piece of bread, sand, and terra, perhaps also the ascending of the sap in trees and plants through their small and some of them imperceptible pores, of which I have said more on another occasion, at least the passing of it out of the earth into their roots, and indeed upon the consideration of this principle multitudes of other uses of it occur to me 
which I have not yet so well examined and digested as to propound for axioms, but only as queries and conjectures which may serve as hints towards some further discoveries. As first, upon the consideration of the congruity and incongruity of bodies as to touch, I found also the like congruity and incongruity, if I may so speak, as to the transmitting of the rates of light. For, as in this regard, water, not now to mention other liquors, seems nearer of affinity to glass than air, and air than quicksilver, whence an oblique ray out of glass will pass into water with very little refraction from the perpendicular, but none out of glass into air, except a direct, will pass without a very great refraction from the perpendicular, nay, any oblique ray under 30 degrees will not be admitted into the air at all and quicksilver will neither admit oblique or direct, but reflects all, seeming, as to the transmitting of the rays of light, to be of a quite differing constitution from that of air, water, glass, etc., and to resemble most those opacous and strong reflecting bodies of metals, so also as to the property of cohesion or congruity, water seems to keep the same order being more congruous to glass than air and air than quicksilver a second thing which was hinted to me by the consideration of the included fluids globular form caused by the protrusion of the ambient heterogeneous fluid was whether the phenomena of gravity might not by this means be explained by supposing the globe of earth, water and air, to be included with a fluid, heterogeneous to all and each of them, so subtle as not only to be everywhere interspersed through the air, or rather the air through it, but to pervade the bodies of glass, and even the closest metals, by which means it may endeavour to detrude all earthly bodies as far from it as it can, and partly thereby, and partly by other of its properties, may move them towards the centre of the earth. Now that there is some such fluid, I could produce many experiments and reasons that do seem to prove it but because it would ask some time and room to set them down and explain them and to consider and answer all the objections many whereof i foresee that may be alleged against it i shall at present proceed to other queries containing myself to have here only given a hint of what i may say more elsewhere a third query then was whether the heterogeneity of the ambient fluid may not be accounted a secondary cause of the roundness or globular form of the greater bodies of the world, such as are those of the sun, stars and planets, the substance of each of which seems altogether heterogeneous to the circumambient fluid ether and of this i shall say more in the observation of the moon a fourth was whether the globular form of the smaller parcels of matter here upon the earth as that of fruits pebbles or flints etc which seem to have been a liquor at first may not be caused by the heterogeneous ambient fluid for thus we see that melted glass will be naturally formed into a round figure. So likewise any small parcel of any fusible body, if it be perfectly enclosed by the air, will be driven into a globular form, and, when cold, will be found a solid ball. This is plainly enough manifested to us by their way of making shot with the drops of lead, 
which being a very pretty curiosity, and known but to very few, and having the liberty of publishing it granted to me by that eminent virtuoso Sir Robert Moray, who brought in this account of it to the Royal Society, I have here transcribed and inserted to make small shot of different sizes, communicated by His Highness P. R. Take lead out of the pig, what quantity you please, melt it down, stir and clear it with an iron ladle, gathering together the blackish parts that swim at top like scrum, and when you see the color of the clear lead to be greenish, but no sooner, strew upon it ore pigmentum powdered according to the quantity of lead, about as much as will lie upon a half-crown piece, will serve for eighteen or twenty pound weight of some sorts of lead. Others will require more or less. After the ore pigmentum is put in, stir the lead well, and the ore pigmentum will flame. When the flame is over, take out some of the lead in a ladle, having a lip or notch in the brim for convenient pouring out of the lead, and being well warmed amongst the melted lead, and with a stick, make some single drops of lead trickle out of the ladle into water in a glass, which, if they fall to be round and without tails, there is ore pigmentum enough to put in it, and the temper of the heat is right, otherwise put in more. Then lay two bars of iron, or some more proper iron tool made on purpose, upon a pail of water, and place upon them a round plate of copper, of the size and figure of an ordinary large pewter or silver trencher, the hollow whereof is to be about three inches over, the bottom lower than the brims about half an inch, pierced with thirty, forty or more small holes. The smaller the holes are, the smaller the shot will be, and the brim is to be thicker than the bottom, to conserve the heat the better. The bottom of the trencher being some four inches distant from the water in the pail, lay upon it some burning coals to keep the lead melted upon it. Then, with a hot ladle, take lead off the pot where it stands melted, and pour it softly upon the burning coals over the bottom of the trencher, and it will immediately run through the holes into the water in small round drops. Thus, pour on new lead as fast as it runs through the trencher till all be done, blowing now and then the coals with hand bellows. When the lead in the trencher cools so as to stop from running, while one pours on the lead, another must, with another ladle, thrust it four or five inches under water in the pail, catch from time to time, some of the shot as it drops down to see the size of it and whether there be any fault in it the greatest care is to keep the lead up on the trencher in the right degree of heat if it be too cool it will not run through the trencher though it stand melted up on it and this is to be helped by blowing the coals a little or pouring on new lead that is hotter but the cooler the lead, the larger the shot, and the hotter the smaller. When it is too hot, the drops will crack and fly. Then you must stop pouring on new lead and let it cool. And so long as you observe the right temper of the heat, the lead will constantly drop into very round shot, without so much as one with a tail, in many pounds. When all is done, Take your shot out of the pail of water and put it in a frying pan over the fire to dry them, which must be done warily, still shaking them that they melt not. And when they are dry, 
you may separate the small from the great in pearl sieves made of copper or latten let into one another into as many sizes as you please but if you would have your shot larger than the trencher makes them you may do it with a stick making them trickle out of the ladle as hath been said if the trencher be but touched a very little when the lead stops from going through it and be not too cool it will drop again but it better not touch it at all at the melting of the lead take care that there be no kind of oil grease or the like upon the pots or ladles or trencher the chief cause of this globular figure of the shot seems to be the ori pigmentum for as soon as it is put in among the melted lead it loses its shining brightness contracting instantly a grayish film or skin upon it when you scum it to make it clean with a ladle so that when the air comes at the falling drop of the melted lead that skin constricts them everywhere equally but upon what account and whether this be the true case is left to further disquisition much after the same manner when the air is exceeding cold through which it passes do we find the drops of rain falling from the clouds congealed into round hailstones by the freezing ambient to which may be added the other known experiment that if you gently let fall a drop of water upon small sand or dust you shall find as it were an artificial round stone quickly generated i cannot upon this occasion omit the mentioning of the strange kind of grain which i have observed in a stone brought from kettering in northamptonshire and therefore called by masons kettering stone of which see the description which brings into my mind what i long since observed in the fiery sparks that are struck out of a steel for having a great desire to see what was left behind after the spark was gone out i purposely struck fire over a very white piece of paper and observing diligently where some conspicuous sparks went out i found a very little black spot no bigger than the point of a pin which through a microscope appeared to be a perfectly round ball looking much like a polished ball of steel insomuch that i was able to see the image of the window reflected from it i cannot here stay having done it more fully in another place to examine the particular reasons of it but shall only hint that i imagine it to be some small parcel of the steel which by the violence of the motion of the stroke most of which seems to be impressed upon those small parcels is made so glowing hot that it is melted into a vitrum which by the ambient air is thrust into the form of a ball a fifth thing which i thought worth examination was whether the motion of all kind of springs might not be reduced to the principle whereby the included heterogeneous fluid seems to be moved or to that whereby two solids as marbles or the like are thrust and kept together by the ambient fluid a sixth thing was whether the rising and ebullition of the water out of springs and fountains which lie much higher from the centre of the earth than the superficies of the sea from whence it seems to be derived may not be explicated by the rising of water in smaller pipe for the sea water being strained through the pores or crannies of the earth is as it were included in little pipes where the pressure of the air has not so great a power to resist its rising but examining this way and finding in it several difficulties almost irremovable i thought upon a way that would much more naturally and conceivably explain it which was by this following experiment 
I took a glass tube of the form of that described in the sixth figure, and choosing two heterogeneous fluids, such as water and oil, I poured in as much water as filled up the pipes as high as AB, then putting in some oil into the tube AC, I depressed the superficies A of the water to F, and B I raised to G, which was not so high perpendicularly as the superficies of the oil F by the space FI, wherefore the proportion of the gravity of these two liquors was as GH to FE. This experiment I tried with several other liquors, and particularly with fresh water and salt, which I made by dissolving salt in warm water, which too, though, they are nothing heterogeneous. Yet, before they would perfectly mix one with another, I made trial of the experiment. Nay, letting the tube wherein, I tried the experiment remain for many days. I observed them not to mix, but the superficies of the fresh was rather more than less elevated above that of the salt. Now the proportion of the gravity of sea water to that of river water, according to Stevinus and Varenius, and as I have since found pretty true by making trial myself, is as 46 to 45. That is, 46 ounces of the salt water will take up no more room than 45 of the fresh, or reciprocally, 45 pints of salt water weigh as much as 46 of fresh. But I found the proportion of brine to fresh water to be near 13 to 12. Supposing, therefore, GHM to represent the sea and FI, the height of the mountain above the superficies of the sea. FM, a cavern in the earth beginning at the bottom of the sea and terminated at the top of the mountain. LM, the sand at the bottom, through which the water is, as it were, strained, so as that the fresher parts are only permitted to transude and the saline kept back. If, therefore, the proportion of GM to FM be as 45 to 46, then may the cylinder of salt water GM make the cylinder of fresh water to rise as high as E, and to run over at N. I cannot here stand to examine or confute their opinion, who make the depth of the sea below its superficies, to be no more perpendicularly measured than the height of the mountains above it. It is enough for me to say there is no one of those that have asserted it have experimentally known the perpendicular of either, nor shall I here determine whether there may not be many other causes of separation of the fresh water from the salt, as perhaps some parts of the earth through which it is to pass, may contain salt, that mixing and uniting with sea salt may precipitate it, much after the same manner as the alkalizate and acid salts mix and precipitate each other in the preparation of tartarum vitriolatum. I know not, also, whether the exceeding cold that must necessarily be at the bottom of the water may not help towards this separation, for we find that warm water is able to dissolve and contain more salt than the same cold, insomuch that brines strongly impregnated by heat, if let cool, do suffer much of their salt to subside and crystallize about the bottom and sides. I know not also whether the exceeding pressure of the parts of the water, one against another, may not keep the salt from descending to the very bottom, as finding little or no room to insert itself between those parts, protrude it so violently together, or else squeeze it upwards into the superior parts of the sea. 
where it may more easily obtain room for itself amongst the parts of the water by reason that there is more heat and less pressure. To this opinion I was somewhat the more induced by the relations I have met with in geographical writers of drawing fresh water from the bottom of the sea, which is salt above. I cannot now stand to examine whether this natural perpetual motion may not artificially be imitated, nor can I stand to answer the objections which may be made against this my supposition. As first, how it come to pass that there are sometimes salt springs much higher than the superficies of the water, and secondly, why springs do not run faster and slower according to the varying height made of the cylinder of sea water by the ebbing and flowing of the sea. As to the first, in short, I say, the fresh water may receive again a saline tincture near the superficies of the earth by passing through some salt mines, or else many of the saline parts of the sea may be kept back, though not all. And as to the second, the same spring may be fed and supplied by diverse caverns coming from very far distant parts of the sea, so as that it may in one place be high, in another low water, and so by that means the spring may be equally supplied at all times, or else the cavern may be so straight and narrow that the water not having so ready and free passage through it cannot upon so short and quick mutations of pressure to be able to produce any sensible effect at such a distance. Besides that, to confirm this hypothesis, there are many examples found in natural historians of springs that do ebb and flow like the sea, as particularly those recorded by the learned Camden, and after him by speed, to be found in this island, one of which they relate to be on the top of a mountain by the small village Kilken in Flintshire. Maris emulus, qui statis temporibus, suos evomit, et resorbet aquas, which at certain times riseth and falleth after the manner of the sea. A second in Carmarthenshire, near Carmarthen, at a place called Cantresbishan, qui ut scribit Geraldus, naturali die bis undis deficiens, et totius exuberans, marinas imitatur instabilitates, that twice in four and twenty hours, ebbing and flowing, resembleth the unstable motions of the sea, the phenomena of which two may be easily made out, by supposing the cavern by which they are fed to arise from the bottom of the next sea. A third is a well upon the river Ogmore, in Glamorganshire, and near unto Newton, of which Camden relates himself to be certified by a letter from a learned friend of his that observed it, Fons Abest Hink, and etc. The letter is a little too long to be inserted, but the substance is this, that this well ebbs and flows quite contrary to the flowing and ebbing of the sea in those parts, for it is almost empty at full sea, but full at low water. This may happen from the channel by which it is supplied, which may come from the bottom of the sea, very remote from those parts, and where the tides are much differing from those of the approximate shores. A fourth lies in Westmoreland, near the river Leder, qui in star Euripisepius in die reciprocantibus undis fluit et refluit, which ebbs and flows many times a day. This may proceed from its being supplied from many channels, 
coming from several parts of the sea, lying sufficiently distant asunder to have the times of high water differing enough one from the other, so as that whensoever it shall be high water over any of those places where these channels begin, it shall likewise be so in the well. But this is but a supposition. A seventh query was whether the dissolution or mixing of several bodies, whether fluid or solid, with saline or other liquors, might not partly be attributed to this principle of the congruity of those bodies and their dissolvance, as of salt in water, metals in several menstruums, unctuous gums in oils, the mixing of wine and water, etc., and whether precipitation be not partly made from the same principle of incongruity. I say partly because there are in some dissolutions some other causes concurrent. I shall lastly make a much more seemingly strange and unlikely query, and that is, whether this principle, well examined and explained, may not be found a coefficient in the most considerable operations of nature, as in those of heat and light, consequently of rarefraction and condensation, hardness and fluidness, perspicuity and opaqueness, refractions and colors, and etc. Nay, I know not whether there may be many things done in nature in which this may not be said to have a finger. This I have in some other passages of this treatise further inquired into and shown that as well light as heat may be caused by corrosion, which is applicable to congruity, and consequently all the rest will be but subsequence. In the meantime, I would not willingly be guilty of that error, which the thrice noble and learned Verulam justly takes notice of, as such, and calls Philosophiae genus empiricum quod in paucorum experimentorum angustiis et obscuritate fundatum est. For I neither conclude from one single experiment nor are the experiments I make use of all made up on one subject, nor rest I any experiment to make it quadrare with any preconceived notion. But on the contrary, I endeavor to be conversant in diverse kinds of experiments, and all and every one of those trials I make the standards or touchstones by which I try all my former notions, whether they hold out in weight, and measure, and touch, and etc. For as that body is no other than a counterfeit gold, which wants any one of the properties of gold, such as are the malleableness, weight, color, fixedness in the fire, indissolubleness in aqua fortis, and the like, though it has all the other, so will all those notions be found to be false and deceitful, that will not undergo all the trials and tests made of them by experiments, and therefore such as will not come up to the desired apex of perfection, I rather wholly reject and take new, than by piecing and patching endeavor to retain the old, as knowing such things at best to be but lame and imperfect. And this course I learned from nature, whom we find neglectful of the old body, and suffering is the case and infirmities to remain without repair, and altogether solicitous and careful of perpetuating the species by new individuals. And it is certainly the most likely way to erect a glorious structure and temple to nature, such as she will be found by any zealous votary 
to reside in, to begin to build anew upon a sure foundation of experiments. But to digress no further from the consideration of the phenomena more immediately explicable by this experiment, we shall proceed to show that, as to the rising of water in a filter, the reason of it will be manifest to him that does take notice that a filter is constituted of a great number of small long solid bodies which lie so close together that the air in its getting in between them doth lose of its pressure that it has against the fluid without them, by which means the water or liquor not finding so strong a resistance between them as is able to counterbalance the pressure on its superficies without, is raised upward till it meet with the pressure of the air which is able to hinder it. And as to the rising of oil, melted tallow, spirit of wine, etc., in the wick of a candle or lamp, it is evident that it differs in nothing from the former, save only in this, that in a filter the liquor descends and runs away by another part, and in the wick the liquor is dispersed and carried away by the flame, something that is ascribable to the heat, for that it may rarefy the more volatile and spirituous parts of those combustible liquors, and so being made lighter than the air, it may be protruded upwards by that more ponderous fluid body in the form of vapours. But this can be ascribed to the ascension of but a very little, and most likely of that only which ascends without a week, as for the rising of it in a sponge, bread, cotton, etc., above the superficies of the subjacent liquor, what has been said about the filter, if considered, will easily suggest a reason, considering that all these bodies abound with small holes or pores. From this same principle also, vis a -vis the unequal pressure of the air against the unequal superficies of the water, precedes the cause of the accession or incursion of any floating body against the sides of the containing vessel, or the appropinquation of two floating bodies, as bubbles, corks, sticks, straws, etc., one towards another. As, for instance, take a glass jar, such as AB, in the seventh figure, and filling it pretty near to the top with water, throw into it a small round piece of cork, as C, and plunge it all over in water, that it be wet, so as that the water may rise up by the sides of it, then placing it anywhere upon the superficies about an inch or one inch and a quarter from any side, and you shall perceive it by degrees to make perpendicularly toward the nearest part of the side, and the nearer it approaches, the faster to be moved, the reason of which phenomena will be found no other than this, that the air has a greater pressure against the middle of the superficies than it has against those parts that approach nearer and are contiguous to the sides. Now that the pressure is greater, may, as I showed before in the explication of the third figure, be evinced from the flatting of the water in the middle, which arises from the gravity of the under fluid. For since, as I showed before, if there were no gravity in the under fluid, or that it were equal to that of the upper, the terminating surface would be spherical, and since it is the additional pressure of the gravity of water that makes it so flat, it follows that the pressure upon the middle must be greater than towards the sides, hence the ball having a stronger pressure against that side of it which respects the middle of superfaces 
than against that which respects the approximate side, must necessarily move towards that part from whence it finds least resistance and so be accelerated as the resistance decrease. Hence, the more the water is raised under that part of its way, it is passing above the middle, the faster it is moved, and therefore you will find it to move faster in E than D, and in D than C. Neither could I find the floating substance to be moved at all, until it were placed upon some part of the superficies that was sensibly elevated above the height of the middle part. Now that this may be the true cause, you may try with a blown bladder and an exactly round ball upon a very smooth side of some pliable body, as horn or quicksilver. For if the ball be placed under a part of the bladder which is upon one side of the middle of its pressure, and you press strongly against the bladder, you shall find the ball moved from the middle towards the sides. Having therefore shown the reason of the motion of any float towards the sides, the reason of the incursion of any two floating bodies will easily appear. For the rising of the water against the sides of either of them, is an argument sufficient to show the pressure of the air to be there less than it is further from it, where it is not so much elevated. And therefore the reason of the motion of the other toward it will be the same as towards the side of the glass, only here from the same reason they are mutually moved towards each other, whereas the other side of the glass in the former remains fixed. If also you gently fill the jar, so full with water, that the water is protuberant above the sides, the same piece of cork that before did hasten towards the sides, does now fly from it as fast towards the middle of the superficies. The reason of which will be found no other than this, that the pressure of the air is stronger against the sides of the superficies G and H than against the middle, I. For since, as I showed before, the principle of congruity would make the terminating surface spherical, and that the flattening of the surface in the middle is from the abatement of the water's pressure outwards by its contrary endeavour of its gravity. It follows that the pressure in the middle must be less than on the sides, and therefore the consecution will be the same as in the former. It is very odd to one that considers not the reason of it, to see two floating bodies of wood to approach each other as though they were endued with some magnetical vigour which brings into my mind what I formerly tried with a piece of cork or such like body, which I so ordered that by putting a little stick into the same water, one part of the said cork would approach and make towards the stick, whereas another would decede and fly away. Nay, it would have a kind of verticity, so as that if the equator, as I may so speak, of the cork were placed towards the stick, if let alone it would instantly turn its appropriate pole toward it, and then run a tilt at it. And this was done only by taking a dry cork and wetting one side of it with one small stroke, for by this means gently putting it upon the water it would depress the superficies on every side of it that was dry, and therefore the greatest pressure of the air, it being near those sides, caused it either to chase away or else to fly off from any other floating body, whereas that side only, against which the water ascended, was thereby able to attract. 
it remains only that I should determine how high the water or the liquor may by this means be raised in a smaller pipe above the superfaces of that without it, and at what height it may be sustained. But to determine this it will be exceeding difficult, unless I could certainly know how much of the air's pressure is taken off by the smallness of such and such a pipe, and whether it may be wholly taken off, that is, whether there can be a hole or pore so small into which air could not at all enter, though water might with its whole force, for were there such, it is manifest, that the water might rise in it to some five or six and thirty English foot high. I know not whether the capillary pipes in the bodies of small trees, which we call their microscopical pores, may not be such, and whether the congruity of the sides of the pore may not yet draw the juice even higher than the air was able by its bare pressure to raise it. For congruity is a principle that not only unites and holds a body joined to it, but which is more attracts and draws a body that is very near it and holds it above its usual height. And this is obvious even in a drop of water suspended under any similar or congruous body. For besides the ambient pressure that helps to keep it sustained, there is the congruity of the bodies that are contiguous. This is yet more evident in tenacious and glutinous bodies, such as gummus liquors, syrups, pitch, and rosin melted, and etc. Tar, turpentine, balsam, bird lime, and etc. For there it is evident that the parts of the tenacious body, as I may so call it, do stick and adhere so closely together that though drawn out into long and very slender cylinders, yet they will not easily relinquish one another. And this, though the bodies be aliquotinous fluid and in motion by one another, which to such as consider a fluid body only as its parts are in a confused irregular motion, without taking in also the congruity of the parts one among another, and in congruity to some other bodies, does appear not a little strange, so that besides the incongruity of the ambient fluid to it, we are to consider also the congruity of the parts of the contained fluid one with another. And this congruity, that I may here a little further explain it, is both a tenacious and an attractive power. For the congruity in the vibrative motions may be the cause of all kind of attraction, not only electrical but magnetical also, and therefore it may be also of tenacity and glutinousness. For from a perfect congruity of the motions of two distant bodies, the intermediate fluid particles are separated and driven away from between them, and thereby those congruous bodies are, by the encompassing mediums, compelled and forced nearer together, wherefore that attractiveness must needs be stronger, when, by an immediate contact, they are forced to be exactly the same. As I shew more at large in my theory of the magnet. And this hints to me the reason of suspension of the mercury many inches, nay many feet, above the usual station of thirty inches. For the parts of quicksilver being so very similar and congruous to each other, if once united, will not easily suffer a divulsion, and the parts of water that were any ways heterogeneous, being by exantlation or rarefaction exhausted, the remaining parts being also very similar, will not easily part neither. 
and the parts of glass being solid are more difficultly disjoined and the water being somewhat similar to both is as it were a medium to unite both the glass and the mercury together so that all three being united and not very dissimilar by means of this contact if care be taken that the tube in erecting be not shocked the quicksilver will remain suspended notwithstanding its contrary endeavour of gravity a great height above its ordinary station but if this immediate contact be removed either by a mere separation of them one from another by the force of a shog whereby the other becomes embodied between them and licks up from the surface some agile parts and so hurling them makes them air or else by some small heterogeneous agile part of the water or air or quicksilver which appears like a bubble and by its jumbling to and fro there is made way for the heterogeneous ether to obtrude itself between the glass and either of the fluids the gravity of mercury precipitates it downward with very great violence and if the vessel that holds the restagnating mercury be convenient the mercury will for a time vibrate to and fro with very large reciprocations and at last will remain kept up by the pressure of the external air at the height of near thirty inches and whereas it may be objected that it cannot be that the mere embodying of the ether between these bodies can be the cause since the ether having a free passage always both through the pores of the glass and through those of the fluids there is no reason why it should not make a separation at all times whilst it remains suspended as when it is violently disjoined by a shog to this i answer that though the ether passes between the particles that is through the pores of the bodies so as that any chasm or separation being made it has infinite passages to admit its entry into it yet such is the tenacity or attractive virtue of congruity that till it be overcome by the mere strength of gravity or by a shog assisting that conatus of gravity or by an agile particle that is like a lever agitated by the ether and thereby the parts of the congruous substances are separated so far asunder that the strength of congruity is so far weakened as not to be able to reunite them the parts to be taken hold of being removed out of the attractive sphere as i may so speak of the congruity such i say is the tenacity of congruity that it retains and holds the almost contiguous particles of the fluid and suffers them not to be separated till by mere force that attractive or retentive faculty be overcome but the separation being once made beyond the sphere of the attractive activity of congruity that virtue becomes of no effect at all but the mercury freely falls downwards till it meet with a resistance from the pressure of the ambient air able to resist its gravity and keep it forced up in the pipe to the height of about thirty inches thus have i gently raised a steel pendulum by a lodestone to a great angle till by the shaking of my hand i have chanced to make a separation between them which is no sooner made but as if the lodestone had retained no attractive virtue the pendulum moves freely from it towards the other side so vast a difference is there between the attractive virtue of the magnet when it acts upon a contiguous and upon a disjoined body and much more must there be between the attractive virtues of congruity upon a contiguous and disjoined body and in truth the attractive virtue is so little upon a body disjoined 
that though I have with the microscope observed very diligently whether there were any extraordinary protuberance on the side of a drop of water that was exceeding near the end of a green stick, but did not touch it, I could not perceive the least, though I found that as soon as ever it touched it, the whole drop would presently unite itself with it, so that it seems an absolute contact is requisite to the exercising of the tenacious faculty of congruity. End of section 10. Observation 6, part 2. Recording by Mike Botez. Section 11 of Micrographia, some physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glasses with observations and inquiries thereupon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Cooper. Micrographia Some Physiological Descriptions of Minute Bodies Made by Magnifying Glasses with Observations and Inquiries Thereupon by Robert Hooke. Observation 7 of some phenomena of glass drops. These glass drops are small parcels of coarse green glass taken out of the pots that contain the metal, as they call it, in fusion, upon the end of an iron pipe, and being exceedingly hot, and thereby of a kind of sluggish fluid confidence, are suffered to drop from thence into a bucket of cold water, and in it to lie till they be grown sensibly cold. Some of these I broke in the open air, by snapping off a little of the small stem with my fingers, others by crushing it with a small pair of pliers, which I had no sooner done than the whole bulk of the drop flew violently, with a very brisk noise, into multitudes of small pieces, some of which were as small as dust, though in some there were remaining pieces pretty large, without any flaw at all, and others very much flawed, which, by rubbing between one's fingers, was easily reduced to dust. These dispersed every way so violently that some of them pierced my skin. I could not find either with my naked eye or a microscope that any of the broken pieces were of a regular figure, nor any one like another, but for the most part those that flawed off in large pieces were prettily branched. The ends of others of these drops I nipped off whilst all the bodies and ends of them lay buried under the water, which, like the former, flew all to pieces with as brisk a noise and as strong a motion. Others of these I tried to break by grinding away the blunt end, and though I took a seemingly good one and had ground away near two-thirds of the ball, yet would it not fly to pieces, but now and then some small rings of it would snap and fly off, not without a brisk noise and quick motion, leaving the surface of the drop whence it flew very prettily branched or creased, which was easily discoverable by the microscope. This drop, after I had thus ground it, without at all impairing the remnant that was not ground away, I caused to fly immediately all into sand upon the nipping off the very tip of its slender end. Another of these drops I began to grind away at the smaller end, but had not worn away on the stone above a quarter of an inch before the whole drop flew with a brisk crack into sand or small dust. Nor would it have held so long had there not been a little flaw in the piece that I ground away, as I afterwards found. Several others of these drops I covered over with a thin but very tough skin of ichthyocola, which being very tough and very transparent, was the most convenient substance for these trials that I could imagine, Having dipped, I say, several of these drops in this transparent glue whilst hot, and suffering them to hang by a string tied about the end of them till they were cold and the skin pretty tough. Then wrapping all the body of the drop, leaving out only the very tip, in fine supple kid's leather very closely, I nipped off the small top and found, as I expected, that notwithstanding this skin of glue and the close wrapping up in leather, Upon the breaking of the top, 
the drop gave a crack like the rest and gave my hand a pretty brisk impulse but yet the skin and leather was so strong as to keep the parts from flying out of their former posture and the skin being transparent i found that the drop retained exactly its former figure and polish but was grown perfectly opacious and all over flawed all those flaws lying in the manner of rings from the bottom or blunt end to the very top or small point and by several examinations with a microscope of several thus broken i found the flaws both within the body of the drop and on the outward surface to lie much in this order let a b in the figure x of the fourth scheme represent the drop cased over with ichthyocola or isinglass by being ordered as is before prescribed crazed or flawed into pieces but by the skin or case kept in its former figure and each of its flawed parts preserved exactly in its due posture the outward appearance of it somewhat plainly to the naked eye but much more conspicuous if viewed with a small lens appeared much after the shape that is the blunt end b for a pretty breadth namely as far as the ring c c c seemed irregularly flawed with diverse clefts which all seemed to tend towards the centre of it being as i afterwards found and shall anon show in the description of the figure y the basis as it were of a cone which was terminated a little above the middle of the drop all the rest of the surface from c c c to a was flawed with an infinite number of small and parallel rings which as they were for the most part very round so were they very thick and close together but were not so exactly flawed as to make a perfect ring but each circular part was by irregular cracks flawed likewise into multitudes of irregular flakes or tiles and this order was observed likewise the whole length of the neck now though i could not exactly cut this conical body through the axis as is represented by the figure y yet by anatomizing as it were of several and taking notice of diverse particular circumstances i was informed that could i have artificially divided a flawed drop through the axis or center i should with a microscope have found it to appear much of this form where a signifies the apex and b the blunt end cc the cone of the basis which is terminated at t the top or end of it which seems to be the very middle of the blunt end in which not only the conical body of the basis cc is terminated but as many of the parts of the drop as reach as high as dd and it seemed to be the head or beginning of a pith as it were or a part of the body which seemed more spongy than the rest and much more irregularly flawed from which t ascended by ee -E, though less visible into the small neck towards a the grain as it were of all the flaws that proceeds from all the outward surface a d c c d a was much the same as is represented by the black strokes that meet in the middle d t d t d e d e etc nor is this kind of grain as i may call it peculiar to glass drops thus quenched for not to mention copra stones and diverse other marcasites and minerals which i have often taken notice of to be in the very same manner flaked or grained with a kind of pith in the middle i have observed the same in all manner of cast iron especially the coarser sort such as stoves and furnaces and backs and pots are made of for upon the breaking of any of those substances it is obvious to observe how from the outsides towards the middle there is a kind of radiation or grain much resembling this of the glass drop but this grain is most conspicuous in iron bullets if they be broken the same phenomena may be produced by casting regulus of antimony into the bullet mold as also with glass of antimony and with almost any such kind of vitrified substance either cast into a cold mold or poured into water others of these drops i heat red hot in the fire and then suffer them to cool by degrees and these i found to have quite lost all their fulminating or flying quality as also their hard brittle and springy texture and to emerge of a much softer temper and much easier to be broken or snapped with one's finger but its strong and brittle quality was quite destroyed 
and it seemed much of the same consistence with other green glass well kneeled in the oven. The figure and bigness of these, for the most part, was the same with that of the figure Z. That is, all the surface of them was very smooth and polished, and for the most part round, but very rugged or knobbed about D, and all the length of the stem was here and there pitted or flatted. About D, which is at the upper part of the drop under the side of the stem which is concave, there usually was made some one or more little hillocks or prominences. The drop itself, before it be broken, appears very transparent, and towards the middle of it to be very full of small bubbles of some kind of aerial substance, which by the refraction of the outward surface appear much bigger than really they are and this may be in good part removed by putting the drop under the surface of clear water, for by that means most part of the refraction of the convex surface of the drop is destroyed, and the bubbles will appear much smaller. And this, by the by, minds me of the appearing magnitude of the aperture of the iris or pupil of the eye, which though it appear, and be therefore judged very large, is yet not above a quarter of the bigness it appears of, by the lenticular refraction of the cornea. The cause of all which phenomena I imagine to be no other than this, that the parts of the glass being by the excessive heat of the fire kept off and separated one from another, and thereby put into a kind of sluggish fluid consistence, are suffered to drop off with that heat or agitation remaining in them into cold water, by which means the outsides of the drop are presently cooled and crusted and are thereby made of a loose texture, because the parts of it have not time to settle themselves leisurely together, and so to lie very close together. And the innermost parts of the drop, retaining still much of their former heat and agitations, remain of a loose texture also, and, according as the cold strikes inwards from the bottom and sides, are quenched, as it were, and made rigid in that very posture wherein the cold finds them. For the parts of the crust being already hardened, will not suffer the parts to shrink any more from the outward surface inward, and though it shrink a little by reason of the small parcels of some aerial substances dispersed through the matter of the glass, yet that is not near so much as it appears, as I just now hinted. Nor if it were, would it be sufficient for to consolidate and condense the body of glass into a tough and close texture after it had been so excessively rarefied by the heat of the glass furnace. But that there may be such an expansion of the aerial substance contained in those little blebs or bubbles in the body of the drop, this following experiment will make more evident. Take a small glass cane, about a foot long, seal up one end of it hermetically, then put in a very small bubble of glass, almost of the shape of an essence vial, with the open mouth towards the sealed end then draw out the other end of the pipe very small, and fill the whole cylinder with water. Then set this tube by the fire till the water begin to boil, and the air in the bubble be in good part rarefied and driven out. Then by sucking at the smalling pipe, more of the air or vapors in the bubble may be sucked out, so that it may sink to the bottom. When it is sunk to the bottom, in the flame of a candle or lamp, nip up the slender pipe and let it cool, whereupon it is obvious to observe, first, that the water by degrees will subside and shrink into much less room, next, that the air or vapors in the glass will expand themselves so as to buoy up the glass, thirdly, that all about the inside of the glass pipe there will appear an infinite number of small bubbles, which, as the water grows colder and colder, will swell bigger and bigger and many of them buoy themselves up and break at the top. From this deceding of the heat in glass drops, that is, by the quenching or cooling irradiations propagated from the surface upwards and inwards by the lines CT, CT, DT, DE, etc., the bubbles in the drop have room to expand themselves a little, and the parts of the glass contract themselves. But this operation being too quick for the sluggish parts of the glass, the contraction is performed very unequally and irregularly, and thereby the particles of the glass are bent, some one way and some another, 
yet so as that most of them draw towards the pith or middle teee -E, or rather from that outward so that they cannot extricate or unbend themselves till some part of teee -E be broken and loosened for all the parts about that are placed in the manner of an arch and so till their hold at teee -E be loosened they cannot fly asunder but uphold and shelter and fix each other much like the stones in a vault where each stone does concur to the stability of the whole fabric and no one stone can be taken away but the whole arch falls and wheresoever any of those radiating wedges dtd etc are removed which are the component parts of this arch the whole fabric presently falls to pieces for all the springs of the several parts are set at liberty which immediately extricate themselves and fly asunder every way, each part by its spring contributing to the darting of itself and some other contiguous part. But if this drop be heat so hot as that the parts by degrees can unbend themselves and be settled and annealed in that posture, and be then suffered gently to subside and cool, the parts by this kneeling losing their springiness constitute a drop of more soft but less brittle texture and the parts being not at all under a flexure though any part of the middle or pith teee -E -E, be broken yet will not the drop at all fly to pieces as before this conjecture of mine i shall endeavor to make out by explaining each particular assertion with analogous experiments the assertions are there first that the parts of the glass whilst in a fluid consistence and hot are more rarefied or take up more room than when hard and cold secondly that the parts of the drop do suffer a twofold contraction thirdly that the dropping or quenching the glowing metal in the water makes it of a hard springing and rarefied texture fourthly that there is a flexion or force remaining upon the parts of the glass thus quenched from which they endeavor to extricate themselves fifthly that the fabric of the drop that is able to hinder the parts from extricating themselves is analogous to that of an arch sixthly that the sudden flying asunder of the parts proceeds from their springiness seventhly that a gradual heating and cooling does anneal or reduce the parts of glass to a texture that is more loose and easier to be broken but not so brittle that the first of these is true may be gathered from this that heat is a property of a body arising from the motion or agitation of its parts and therefore whatever body is thereby touched must necessarily receive some part of that motion whereby its parts will be shaken and agitated and so by degrees free and extricate themselves from one another and each part so moved does by that motion exert a conatus of protruding and displacing all the adjacent particles thus air included in a vessel by being heated will burst it to pieces thus have i broke a bladder held over the fire in my hand with such a violence and noise that it almost made me deaf for the present and much surpassed the noise of a musket the like have i done by throwing into the fire small glass bubbles hermetically sealed with a little drop of water included in them thus water also or any other liquor included in a convenient vessel by being warmed manifestly expands itself with a very great violence so as to break the strongest vessel if when heated it be narrowly imprisoned in it this is very manifest by the sealed thermometers which i have by several trials at last brought to a great certainty in tenderness for i have made some with stems above four foot long in which the expanding liquor would so far vary as to be very near the very top in the heat of summer and pretty near the bottom at the coldest time of the winter the stems i use for them are very thick straight and even pipes of glass with a very small perforation and both the head and the body i have made on purpose at the glass house of the same metal whereof the pipes are drawn these i can easily in the flame of a lamp urged with the blast of a pair of bellows seal and close together so as to remain very firm close and even by this means i join on the body first 
and then fill both it and a part of the stem, proportionate to the length of the stem and the warmth of the season I fill it in with the best rectified spirit of wine, highly tinged with the lovely color of conchineal, which I deepen the more by pouring some drops of common spirit of urine, which must not be too well rectified, because it will be apt to make the liquor to curdle and stick in the small perforation of the stem. This liquor I have upon trial found the most tender of any spirituous liquor, and those are much more sensibly affected with the variations of heat and cold than other more phlegmatic and ponderous liquors, and is capable of receiving a deep tincture and keeping it as any liquor whatsoever, and, which makes it yet more acceptable, is not subject to be frozen by any cold yet known. When I have thus filled it, I can very easily in the aforementioned flame of a lamp seal and join on the head of it. Then, for graduating the stem, I fix that for the beginning of my division where the surface of the liquor in the stem remains when the ball is placed in common distilled water that is so cold that it just begins to freeze and shoots into flakes. And that mark I fix at a convenient place of the stem to make it capable of exhibiting very many degrees of cold below that which is requisite to freeze water. The rest of my divisions, both above and below this, which I mark with a zero or naught, I place according to the degrees of expansion or contraction of the liquor in proportion to the bulk it had when it endured the newly mentioned freezing cold. And this may be very easily and accurately enough done by this following way. Prepare a cylindrical vessel of very thin plate brass or silver, a, B, C, D of the figure Z. The diameter, A, B, of whose cavity let be about two inches, and the depth, B, C, the same, let each end be covered with a flat and smooth plate of the same substance, closely soldered on, and in the midst of the upper cover make a pretty large hole, E, F, about the bigness of a fifth part of the diameter of the other. Into this, fasten very well with cement, a straight and even cylindrical pipe of glass, EFGH, the diameter of whose cavity let be exactly one-tenth of the diameter of the greater cylinder. Let this pipe be marked at GH with a diamond, so that G from E may be distant just two inches, or the same height with that of the cavity of the greater cylinder. Then divide the length EG exactly into ten parts. So the capacity of the hollow of each of these divisions will be one one thousand part of the capacity of the greater cylinder. This vessel being thus prepared, the way of marking and graduating the thermometers may be very easily thus performed. Fill this cylindrical vessel with the same liquor wherewith the thermometers are filled, then place both it and the thermometer you are to graduate in water that is already to be frozen and bring the surface of the liquor in the thermometer to the first mark, or zero. Then so proportion the liquor in the cylindrical vessel, that the surface of it may be just at the lower end of the small glass cylinder. Then, very gently and gradually, warm the water in which both the thermometer and this cylindrical vessel stand. And as you perceive the tinged liquor to rise in both stems, with the point of a diamond, give several marks on the stem of the thermometer at those places, which by comparing the expansion in both stems are found to correspond to the divisions of the cylindrical vessel, and having by this means marked some few of these divisions on the stem, it will be very easy by these to mark all the rest of the stem, and accordingly to assign to every division a proper character. A thermometer, thus marked and prepared, will be the fittest instrument to make a standard of heat and cold that can be imagined. For being sealed up, it is not at all subject to variation or wasting, nor is it liable to be changed by the varying pressure of the air, which all other kind of thermometers that are open to the air are liable to. But to proceed. This property of expansion with heat and contraction with cold is not peculiar to liquors only, but to all kind of solid bodies also, especially metals, which will more manifestly appear by this experiment. Take the barrel of a stopcock of brass, and let the key, which is well fitted to it, be riveted into it, so that it may slip and be easily turned round, then heat this cock in the fire, 
and you will find the key so swollen that you will not be able to turn it round in the barrel. But if it be suffered to cool again, as soon as it is cold it will be as movable and as easy to be turned as before. This quality is also very observable in lead, tin, silver, antimony, pitch, rosin, beeswax, butter, and the like, all which, if after they be melted, you suffer gently to cool, you shall find the parts of the upper surface to subside and fall inwards, losing that plumpness and smoothness it had whilst in fusion. The like I have also observed in the cooling of glass of antimony, which does very near approach the nature of glass. But because these are all examples taken from other materials than glass, and argue only that possibly there may be the like property also in glass, not that really there is, we shall by three or four experiments endeavor to manifest that also. And the first is an observation that is very obvious even in these very drops, to wit, that they are all of them terminated with an unequal or irregular surface, especially about the smaller part of the drop and the whole length of the stem. As about D, and from thence to A, the whole surface, which would have been round if the drop had cooled leisurely, is, by being quenched hastily, very irregularly flatted and pitted, which I suppose proceeds partly from the water's unequally cooling and pressing the parts of the drop, and partly from the self-contracting or subsiding quality of the substance of the glass. For the vehemency of the heat of the drop causes such hidden motions and bubbles in the cold water that some parts of the water bear more forcibly against one part than against another, and consequently do more suddenly cool those parts to which they are contiguous. A second argument may be drawn from the experiment of cutting glasses with a hot iron. For in that experiment, the top of the iron heats and thereby rarefies the parts of the glass that lie just before the crack, whence each of those agitated parts endeavoring to expand itself and get elbow room thrusts off all the rest of the contiguous parts and consequently promotes the crack that was before begun. A third argument may be drawn from the way of producing a crack in a sound piece or plate of glass, which is done two ways, either first by suddenly heating a piece of glass in one place more than in another, and by this means, chymists usually cut off the necks of glass bodies by two kinds of instruments, either by a glowing hot round iron ring, which just encompasses the place that is to be cut, or else by a sulfured threed, which is often wound about the place where the separation is to be made, and then fired. Or secondly, a glass may be cracked by cooling it suddenly in any place with water or the like after it has been all leisurely and gradually heated very hot. Both which phenomena seem manifestly to proceed from the expansion and contraction of the parts of the glass, which is also made more probable by this circumstance which I have observed, that a piece of common window glass, being heated in the middle very suddenly with a live coal or hot iron, does usually at the first crack fall into pieces, whereas if the plate has been gradually heated very hot and a drop of cold water and the like be put on the middle of it, it only flaws it, but does not break it asunder immediately. A fourth argument may be drawn from this experiment. Take a glass pipe and fit into a solid stick of glass so as it will but just be moved in it. Then, by degrees, heat them whilst they are one within another and they will grow stiffer, but when they are again cold, they will be as easy to be turned as before. This expansion of glass is more manifest in this experiment. Take a stick of glass of a considerable length, and fit it so between the two ends or screws of a lath, that it may but just easily turn, and that the very ends of it may be just touched and sustained thereby then applying the flame of the candle to the middle of it and heating it hot, you will presently find the glass to stick very fast on those points, and not without much difficulty to be convertible on them. Before that, by removing the flame for a while from it, it be suffered to cool, and when you will find it as easy to be turned round as the first. From all which experiments it is very evident that all those bodies, and particularly glass, suffers an expansion by heat, and that a very considerable one, 
whilst they are in a state of fusion. For fluidity, as I elsewhere mention, being nothing but an effect of very strong and quick shaking motion, whereby the parts are, as it were, loosened from each other, and consequently leave an interjacent space or vacuity, it follows that all those shaken particles must necessarily take up much more room than when they were at rest, and lay quietly upon each other. And this is further confirmed by a pot of boiling alabaster, which will manifestly rise a sixth or eighth part higher in the pot, whilst it is boiling, than it will remain at both before and after it be boiled. The reason of which odd phenomenon, to hint it here only, by the way, is this, that there is in the curious powder of alabaster and other calcinating stones a certain watery substance which is so fixed and included with the solid particles that till the heat be very considerable they will not fly away. But after the heat is increased to such degree they break out every way in vapors, and thereby so shake and loosen the small corpuscles of the powder from each other that they become perfectly of the nature of a fluid body and one may move a stick to and fro through it, and stir it as easily as water, and the vapors burst and break out in bubbles, just as in boiling water and the like. Whereas, both before those watery parts are flying away, and after they are quite gone, that is, before and after it have done boiling, all those effects cease, and a stick is as difficultly moved to and fro in it as in sand or the like which explication I could easily prove had I time, but this is not a fit place for it. To proceed, therefore, I say, that the dropping of this expanded body into cold water does make the parts of the glass suffer a double contraction. The first is, of those parts which are near the surface of the drop. For cold, as I said before, contracting bodies, that is, by the abatement of the agitating faculty of the parts falling nearer together, the parts next adjoining to the water must needs lose much of their motion, and impart it to the ambient water, which the ebullition and commotion of it manifests, and thereby become a solid and hard crust, whilst the innermost parts remain yet fluid and expanded. Whence, as they grow cold also by degrees, their parts must necessarily be left at liberty to be condensed. But because of the hardness of the outward crust, the contraction cannot be admitted that way. But there being many very small and before inconspicuous bubbles in the substance of the glass, upon the subsiding of the parts of the glass, the agile substance contained in them has liberty of expanding itself a little, and thereby those bubbles grow much bigger, which is the second contraction. And both these are confirmed from the appearance of the drop itself. For as for the outward parts, we see, first, that it is irregular and shrunk, as it were, which is caused by the yielding a little of the hardened skin to a contraction, after the very outmost surface is settled. And as for the internal parts, one may with one's naked eye perceive abundance of very conspicuous bubbles, and with the microscope, many more. The consideration of which particulars will easily make the third position probable, that is, that the parts of the drop will be of a very hard, though of a rarefied texture. For if the outward parts of the drop, by reason of its hard crust, will endure very little contraction, and the agile particles, included in those bubbles, by the losing of their agitation, by the decrease of the heat, lose also most part of their spring and expansive power, it follows the withdrawing of the heat being very sudden, that the parts must be left in a very loose texture, and by reason of the implication of the parts one about another, which form their sluggishness and glutinousness, I suppose to be much after the manner of the sticks in the thorn bush, or a lock of wool. It will follow, I say, that the parts will hold each other very strongly together, and endeavor to draw each other nearer together, and consequently their texture must be very hard and stiff, but very much rarefied. And this will make probable my next position, that the parts of the glass are under a kind of tension or flexure out of which they endeavor to extricate and free themselves, and thereby all the parts draw towards the center or middle and would, if the outward parts would give way, as they do when the outward parts cool leisurely, as in baking of glasses, 
contract the bulk of the drop into a much less compass. For since, as I proved before, the internal parts of the drop, when fluid, were of a very rarefied texture and, as it were, tossed open like a lock of wool, and if they were suffered leisurely to cool, would be again pressed, as it were, close together. And since that the heat, which kept them bended and open, is removed, and yet the parts not suffered to get as near together as they naturally would, it follows that the particles remain under a kind of tension and flexure, and consequently have an endeavor to free themselves from that bending and distension which they do as soon as either the tip be broken, or as soon as by a leisurely heating and cooling the parts are kneeled into another posture. And this will make my next position probable, that the parts of the glass drops are contignated together in the form of an arch, cannot anywhere yield or be drawn inwards, till by the removing of some one part of it, as it happens in the removing one of the stones of an arch, the whole fabric is shattered and falls to pieces, and each of the springs is left at liberty, suddenly to extricate itself. For since I have made it probable that the internal parts of the glass have a contractive power inwards, and the external parts are incapable of such a contraction, and the figure of it being spherical, it follows that the superficial parts must bear against each other, and keep one another from being condensed into a less room, in the same manner as the stones of an arch conduce to upholding each other in that figure. And this is made more probable by another experiment which was communicated to me by an excellent person whose extraordinary abilities and all kind of knowledge, especially in that of natural things, and his generous disposition in communicating, encouraged me to have recourse to him on many occasions. The experiment was this. Small glass balls, about the bigness of that represented in the figure ampersand, would, upon rubbing or scratching the inward surface, fly all in sunder with a pretty brisk noise, whereas neither before nor after the inner surface had been thus scratched did there appear any flaw or crack. And putting the pieces of one of those broken ones together again, the flaws appeared much after the manner of the black lines on the figure ampersand. These balls were small, but exceeding thick bubbles of glass, which being cracked off from the puntillion whilst very hot, and so suffered to cool without kneeling them in the oven over the furnace, do thereby, being made of white glass which cools much quicker than green glass and is thereby made much brittler, acquire a very porous and very brittle texture, so that if with the point of a needle or bodkin the inside of any of them be rubbed pretty hard and then laid on a table, it will, within a very little while, break into many pieces with a brisk noise, and throw the parts above a span asunder on the table. Now, though the pieces are not so small as those of a fulminating drop, yet they as plainly show that the outward parts of the glass have a great conatus to fly asunder, were they not held together by the tenacity of the parts of the inward surface. For we see, as soon as those parts are crazed by hard rubbing, and thereby their tenacity spoiled, the springiness of the more outward parts quickly makes a divulsion and the broken pieces will, if the concave surface of them be further scratched with a diamond, fly again into smaller pieces. From which preceding considerations it will follow, sixthly, that the sudden flying asunder of the parts, as soon as this arch is anywhere disordered or broken, proceeds from the springing of the parts, which, endeavoring to extricate themselves as soon as they get the liberty, they perform it with such a quickness that they throw one another away with very great violence. For the particles that compose the crust have a conatus to lie further from one another, and therefore, as soon as the external parts are loosened, they dart themselves outward with great violence, just as so many springs would do. If they were detained and fastened to the body, as soon as they should be suddenly loosened, and the internal parts drawing inward, they contract so violently that they rebound back again and fly into multitude of small shivers or sands. Now though they appear not, either to the naked eye or the microscope, yet I am very apt to think there may be abundance of small flaws or cracks, which, by reason the strong reflecting air is not got between the contiguous parts, appear not. And that this may be so, I argue from this, 
that I have very often been able to make a crack or flaw in some convenient pieces of glass to appear and disappear at pleasure, according as by pressing together or pulling asunder the contiguous parts. I excluded or admitted the strong reflecting air between the parts. And it is very probable that there may be some body that is either very rarefied air or something analogous to it which fills the bubbles of these drops, which I argue, first, from the roundness of them, and next, from the vivid reflection of light which they exhibit. Now, though I doubt not, but that the air in them is very much rarefied, yet that there is some in them, to such as well consider this experiment of the disappearing of a crack upon the extruding of the air, I suppose it will seem more than probable. The seventh and last, therefore, that I shall prove is that the gradual heating and cooling of these so extended bodies does reduce the parts of the glass to a looser and softer temper, and this I found by heating them and keeping them for a pretty while very red-hot in a fire, for thereby I found them to grow a little lighter, and the small stems to be very easily broken and snapped anywhere, without at all making the drop fly, whereas before they were so exceeding hard that they could not be broken without much difficulty. And upon their breaking, the whole drop would fly in pieces with very great violence. The reason of which last seems to be that the leisurely heating and cooling of the parts does not only waste some part of the glass itself, but ranges all the parts into a better order, and gives each particle an opportunity of relaxing itself, and consequently, neither will the parts hold so strongly together as before, nor be so difficult to be broken. The parts now more easily yielding, nor will the other parts fly in pieces, because the parts have no bended springs. The relaxation, also in the temper of hardened steel and hammered metals, by kneeling them in the fire, seems to proceed from much the same cause. For both by quenching suddenly such metals as have vitrified parts interspersed, as steel has, and by hammering of other kinds that do not so much abound with them as silver brass, etc., the parts are put into and detained in a bended posture, which by the agitation of heat are shaken and loosened and suffered to unbend themselves. End of section 11. Recorded by Jim Cooper. JimCooperVoiceArtist.com Section 12 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 8 of the fiery sparks struck from a flint or steel. It is a very common experiment, by striking with a flint against a steel, to make certain fiery and shining sparks to fly out from between those two compressing bodies. About eight years since, upon casually reading the explication of this odd phenomenon by the most ingenious Descartes, I had a great desire to be satisfied what that substance was that gave such a shining and bright light. And to that end, I spread a sheet of white paper, and on it, observing the place where several of these sparks seemed to vanish, I found certain very small, black, but glittering spots of a movable substance, each of which, examining with my microscope, I found to be a small round globule some of which, as they looked pretty small, so did they from their surface yield a very bright and strong reflection on that side which was next the light, and each looked almost like a pretty bright iron ball, whose surface was pretty regular, such as is represented by the figure A. In this I could perceive the image of the window pretty well, or of a stick which I moved up and down between the light and it. Others I found, which were, as to the bulk of the ball, pretty regularly round, but the surface of them, as it was not very smooth, but rough and more irregular, 
so was the reflection from it more faint and confused such were the surfaces of b c d and e some of these i found cleft or cracked as c others quite broken in two and hollow as d which seemed to be half the hollow shell of a granado broken irregularly in pieces several others i found of other shapes but that which is represented by e i observed to be a very big spark of fire which went out upon one side of the flint that i struck far withal to which it stuck by the root f at the end of which small stem was fastened on a hemisphere or half a hollow ball with the mouth of it open from the stemwards so that it looked much like a funnel or an old-fashioned bowl without a foot this night making many trials and observations of this experiment i met among a multitude of the globular ones which i had observed a couple of instances which are very remarkable to the confirmation of my hypothesis and the first was of a pretty big ball fastened on to the end of a small sliver of iron which compositum seemed to be nothing else but a long thin chip of iron one of whose ends was melted into a small round globule the other end remaining unmelted and irregular and perfectly iron the second instance was not less remarkable than the first for i found when a spark went out nothing but a very small thin long sliver of iron or steel unmelted at either end so that it seems that some of these sparks are the slivers or chips of the iron vitrified others are only the slivers melted into balls without vitrification and the third kind are only small slivers of the iron made red-hot with the violence of the stroke given on the steel by the flint he that shall diligently examine the phenomena of this experiment will i doubt not find cause to believe that the reason i have heretofore given of it is the true and genuine cause of it namely that the spark appearing so bright in the falling is nothing else but a small piece of the steel or flint but most commonly of the steel which by the violence of the stroke is at the same time severed and heat red hot and that sometimes to such a degree as to make it melt together into a small globule of steel and sometimes also is that heat so very intense as further to melt it and vitrify it but many times the heat is so gentle as to be able to make the sliver only red hot which notwithstanding falling upon the tinder that is only a very curious small coal made of the small threads of linen burnt to coals and charred it easily sets it on fire nor will any part of this hypothesis seem strange to him that considers first that either hammering or filing or otherwise violently rubbing of steel will presently make it so hot as to be able to burn one's fingers next that the whole force of the stroke is exerted upon that small part where the flint and steel first touch for the bodies being each of them so very hard the pulls cannot be far communicated that is the parts of each can yield but very little and therefore the violence of the concussion will be exerted on that piece of steel which is cut off by the flint thirdly that the filings or small parts of steel are very apt as it were to take fire and are presently red hot that is there seems to be a very combustible sulphurous body in iron or steel which the air very readily preys upon 
as soon as the body is a little violently heated and this is obvious in the filings of steel or iron cast through the flame of a candle for even by that sudden transitus of the small chips of iron they are heat red hot and that combustible sulphurous body is presently preyed upon and devoured by the aerial encompassing menstruum whose office in this particular i have shewn in the explication of charcoal and in prosecution of this experiment having taken the filings of iron and steel and with the point of a knife cast them through the flame of a candle i observed where some conspicuous shining particles fell and looking on them with my microscope i found them to be nothing else but such round globules as i formerly found the spark struck from the steel by a stroke to be only a little bigger and shaking together all the filings that had fallen upon the sheet of paper underneath and observing them with the microscope i found a great number of small globules such as the former though there were also many of the parts that had remained untouched and rough filings or chips of iron so that it seems iron does contain a very combustible sulphurous body which is in all likelihood one of the causes of this phenomenon and which may be perhaps very much concerned in the business of its hardening and tempering of which somewhat is said in the description of muscovy glass so that these things considered we need not trouble ourselves to find out what kind of pores they are both in the flint and steel that contain the atoms of fire nor how these atoms come to be hindered from running all out when a door or passage in their pores is made by the concussion nor need we trouble ourselves to examine by what prometheus the element of fire comes to be fetched down from above the regions of the air in what cells or boxes it is kept and what epimetheus lets it go nor to consider what it is that causes so great a conflux of the atomical particles of fire which are said to fly to a flaming body like vultures or eagles to a putrefying carcass and there to make a very great pudder since we have nothing more difficult in this hypothesis to conceive first as to the kindling of tinder then how a large iron bullet let fall red or glowing hot upon a heap of small coal should set fire to those that are next to it first nor secondly is this last more difficult to be explicated than that a body as silver for instance put into a weak menstruum as unrectified aqua fortis should when it is put in a great heat be there dissolved by it and not before which hypothesis is more largely explicated in the description of charcoal to conclude we see by this instance how much experiments may conduce to the regulating of philosophical notions for if the most acute descartes had applied himself experimentally to have examined what substance it was that caused that shining of the falling sparks struck from a flint and a steel he would certainly have a little altered his hypothesis and we should have found that his ingenious principles would have admitted a very plausible explication of this phenomenon whereas by not examining so far as he might he has set down an explication which experiment does contradict but before i leave this description I must not forget to take notice of the globular form into which each of these is most curiously formed and this phenomenon as i have elsewhere more largely shewn proceeds from a propriety 
which belongs to all kinds of fluid bodies more or less and is caused by the incongruity of the ambient and included fluid which so acts and modulates each other that they acquire as near as is possible a spherical or globular form which propriety and several of the phenomena that proceed from it i have more fully explicated in the sixth observation one experiment which does very much illustrate my present explication and is in itself exceeding pretty i must not pass by and that is a way of making small globules or balls of lead or tin as small almost as these of iron or steel and that exceeding easily and quickly by turning the filings or chips of those metals also into perfectly round globules the way in short as i received it from the learned physician dr i g is this reduce the metal you would thus shape into exceeding fine filings the finer the filings are the finer will the balls be stratify these filings with the fine and well dried powder of quicklime in a crucible proportioned to the quantity you intend to make when you have thus filled your crucible by continual stratifications of the filings and powder so that as near as may be no one of the filings may touch another place the crucible in a gradual fire and by degrees let it be brought to a heat big enough to make all the filings that are mixed with the quicklime to melt and no more for if the fire be too hot many of these filings will join and run together whereas if the heat be proportioned upon washing the lime dust in fair water all those small filings of the metal will subside to the bottom in a most curious powder consisting all of exactly round globules which if it be very fine is very excellent to make our glasses of now though quicklime be the powder that this direction makes choice of yet i doubt not but that there may be much more convenient ones found out one of which i have made trial of and found very effectual and were it not for discovering by the mentioning of it another secret which i am not free to impart i should have here inserted it End of section 12section 13 of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org micrographia by robert hook section 13 observation 9 part 1 of the colors observable in muscovy glass and other thin bodies muscovy glass or lapis specularis is a body that seems to have as many curiosities in its fabric as any common mineral i have met with for first it is transparent to a great thickness next it is compounded of an infinite number of thin flakes joined or generated one upon another so close and smooth as with many hundreds of them to make one smooth and thin plate of a transparent flexible substance which with care and diligence may be flit into pieces so exceedingly thin as to be hardly perceivable by the eye and yet even those which i have thought the thinnest i have with a good microscope found to be made up of many other plates yet thinner and it is probable that were our microscopes much better we might much further discover its divisibility 
nor are these flakes only regular as to the smoothness of their surfaces but thirdly in many plates they may be perceived to be terminated naturally with edges of the figure of a rhomboid this figure is much more conspicuous in our english talk much whereof is found in the lead mines and is commonly called spar and caulk which is of the same kind of substance with the selenitis but is seldom found in so large flakes as that is nor is it altogether so tough but is much more clear and transparent and much more curiously shaped and yet may be cleft and flaked like the other selenitis but fourthly this stone has a property which in respect of the microscope is more notable and that is that it exhibits several appearances of colors both to the naked eye but much more conspicuously to the microscope for the exhibiting of which i took a piece of muscovy glass and splitting or cleaving it into thin plates i found that up and down in several parts of them i could plainly perceive several white specks or flaws and others diversely colored with all the colors of the rainbow and with the microscope i could perceive that these colors were ranged in rings that encompassed the white speck or flaw and were round or irregular according to the shape of the spot which they terminated and the position of colors in respect of one another was the very same as in the rainbow the consecution of those colors from the middle of the spot outward being blue purple scarlet yellow green blue purple scarlet and so onwards sometimes half a score times repeated that is there appeared six seven eight nine or ten several colored rings or lines each encircling the other in the same manner as i have often seen a very vivid rainbow to have four or five several rings of colors that is accounting all the gradations between red and blue for one but the order of the colors in these rings was quite contrary to the primary or innermost rainbow and the same with those of the secondary or outermost rainbow these colored lines or irises as i may so call them were some of them much brighter than others and some of them also very much broader they being some of them ten twenty nay i believe near a hundred times broader than others and those usually were broadest which were nearest the center or middle of the flaw and oftentimes i found that these colors reached to the very middle of the flaw and then there appeared in the middle a very large spot for the most part all of one color which was very vivid and all the other colors encompassing it gradually ascending and growing narrower towards the edges keeping the same order as in the secondary rainbow that is if the middle were blue the next encompassing it would be a purple the third a red the fourth a yellow etc as above if the middle were a red the next without it would be a yellow the third a green the fourth a blue and so onward and this order it always kept whatsoever were the middle color there was further observable in several other parts of this body many lines or threads each of them of some one peculiar color and those so exceedingly bright and vivid that it afforded a very pleasant object through the microscope some of these threads i have observed also to be pieced or made up of several short lengths of differently colored ends 
as I may so call them, as a line appearing about two inches long through the microscope has been compounded of about half an inch of a peach color, one-eighth of a lovely grass green, three-fourths of an inch more of a bright scarlet, and the rest of the line of a watchet blue. Others of them were much otherwise colored, the variety being almost infinite. Another thing which is very observable is that if you find any place where the colors are very broad and conspicuous to the naked eye, you may, by pressing that place with your finger, make the colors change places and go from one part to another. There is one phenomenon more which may, if care be used, exhibit to the beholder, as it has divers times to me, an exceeding pleasant and not less instructive spectacle. And that is, if curiosity and diligence be used, you may so split this admirable substance that you may have pretty large plates in companion of those smaller ones which you may observe in the rings that are perhaps an one-eighth or a one-sixth part of an inch over, each of them appearing through the microscope most curiously, entirely, and uniformly adorned with some one vivid color. This, if examined with the microscope, may be plainly perceived to be in all parts of it equally thick. Two, three, or more of these lying one upon another exhibit oftentimes curious compounded colors which produce such a compositum as one would scarce imagine should be the result of such ingredients as perhaps a faint yellow and a blue may produce a very deep purple but when anon we come to the more strict examination of these phenomena and to inquire into the causes and reasons of these productions, we shall, I hope, make it more conceivable how they are produced, and show them to be no other than the natural and necessary effects arising from the peculiar union of concurrent causes. These phenomena, being so various and so truly admirable, it will certainly be very well worth our inquiry to examine the causes and reasons of them and to consider whether from these causes demonstratively evidenced may not be deduced the true causes of the production of all kind of colors. And I the rather now do it instead of an appendix or digression to this history than upon the occasion of examining the colors in peacocks or other feathers, because this subject, as it does afford more variety of particular colors, so does it afford much better ways of examining each circumstance. And this will be made manifest to him that considers, first, that this laminated body is more simple and regular than the parts of peacock's feathers, this consisting only of an indefinite number of plain and smooth plates heaped up or incumbent on each other. Next, that the parts of this body are much more manageable to be divided or joined than the parts of a peacock's feather or any other substance that I know. And thirdly, because that in this we are able from a colorless body to produce several colored bodies, affording all the variety of colors imaginable, and several others which the subsequent inquiry will make manifest. To begin, therefore, it is manifest from several circumstances that the material cause of the apparition of these several colors is some lamina or plate of a transparent or pellucid body of a thickness very determinate and proportioned 
according to the greater or less refractive power of the pellucid body and that this is so abundance of instances and particular circumstances will make manifest as first if you take any small piece of the muscovy glass and with a needle or some other convenient instrument cleave it oftentimes into thinner and thinner laminae you shall find that till you come to a determinate thinness of them they shall all appear transparent and colorless but if you continue to split and divide them further you shall find at last that each plate after it comes to such a determinate thickness shall appear most lovely tinged or imbued with a determinate color if further by any means you so flaw a pretty thick piece that one part does begin to cleave a little from the other and between those two there be by any means gotten some pellucid medium those laminated pellucid bodies that fill that space shall exhibit several rainbows or colored lines the colors of which will be disposed and ranged according to the various thicknesses of the several parts of that plate that this is so is yet further confirmed by this experiment take two small pieces of ground and polished looking-glass plate each about the bigness of a shilling take these two dry and with your forefingers and thumbs press them very hard and close together and you shall find that when they approach each other very near there will appear several irises or colored lines in the same manner almost as in the muscovy glass and you may very easily change any of the colors of any part of the interposed body by pressing the plates closer and harder together or leaving them more lax that is a part which appeared colored with a red may be presently tinged with a yellow blue green purple or the like by altering the appropinquation of the terminating plates now that air is not necessary to be the interposed body but that any other transparent fluid will do much the same may be tried by wetting those approximated surfaces with water or any other transparent liquor and proceeding with it in the same manner as you did with the air and you will find much the like effect only with this difference that those compressed bodies which differ most in their refractive quality from the compressing bodies exhibit the most strong and vivid tinctures nor is it necessary that this laminated and tinged body should be of a fluid substance any other substance provided it be thin enough and transparent doing the same thing this the laminae of our muscovy glass hint but it may be confirmed by multitudes of other instances and first we shall find that even glass itself may by the help of a lamp be blown thin enough to produce these phenomena of colors which phenomena accidentally happening as i have been attempting to frame small glasses with a lamp did not a little surprise me at first having never heard or seen anything of it before though afterwards comparing it with the phenomena i had often observed in those bubbles which children used to make with soap water i did the less wonder especially when upon experiment i found i was able to produce the same phenomena in thin bubbles made with any other transparent substance thus have i produced them with bubbles of pitch rosin colophony turpentine solutions of several gums as gum arabic in water 
any glutinous liquor as wort wine spirit of wine oil of turpentine glare of snails etc it would be needless to enumerate the several instances these being enough to show the generality or universality of this propriety only i must not omit that we have instances also of this kind even in metalline bodies and animal for those several colors which are observed to follow each other upon the polished surface of hardened steel when it is by a sufficient degree of heat gradually tempered or softened are produced from nothing else but a certain thin lamina of a vitrum or vitrified part of the metal which by that degree of heat and the concurring action of the ambient air is driven out and fixed on the surface of the steel and this hints to me a very probable at least if not the true cause of the hardening and tempering of steel which has not i think been yet given nor that i know of been so much as thought of by any and that is this that the hardness of it arises from a greater proportion of a vitrified substance interspersed through the pores of the steel and that the tempering or softening of it arises from the proportionate or smaller parcels of it left within those pores this will seem the more probable if we consider these particulars first that the pure parts of metals are of themselves very flexible and tough that is will endure bending and hammering and yet retain their continuity next that the parts of all vitrified substances as all kinds of glass the scoria of metals etc are very hard and also very brittle being neither flexible nor malleable but may by hammering or beating be broken into small parts or powders thirdly that all metals excepting gold and silver which do not so much with the bare fire unless assisted by other saline bodies do more or less vitrify by the strength of fire that is are corroded by a saline substance which i elsewhere show to be the true cause of fire and are thereby as by several other menstruums converted into scoria and this is called calcining of them by chemists thus iron and copper by heating and quenching do turn all of them by degrees into scoria which are evidently vitrified substances and unite with glass and are easily fusible and when cold very hard and very brittle fourthly that most kind of vitrifications or calcinations are made by salts uniting and incorporating with the metalline particles nor do i know any one calcination wherein a saline body may not with very great probability be said to be an agent or coadjutor fifthly that iron is converted into steel by means of the incorporation of certain salts with which it is kept a certain time in the fire sixthly that any iron may in a very little time be case hardened as the tradesmen call it by casing the iron to be hardened with clay and putting between the clay and iron a good quantity of a mixture of urine soot sea salt and horses hoofs all which contain great quantities of saline bodies and then putting the case into a good strong fire and keeping it in a considerable degree of heat for a good while and afterwards heating and quenching or cooling it suddenly in cold water 
seventhly that all kind of vitrified substances by being suddenly cooled become very hard and brittle and thence arises the pretty phenomena of the glass drops which i have already further explained in its own place eighthly that those metals which are not so apt to vitrify do not acquire any hardness by quenching in water as silver gold etc these considerations premised will i suppose make way for the more easy reception of this following explication of the phenomena of hardened and tempered steel that steel is a substance made out of iron by means of a certain proportionate vitrification of several parts which are so curiously and proportionately mixed with the more tough and unaltered parts of the iron that when by the great heat of the fire this vitrified substance is melted and consequently rarefied and thereby the pores of the iron are more open if then by means of dipping it in cold water it be suddenly cold and the parts hardened that is stayed in that same degree of expansion they were in when hot the parts become very hard and brittle and that upon the same account almost as small parcels of glass quenched in water grow brittle which we have already explicated if after this the piece of steel be held in some convenient heat till by degrees certain colors appear upon the surface of the brightened metal the very hard and brittle tone of the metal by degrees relaxes and becomes much more tough and soft namely the action of the heat does by degrees loosen the parts of the steel that were before stretched or set a tilt as it were and stayed open by each other whereby they become relaxed and set at liberty whence some of the more brittle interjacent parts are thrust out and melted into a thin skin on the surface of the steel which from no color increases to a deep purple and so onward by these gradations or consecutions white yellow orange minium scarlet purple blue watchet etc and the parts within are more conveniently and proportionately mixed and so they gradually subside into a texture which is much better proportioned and closer joined whence that rigidness of parts ceases and the parts begin to acquire their former ductilness now that tis nothing but the vitrified metal that sticks upon the surface of the colored body is evident from this that if by any means it be scraped and rubbed off the metal underneath it is white and clear and if it be kept longer in the fire so as to increase to a considerable thickness it may by blows be beaten off in flakes this is further confirmed by this observable that that iron or steel will keep longer from rusting which is covered with this vitrified case thus also lead will by degrees be all turned into a litharge for that color which covers the top being scummed or shoved aside appears to be nothing else but a litharge or vitrified lead this is observable also in some sort on brass copper silver gold tin but is most conspicuous in lead all those colors that cover the surface of the metal being nothing else but a very thin vitrified part of the heated metal the other instance we have is in animal bodies as in pearls mother-of-pearl shells oyster shells 
and almost all other kinds of stony shells whatsoever. This have I also sometimes with pleasure observed even in muscles and tendons. Further, if you take any glutinous substance and run it exceedingly thin upon the surface of a smooth glass or a polished metalline body, you shall find the like effects produced. And in general, wheresoever you meet with a transparent body thin enough that is terminated by reflecting bodies of differing refractions from it, there will be a production of these pleasing and lovely colors. Nor is it necessary that the two terminating bodies should be both of the same kind, as may appear by the vitrified laminae on steel, lead, and other metals, one surface of which laminae is contiguous to the surface of the metal, the other to that of the air. Nor is it necessary that these colored laminae should be of an even thickness, that is, should have their edges and middles of equal thickness, as in a looking-glass plate, which circumstance is only requisite to make the plate appear all of the same color but they may resemble a lens, that is, have their middles thicker than their edges, or else a double concave, that is, be thinner in the middle than at the edges. In both which cases there will be various colored rings or lines with differing consecutions or orders of colors, the order of the first from the middle outwards being red, yellow, green, blue, etc., and the latter quite contrary. But further, it is altogether necessary that the plate, in the places where the colors appear, should be of a determinate thickness. First, it must not be more than such a thickness, for when the plate is increased to such a thickness, the colors cease. And besides, I have seen in a thin piece of Muscovy glass, where the two ends of two plates, which appearing both single, exhibited two distinct and differing colors. But in that place where they were united, and constituted one double plate, as I may call it, they appeared transparent and colorless. Nor, secondly, may the plates be thinner than such a determinate size. For we always find that the very outmost rim of these flaws is terminated in a white and colorless ring. Further, in this production of colors, there is no need of a determinate light of such a bigness and no more nor of a determinate position of that light, that it should be on this side and not on that side, nor of a terminating shadow, as in the prism and rainbow or water ball. For we find that the light in the open air, either in or out of the sunbeams, and within a room, either from one or many windows, produces much the same effect. Only where the light is brightest, there the colors are most vivid. So does the light of a candle, collected by a glass ball. And further, it is all one whatever side of the colored rings be towards the light, for the whole ring keeps its proper colors from the middle outwards in the same order as I before related without varying at all, upon changing the position of the light. But above all it is most observable that here are all kind of colors generated in a pellucid body, where there is properly no such refraction as Descartes supposes his globules to acquire a virtuity by, for in the plain and even plates it is manifest that the second refraction, according to Descartes, his principles, 
in the fifth section of the eighth chapter of his meteors does regulate and restore the supposed turbinated globules unto their former uniform motion this experiment therefore will prove such a one as our thrice excellent verulam calls experimentum crucis serving as a guide or landmark by which to direct our course in the search after the true cause of colors affording us this particular negative information that for the production of colors there is not necessary either a great refraction as in the prism nor secondly a determination of light and shadow such as is both in the prism and glass ball now that we may see likewise what affirmative and positive instruction it yields it will be necessary to examine it a little more particularly and strictly which that we may the better do it will be requisite to premise somewhat in general concerning the nature of light and refraction and first for light it seems very manifest that there is no luminous body but has the parts of it in motion more or less first that all kind of fiery burning bodies have their parts in motion i think will be very easily granted me that the spark struck from a flint and steel is in a rapid agitation i have elsewhere made probable and that the parts of rotten wood rotten fish and the like are also in motion i think will as easily be conceded by those who consider that those parts never begin to shine till the bodies be in a state of putrefaction and that is now generally granted by all to be caused by the motion of the parts of putrefying bodies that the bononian stone shines no longer than it is either warmed by the sunbeams or by the flame of a fire or of a candle is the general report of those that write of it and of others that have seen it and that heat argues a motion of the internal parts is as i said before generally granted but there is one instance more which was first shown to the royal society by mr clayton a worthy member thereof which does make this assertion more evident than all the rest and that is that a diamond being rubbed struck or heated in the dark shines for a pretty while after so long as that motion which is imparted by any of those agents remains in the same manner as a glass rubbed struck or by a means which i shall elsewhere mention heated yields a sound which lasts as long as the vibrating motion of that sonorous body several experiments made on which stone are since published in a discourse of colors by the truly honorable mr boyle what may be said of those ignis fatui that appear in the night i cannot so well affirm having never had the opportunity to examine them myself nor to be informed by any others that had observed them and the relations of them in authors are so imperfect that nothing can be built on them but i hope i shall be able in another place to make it at least very probable that there is even in those also a motion which causes this effect that the shining of sea-water proceeds from the same cause may be argued from this that it shines not till either it be beaten against a rock or be some other ways broken or agitated by storms or oars or other percussing bodies and that the animal energies or spirituous agile parts are very active in cat's eyes when they shine seems evident enough 
because their eyes never shine but when they look very intensely either to find their prey or being hunted in a dark room when they seek after their adversary or to find a way to escape and the like may be said of the shining bellies of glow-worms since tis evident they can at pleasure either increase or extinguish that radiation it would be somewhat too long a work for this place zetetically to examine and positively to prove what particular kind of motion it is that must be the efficient of light for though it be a motion yet tis not every motion that produces it since we find there are many bodies very violently moved which yet afford not such an effect and there are other bodies which to our other senses seem not moved so much which yet shine thus water and quicksilver and most other liquors heated shine not and several hard bodies as iron silver brass copper wood etc though very often struck with a hammer shine not presently though they will all of them grow exceeding hot whereas rotten wood rotten fish sea-water glow-worms etc have nothing of tangible heat in them and yet where there is no stronger light to affect the sensory they shine some of them so vividly that one may make a shift to read by them it would be too long i say here to insert the discursive progress by which i inquired after the properties of the motion of light and therefore i shall only add the result and first i found it ought to be exceeding quick such as those motions of fermentation and putrefaction whereby certainly the parts are exceeding nimbly and violently moved and that because we find those motions are able more minutely to shatter and divide the body than the most violent heats menstruums we yet know and that fire is nothing else but such a dissolution of the burning body made by the most universal menstruum of all so furious bodies namely the air we shall in another place of this tractate endeavour to make probable and that in all extremely hot shining bodies there is a very quick motion that causes light as well as a more robust that causes heat may be argued from the celerity wherewith the bodies are dissolved next it must be a vibrative motion and for this the newly mentioned diamond affords us a good argument since if the motion of the parts did not return the diamond must after many rubbings decay and be wasted but we have no reason to suspect the latter especially if we consider the exceeding difficulty that is found in cutting or wearing away a diamond and a circular motion of the parts is much more improbable since if that were granted and they be supposed irregular and angular parts i see not how the parts of the diamond should hold so firmly together or remain in the same sensible dimensions which yet they do next if they be globular and moved only with a turbinated motion i know not any cause that can impress that motion upon the pellucid medium which yet is done thirdly any other irregular motion of the parts one amongst another must necessarily make the body of a fluid consistence from which it is far enough it must therefore be a vibrating motion and thirdly that it is a very short vibrating motion i think the instances drawn from the shining of diamonds will also make probable 
for a diamond being the hardest body we yet know in the world and consequently the least apt to yield or bend must consequently also have its vibrations exceeding short and these i think are the three principal proprieties of emotion requisite to produce the effect called light in the object the next thing we are to consider is the way or manner of the trajection of this motion through the interposed pellucid body to the eye and here it will be easily granted first that it must be a body susceptible and impartable of this motion that will deserve the name of a transparent and next that the parts of such a body must be homogeneous or of the same kind thirdly that the constitution and motion of the parts must be such that the appulse of the luminous body may be communicated or propagated through it to the greatest imaginable distance in the least imaginable time though i see no reason to affirm that it must be in an instant for i know not any one experiment or observation that does prove it and whereas it may be objected that we see the sun risen at the very instant when it is above the sensible horizon and that we see a star hidden by the body of the moon at the same instant when the star the moon and our eye are all in the same line and the like observations or rather suppositions may be urged i have this to answer that i can as easily deny as they affirm for i would fain know by what means any one can be assured any more of the affirmative than i of the negative if indeed the propagation were very slow tis possible something might be discovered by eclipses of the moon but though we should grant the progress of the light from the earth to the moon and from the moon back to the earth again to be full two minutes in performing i know not any possible means to discover it nay there may be some instances perhaps of horizontal eclipses that may seem very much to favor this supposition of the slower progression of light than most imagine and the like may be said of the eclipses of the sun etc but of this only by the by fourthly that the motion is propagated every way through an homogeneous medium by direct or straight lines extended every way like rays from the center of a sphere fifthly in an homogeneous medium this motion is propagated every way with equal velocity whence necessarily every pulse or vitration of the luminous body will generate a sphere which will continually increase and grow bigger just after the same manner though indefinitely swifter as the waves or rings on the surface of the water do swell into bigger and bigger circles about a point of it where by the sinking of a stone the motion was begun whence it necessarily follows that all the parts of these spheres undulated through an homogeneous medium cut the rays at right angles but because all transparent mediums are not homogeneous to one another therefore we will next examine how this pulse or motion will be propagated through differingly transparent mediums and here according to the most acute and excellent philosopher descartes i suppose the sign of the angle of inclination in the first medium to be to the sign of refraction in the second as the density of the first to the density of the second by density i mean not the density in respect of gravity 
with which the refractions or transparency of mediums hold no proportion but in respect only to the trajection of the rays of light in which respect they only differ in this that the one propagates the pulse more easily and weakly the other more slowly but more strongly but as for the pulses themselves they will by the refraction acquire another propriety which we shall now endeavor to explicate we will suppose therefore in the first figure a c f d to be a physical ray or a b c and d e f to be two mathematical rays trajected from a very remote point of a luminous body through an homogeneous transparent medium l l l and d a e b f c to be small portions of the orbicular impulses which must therefore cut the rays at right angles these rays meeting with the plane surface in o of a medium that yields an easier transitus to the propagation of light and falling obliquely on it they will in the medium m m m be refracted towards the perpendicular of the surface and because this medium is more easily trajected than the former by a third therefore the point c of the orbicular pulse f c will be moved to h four spaces in the same time that f the other end of it is moved to g three spaces therefore the whole refracted pulse g h shall be oblique to the refracted rays c h k and g i and the angle g h c shall be an acute and so much the more acute by how much the greater the refraction be than which nothing is more evident for the sign of the inclination is to the sign of refraction as g f to t c the distance between the point c and the perpendicular from g on c k which being as four to three h c being longer than g f is longer also than t c therefore the angle g h c is less than g t c so that henceforth the parts of the pulses g h and i k are moved askew or cut the rays at oblique angles it is not my business in this place to set down the reasons why this or that body should impede the rays more others less as why water should transmit the rays more easily though more weakly than air only thus much in general i shall hint that i suppose the medium m m m to have less of the transparent undulating subtle matter and that matter to be less implicated by it whereas l l l i suppose to contain a greater quantity of the fluid undulating substance and this to be more implicated with the particles of that medium but to proceed the same kind of obliquity of the pulses and rays will happen also when the refraction is made out of a more easy into a more difficult medieu as by the calculations of g q and c s r which are refracted from the perpendicular in both which calculations tis obvious to observe that always that part of the ray towards which the refraction is made has the end of the orbicular pulse precedent to that of the other side and always 
the oftener the refraction is made the same way or the greater the single refraction is the more is this unequal progress so that having found this odd propriety to be an inseparable concomitant of a refracted ray not straightened by a contrary refraction we will next examine the refractions of the sunbeams as they are suffered only to pass through a small passage obliquely out of a more difficult into a more easy medium End of section 13. Section 14 of Micrographia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Observation 9, Part 2. Let us suppose, therefore, ABC in the second figure to represent a large chemical glass body about two foot long, filled with very fair water as high as AB, and inclined in a convenient posture with B towards the sun. Let us further suppose the top of it to be covered with an opacous body, all but the whole AB, through which the sunbeams are suffered to pass into the water and are thereby refracted to c d e f against which part if a paper be expanded on the outside there will appear all the colours of the rainbow that is there will be generated the two principal colours scarlet and blue and all the intermediate ones which arise from the composition and dilutings of these two that is c d shall exhibit a scarlet which toward d is diluted into a yellow this is the refraction of the ray i k which comes from the underside of the sun and the ray e f shall appear of a deep blue which is gradually towards e diluted into a pale watchet blue between d and e the two diluted colors blue and yellow are mixed and compounded into a green and this i imagine to be the reason why green is so acceptable a colour to the eye and that either of the two extremes are if intense rather a little offensive namely the being placed in the middle between the two extremes and compounded out of both these diluted also or somewhat qualified for the composition arising from the mixture of the two extremes undiluted makes a purple which though it be a lovely colour and pretty acceptable to the eye it is yet nothing comparable to the ravishing pleasure with which a curious and well-tempered green affects the eye if removing the paper the eye be placed against c d it will perceive the lower side of the sun or a candle at night which is much better because it offends not the eye and is more easily manageable to be of a deep red and if against e f it will perceive the upper part of the luminous body to be of a deep blue and these colours will appear deeper and deeper according as the rays from the luminous body fall more obliquely on the surface of the water and thereby suffer a greater refraction and the more distinct the further c d e f is removed from the trajecting whole so that upon the whole we shall find that the reason of the phenomena seems to depend upon the obliquity of the orbicular pulse to the lines of radiation and in particular that the ray c d which constitutes the scarlet has its inner parts namely those which are next to the middle of the luminous body precedent to the outermost which are contiguous to the dark and unradiating sky and that the ray e f which gives a blue has its outward part namely that which is contiguous to the dark side precedent to the pulse from the innermost which borders on the bright area of the luminous body we may observe further that the cause of the diluting of the colors towards the middle proceeds partly from the wideness of the hole through which the rays pass 
whereby the rays from several parts of the luminous body fall upon many of the same parts between c and f as is more manifest by the figure and partly also from the nature of the refraction itself for the vividness or strength of the two terminating colors arising chiefly as we have seen from the very great difference that is betwixt the outsides of these oblique undulations and the dark rays circumambient and that disparity betwixt the approximate rays decaying gradually the further inward toward the middle of the luminous body they are removed the more must the color approach to a white or an undisturbed light upon the calculation of the refraction and reflection from a ball of water or glass we have much the same phenomena namely an obliquity of the undulation in the same manner as we have found it here which because it is very much to our present purpose and affords such an instancia crucis as no one that i know has hitherto taken notice of i shall further examine for it does very plainly and positively distinguish and show which of the two hypotheses either the cartesian or this is to be followed by affording a generation of all the colors in the rainbow where according to the cartesian principles there should be none at all generated and secondly by affording an instance that does more closely confine the cause of these phenomena of colors to this present hypothesis and first for the cartesian we have this to object against it that whereas he says meteorum chapter eight section five sed judicabum unicam refractione solicet et minimu riciri et quidem talum ut ejus effectus alia contraria refractione non destruatur non experientia docet se superficies n m and n p nempe refrigentes parallele forent radios tetundem por alterum iterum erectos quantum per unum frangerentur nullos colores depicturos this principle of his holds true indeed in a prism where the refracting surfaces are plain but it is contradicted by the ball or cylinder whether of water or glass where the refracting surfaces are orbicular or cylindrical for if we examine the passage of any globule or ray of the primary iris we shall find it to pass out of the ball or cylinder again with the same inclination and refraction that it entered in withal and that that last refraction by means of the intermediate reflection shall be the same as if without any reflection at all the ray had been twice refracted by two parallel surfaces and that this is true not only in one but in every ray that goes to the constitution of the primary iris nay in every ray that suffers only two refractions and one reflection by the surface of the round body we shall presently see most evident if we repeat the cartesian scheme mentioned in the tenth section of the eighth chapter of his meteors where e f k n p in the third figure is one of the rays of the primary iris twice refracted at f and n and once reflected at k by the surface of the water ball for first it is evident that k f and k n are equal because k n being the reflected part of k f they have both the same inclination on the surface k that is the angles f k t and n k v made by the two rays and the tangent of k are equal which is evident by the laws of reflection whence it will follow also that k n has the same inclination on the surface n or the tangent of it x n that the ray k f has to the surface f or the tangent of it f y whence it must necessarily follow that the refractions at f and n are equal that is k f e and k n p are equal now that the surface n is by the reflection at k made parallel to the surface at f is evident from the principles of reflection 
for a reflection being nothing but an inverting of the rays, if we reinvert the ray KNP and make the same inclinations below the line TKV that it has above, it will be most evident that KH, the inverse of KN, will be the continuation of the line FK, and that LHI, the inverse of OX, is parallel to FY and HM, the inverse of NP, is parallel to EF, for the angle KHI is equal to KNO, which is equal to KFY, and the angle KHM is equal to KNP, which is equal to KFE, which was to be proved. So that according to the above-mentioned Cartesian principles, there should be generated no color at all in a ball of water or glass by two refractions and one reflection, which does hold most true indeed if the surfaces be plain, as may be experimented with any kind of prism where the two refracting surfaces are equally inclined to the reflecting. But in this the phenomena are quite otherwise. The cause, therefore, of the generation of color must not be what Descartes assigns, namely, a certain rotation of the globuli etheriae, which are the particles which he supposes to constitute the pellucid medium, but somewhat else, perhaps what we have lately supposed, and shall by and by further prosecute and explain. But first I shall crave leave to propound some other difficulties of his, notwithstanding exceedingly ingenious hypothesis, which I plainly confess to me seem such, and those are, first, that if light be, as is affirmed, Dioptrics, chapter 1, section 8, not so properly a motion as an action or propension to motion, I cannot conceive how the eye can come to be sensible of the verticity of a globule, which is generated in a drop of rain, perhaps a mile off from it. For that globule is not carried to the eye according to his formerly recited principle. And if not so, I cannot conceive how it can communicate its rotation or circular motion to the line of the globules between the drop and the eye. It cannot be by means of every one's turning the next before him. For if so, then only all the globules that are in the odd places must be turned the same way with the first, namely the three, five, seven, nine, eleven, etc., but all the globules interposited between them in the even places, namely the two, four, six, eight, ten, etc., must be the quite contrary, whence, according to the Cartesian hypothesis, there must be no distinct color generated, but a confusion. Next, since the Cartesian globuli are supposed, Principiorum Philosophy, Part 3, Section 86, to be each of them continually in motion about their centers, I cannot conceive how the eye is able to distinguish this new generated motion from their former inherent one, if I may so call that other wherewith they are moved, or turbinated, from some other cause than refraction." and thirdly, I cannot conceive how these motions should not happen sometimes to oppose each other, and then, instead of a rotation, there would be nothing but a direct motion generated, and consequently no color. And fourthly, I cannot conceive how by the Cartesian hypothesis it is possible to give any plausible reason of the nature of the colors generated in the thin laminae of these are microscopial observations. For in many of these, the refracting and reflecting surfaces are parallel to each other, and consequently no rotation can be generated, nor is there any necessity of a shadow or termination of the bright rays, such as is supposed, chapter 8, section 5, at preteria observavi umbram quoque, aut limitationum luminis recuri, and chapter 8, section 9, to be necessary to the generation of any distinct colors. Besides that, here is oftentimes one color generated without any of the other appendant ones, which cannot be by the Cartesian hypothesis. 
there must be therefore some other propriety of refraction that causes color and upon the examination of the thing i cannot conceive any one more general inseparable and sufficient than that which i have before assigned that we may therefore see how exactly our hypothesis agrees also with the phenomena of the refracting round body whether globe or cylinder we shall next subjoin our calculation or examine of it and to this end we will calculate any two rays as for instance let e f be a ray cutting the radius c d divided into twenty parts in g sixteen parts distant from c and lower case e f another ray which cuts the same radius in lower case g seventeen parts distant these will be refracted to k and lower case k and from thence reflected to n and lower case n and from thence refracted toward p and lower case p therefore the arch f lower case f will be five degrees five minutes the arch f k one hundred six degrees thirty minutes the arch lower case f lower case k one hundred one degrees two minutes the line f g six thousand and lower case f g five thousand two hundred sixty seven therefore lower case h f seven hundred thirty three therefore f lower case c nine hundred eighty almost the line f k sixteen thousand twenty four and lower case f k fifteen thousand four hundred thirty six therefore n lower case d one hundred ninety six and lower case n o one hundred forty seven almost the line n lower case n one thousand nineteen the arch n lower case n five degrees fifty one minutes therefore the angle n lower case n lower case o is thirty four degrees forty three minutes therefore the angle n lower case o lower case n is one hundred thirty nine degrees fifty six minutes which is almost fifty degrees more than a right angle it is evident therefore by this hypothesis that at the same time that lower case e f touches lower case f e f is arrived at lower case c and by that time lower case e f k n is got to lower case n e f k n is got to lower case d and when it touches n the pulse of the other ray is got to lower case o and no farther which is very short of the place it should have arrived to to make the ray lower case n p to cut the orbicular pulse and lower case o at right angles therefore the angle n lower case o p is an acute angle but the quite contrary of this will happen if seventeen and eighteen be calculated instead of sixteen and seventeen both which does most exactly agree with the phenomena for if the sun or a candle which is better be placed about e lower case e and the eye about p lower case p the rays e f lower case e f at sixteen and seventeen will paint the side of the luminous object toward lower case n p blue and towards upper case n p red but the quite contrary will happen when e f is seventeen and lower case e f eighteen for then towards n p shall be a blue and towards lower case n p a red exactly according to the calculation and there appears the blue of the rainbow where the two blue sides of the two images unite and there the red where the two red sides unite that is where the two images are just disappearing which is when the rays e f and n p produced till they meet like an angle of about forty one and a half the like union is there of the two images in the production of the secondary iris and the same causes as upon calculation may appear only with this difference that it is somewhat more faint by reason of the duplicate reflection which does always weaken the impulse the oftener it is repeated 
now though the second refraction made at n lower case n be convenient that is do make the rays glance the more yet is it not altogether requisite for it is plain from the calculation that the pulse dn is sufficiently oblique to the rays kn and lower case kn as well as the pulse fc is oblique to the rays fk and lower case fk and therefore if a piece of very fine paper be held close against n n and the eye look on it either through the ball as from d or from the other side as from b there shall appear a rainbow or coloured line painted on it with the part toward x appearing red towards o blue the same also shall happen if the paper be placed about k k for towards t shall appear a red and towards v a blue which does exactly agree with this my hypothesis as upon the calculation of the progress of the pulse will most easily appear nor do these two observations of the colours appearing to the eye about p differing from what they appear on the paper at n contradict each other but rather confirm and exactly agree with one another as will be evident to him that examines the reasons set down by the ingenious descartes in the twelfth section of the eighth chapter of his meteors where he gives the true reason why the colours appear of quite contrary order to the eye to what they appeared on the paper if the eye be placed instead of the paper and as in the prism so also in the water drop or globe the phenomena and the reason are much the same having therefore shown that there is such a propriety in the prism and water globule whereby the pulse is made oblique to the progressive and that so much the more by how much greater the refraction is i shall in the next place consider how this conduces to the production of colours and what kind of impression it makes upon the bottom of the eye and to this end it will be requisite to examine this hypothesis a little more particularly first therefore if we consider the manner of the progress of the pulse it will seem rational to conclude that that part or end of the pulse which precedes the other must necessarily be somewhat more obtunded or impeded by the resistance of the transparent medium than the other part or end of it which is subsequent whose ray is as it were prepared by the other especially if the adjacent medium be not in the same manner enlightened or agitated and therefore in the fourth figure of the sixth iconism the ray a a a h b will have its side h h more deadened by the resistance of the dark or quiet medium p p p whence there will be a kind of deadness superinduced on the side h h h which will continually decrease from b and strike deeper and deeper into the ray by the line br whence all the parts of the triangle r b h o will be of a dead blue colour and so much the deeper by how much the nearer they lie to the line b h h which is most deaded or impeded and so much more dilute by how much the nearer it approaches the line b r next on the other side of the ray a a n the end a of the pulse a h will be promoted or made stronger having its passage already prepared as twere by the other parts proceeding and so its impression will be stronger and because of its obliquity to the ray there will be propagated a kind of faint motion into q q the adjacent dark or quiet medium which faint motion will spread further and further into q q as the ray is propagated further and further from a namely as far as the line m a whence all the triangle m a n will be tinged with a red and that red will be the deeper the nearer it approaches the line m a and the paler or yellower the nearer it is the line n a and if the ray be continued so that the lines a n and b r which are the bounds of the red and blue diluted do meet and cross each other there will be beyond that intersection generated all kinds of greens 
Now, these being the proprieties of every single refracted ray of light, it will be easy enough to consider what must be the result of very many such rays collateral. As if we suppose infinite such rays interjacent between AKSB and ANOB, which arc the terminating. For in this case, the ray AKSB will have its red triangle entire as lying next to the dark or quiet medium, but the other side of it, BS, will have no blue, because the medium adjacent to it, SBO, is moved or enlightened, and consequently that light does destroy the color. So likewise will the ray ANOB lose its red, because the adjacent medium is moved or enlightened, but the other side of the ray that is adjacent to the dark, namely AHO, will preserve its blue entire, and these rays must be so far produced as till AN and BR cut each other, before there will be any green produced. From these proprieties, well considered, may be deduced the reasons of all the phenomena of the prism, and of the globules or drops of water which conduce to the production of the rainbow. Next, for the impression they make on the retina, we will further examine this hypothesis. Suppose, therefore, A, B, C, D, E, F, in the fifth figure, to represent the ball of the eye, on the cornea of which A, B, C, two rays G, A, C, H, and K, C, A, I, which are the terminating rays of a luminous body, falling, are by the refraction thereof collected or converged into two points at the bottom of the eye. Now, because these terminating rays, and all the intermediate ones which come from any part of the luminous body, are supposed by some sufficient refraction before they enter the eye, to have their pulses made oblique to their progression, and consequently each ray to have potentially superinduced two properties or colors, that is, a red on one side and a blue on the other, notwithstanding are never fully manifest, but when this or that ray has one or the other side of it bordering on a dark or unmoved medium, therefore as soon as these rays are entered into the eye, and so have one side of each of them bordering on a dark part of the humors of the eye, they will each of them equally exhibit some color. Therefore, ADC in the production of GACH will exhibit a blue, because the side CD is adjacent to the dark medium CQDC, but nothing of a red, because its side AD is adjacent to the enlightened medium ADFA. And all the rays that from the points of the luminous body are collected on the parts of the retina between D and F shall have their blue so much the more diluted by how much the farther these points of collection are distant from D towards F. And the ray AFC, the production of KCAI, will exhibit a red because the side AF is adjacent to the dark or quiet medium of the eye APFA but nothing of the blue, because its side, CF, is adjacent to the enlightened medium, CFDC, and all the rays from the intermediate parts of the luminous body that are collected between F and D shall have their red so much the more diluted by how much the farther they are distant from F towards D. Now, because by the refraction in the cornea, and some other parts of the eye, the sides of each ray, which before were almost parallel, are made to converge and meet in a point at the bottom of the eye, therefore that side of the pulse which proceeded before these refractions shall first touch the retina, and the other side last. And therefore, according as this or that side, or end of the pulse, shall be impeded, accordingly will the impressions on the retina be varied. Therefore, the ray GACH, refracted by the cornea to D, there shall be on that point a stroke or impression confused, whose weakest end, namely, that by the line CD, shall proceed, and the stronger, namely, that by the line AD, shall follow. 
and by the ray KCAI refracted to F, there shall be on that part a confused stroke or impression, whose strongest part, namely that by the line CF, shall proceed, and those weakest or impeded, namely that by the line AF, shall follow, and all the intermediate points between F and D shall receive impressions from the converged rays so much the more like the impressions on F and D by how much the nearer they approach that or this. From the consideration of the proprieties of which impressions, we may collect these short definitions of colors. That blue is an impression on the retina of an oblique and confused pulse of light whose weakest part proceeds and whose strongest follows. And that red is an impression on the retina of an oblique and confused pulse of light whose strongest part proceeds and whose weakest follows which proprieties, as they have been already manifested in the prism and falling drops of rain, to be the causes of the colors where generated, may be easily found to be the efficients also of the colors appearing in thin laminated transparent bodies, for the explication of which all this has been premised. And that this is so, a little closer examination of the phenomena and the figure of the body, by this hypothesis will make evident. For first, as we have already observed, the laminated body must be of a determinate thickness, that is, it must not be thinner than such a determinate quantity. For I have always observed that near the edges of those which are exceeding thin, the colors disappear, and the part grows white. Nor must it be thicker than another determinate quantity, for I have likewise observed that beyond such a thickness no colors appeared, but the plate looked white, between which two determinate thicknesses were all the colored rings, of which in some substances I have found ten or twelve, in others not half so many, which I suppose depends much upon the transparency of the laminated body. Thus through the consecutions are the same in the scum or the skin on the top of metals. Yet in those consecutions in the same color is not so often repeated as the consecutions in thin glass or in soap water, or any other transparent and glutinous liquor. For in these I have observed red, yellow, green, blue, purple, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, red, yellow, green, blue, purple, red, yellow, etc., to succeed each other ten or twelve times, but in the other more opacious bodies the consecutions will not be half so many. And therefore, secondly, the laminated body must be transparent, and this I argue from this, that I have not been able to produce any color at all with an opacious body, though never so thin. And this I have often tried, by pressing small globule of mercury between two smooth plates of glass, whereby I have reduced that body to a much greater thinness than was requisite to exhibit the colors with a transparent body. Thirdly, there must be a considerable reflecting body adjacent to the under or further side of the lamina or plate. For this I always found, that the greater that reflection was, the more vivid were the appearing colors. From which observations is most evident that the reflection from the under or further side of the body is the principal cause of the production of these colors, which, that it is so, and how it conduces to that effect, I shall further explain in the following figure, which is here described of a very great thickness, as if it had been viewed through the microscope and tis indeed much thicker than any microscope I have yet used, has been able to show me those colored plates of glass, or Muscovy glass, which I have not without much trouble viewed with it, for though I have endeavored to magnify them as much as the glasses were capable of, yet are they so exceeding thin, that I have not hitherto been able positively to determine their thickness." This figure, therefore, I here represent, is wholly hypothetical. Let ABCDHFE, in the sixth figure, 
be a frustum of muscovy glass, thinner toward the end AE, and thicker towards DF. Let us first suppose the ray, AGHB, coming from the sun, or some remote luminous object, to fall obliquely on the thinner plate BAE, part therefore is reflected back by CGHD, the first superficies, whereby the perpendicular pulse AB is after reflection propagated by CD, CD, equally remote from each other with AB, AB, so that AG plus GC, or BH plus HD, are either of them equal to AA, as is also CC, but the body BAE being transparent, a part of the light of this ray is refracted in the surface AB, and propagated by GIKH to the surface EF, whence it is reflected and refracted again by the surface AB. So that after the two refractions, and one reflection, there is propagated a kind of fainter ray, EMNF, whose pulse is not only weaker by reason of the two refractions in the surface AB, but by reason of the time spent in passing and repassing between the two surfaces AB and EF. EF, which is this fainter or weaker pulse, comes behind the pulse CD, so that hereby, the surfaces AB and EF being so near together so that the eye cannot discriminate them from one, this confused or duplicated pulse, whose strongest part proceeds and whose weakest follows, does produce on the retina, or the optic nerve that covers the bottom of the eye, the sensation of a yellow. And secondly, this yellow will appear so much the deeper by how much the further back towards the middle between CD and CD the spurious pulse EF is removed, as in two, where the surface BC being further removed from EF, the weaker pulse EF will be nearer to the middle, and will make an impression on the eye of a red. But thirdly, if the two reflecting surfaces be yet further removed asunder, as in 3, C, D, and E, F, R, then will the weaker pulse be so far behind that it will be more than half the distance between C, D, and C, D. And in this case, it will rather seem to precede the following stronger pulse than to follow the preceding one, and consequently a blue will be generated. And when the weaker pulse is just in the middle between two strong ones, then is a deep and lovely purple generated. But when the weaker pulse EF is very near to CD, then there is generated a green, which will be bluer or yellower according as the approximate weak pulse does proceed or follow the stronger. Now, fourthly, if the thicker plate chance to be cleft into two thinner plates, as CDFE is divided into two plates by the surface GH, then from the composition arising from the three reflections in the surfaces CD, GH, and EF, there will be generated several compounded or mixed colors, which will be very differing, according as the proportion between the thicknesses of those two divided plates, CDHG and GHFE, are varied. And fifthly, if these surfaces CD and FE are further removed asunder, the weaker pulse will yet lag behind much further, and not only be coincident with the second, CD, but lag behind that also, and that so much the more by how much the thicker the plate be, so that by degrees it will be coincident with the third CD backward also, and by degrees, as the plate grows thicker with a fourth, and so onward to a fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth, so that if there be a thin transparent body, that from the greatest thinness requisite to produce colors, does, in the manner of a wedge, by degrees grow to the greatest thickness that a plate can be of, to exhibit a color by the reflection of light from such a body, there shall be generated several consecutions of colors, whose order from the thin end towards the thick, shall be yellow, red, purple, blue, green, 
yellow red purple blue green yellow red purple blue green yellow etc and these so often repeated as the weaker pulse does lose paces with its primary or first pulse and its coincident with a second third fourth fifth sixth etc pulse behind the first and this as it is coincident or follows from the first hypothesis i took of colors so upon experiment have i found it in multitudes of instances that seem to prove it one thing which seems of the greatest concern in this hypothesis is to determine the greatest or least thicknesses requisite for these effects which though i have not been wanting in attempting yet so exceeding thin are these colored plates and so imperfect our microscope that i have not been hitherto successful though if my endeavours shall answer my expectations i shall hope to gratify the curious reader with some things more removed beyond our reach hitherto thus have i with as much brevity as i was able endeavoured to explicate hypothetically at least the causes of the phenomena i formerly recited on the consideration of which i have been the more particular first because i think these i have newly given are capable of explicating all the phenomena of colours not only of those appearing in the prism water drop or rainbow and in laminated or plated bodies but of all that are in the world whether they be fluid or solid bodies whether in thick or thin whether transparent or seemingly opacious as i shall in the next observation further endeavour to show and secondly because this being one of the two ornaments of all bodies discoverable by the sight whether looked on with or without a microscope it seemed to deserve somewhere in this tract which contains a description of the figure and colour of some minute bodies to be somewhat the more intimately inquired into End of section 14。section 15 of micrographia。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit librivox org。micrographia。by robert hook。section 15。observation 10。of metalline。and other real colors having in the former discourse from the fundamental cause of color made it probable that there are but two colors and shown that the phantasm of color is caused by the sensation of the oblique or uneven pulse of light which is capable of no more varieties than two that arise from the two sides of the oblique pulse though each of those be capable of infinite gradations or degrees each of them beginning from white and ending the one in the deepest scarlet or yellow the other in the deepest blue i shall in this section set down some observations which i have made of other colors such as metalline powders tinging or colored bodies and several kinds of tinctures or tinged liquors all which together with those i treated of in the former observation will i suppose comprise the several subjects in which color is observed to be inherent and the several manners by which it inheres or is apparent in them and here i shall endeavor to show by what composition all kind of compound colors are made and how there is no color in the world but may be made from the various degrees of these two colors together with the intermixtures of black and white and this being so i shall anon show it seems an evident argument to me that all colors whatsoever whether in fluid or solid whether in very transparent or seemingly opacious have the same efficient cause to wit some kind of refraction whereby the rays that proceed from such bodies have their pulse obligated or confused in the manner i explicated in the former section that is a red 
is caused by a duplicated or confused pulse whose strongest pulse precedes and a weaker follows and a blue is caused by a confused pulse where the weaker pulse precedes and the stronger follows and according as these are more or less or variously mixed and compounded so are the sensations and consequently the phantasms of colors diversified to proceed therefore i suppose that all transparent colored bodies whether fluid or solid do consist at least of two parts or two kinds of substances the one of a substance of a somewhat differing refraction from the other that one of these substances which may be called the tinging substance does consist of distinct parts or particles of a determinate bigness which are disseminated or dispersed all over the other that these particles if the body be equally and uniformly colored are evenly ranged and dispersed over the other contiguous body that where the body is deepest tinged there these particles are ranged thickest and where it is but faintly tinged they are ranged much thinner but uniformly that by the mixture of another body that unites with either of these which has a differing refraction from either of the other quite differing effects will be produced that is the consecutions of the confused pulses will be much of another kind and consequently produce other sensations and phantasms of color and from a red may turn to a blue or from a blue to a red etc now that this may be better understood i shall endeavor to explain my meaning a little more sensible by a scheme suppose we therefore in the seventh figure of the sixth scheme that a b c d represents a vessel holding a tinged liquor let the group of eyes etc be the clear liquor and let the tinging body that is mixed with it be double e etc double f etc double g etc double h etc whose particles whether round or some other determinate figure is little to our purpose are first of a determinate and equal bulk next they are ranged into the forms of quincunx or equilatero triangular order which that probably they are so and why they are so i shall elsewhere endeavor to show thirdly they are of such a nature as does either more easily or more difficultly transmit the rays of light than the liquor if more easily a blue is generated and if more difficultly a red or scarlet and first let us suppose the tinging particles to be of a substance that does more impede the rays of light we shall find that the pulse or wave of light moved from a d to b c will proceed on through the containing medium by the pulses or waves double k double l double m double n double o but because several of these rays that go to the constitution of these pulses will be slugged or stopped by the tinging particles e f g and h therefore there shall be secondary and weak pulse that shall follow the ray namely p p which will be the weaker first because it has suffered many refractions in the impeding body next for that the rays will be a little dispersed or confused by reason of the refraction in each of the particles whether round or angular and this will be more evident if we a little more closely examine any one particular tinging globule suppose we therefore a b in the eighth figure of the sixth scheme to represent a tinging globule or particle which has a greater refraction than the liquor in which it is contained let c d be a part of the pulse of light which is propagated through the containing medium this pulse will be a little stopped or impeded by the globule and so by that time the pulse is passed to e f that part of it 
which has been impeded by passing through the globule, will get but to LM, and so that pulse which has been propagated through the globule, to wit, LM, NO, PQ, will always come behind the pulses EF, GH, IK, etc. Next, by reason of the greater impediment in AB and its globular figure, the rays that pass through it will be dispersed, and very much scattered. Whence CA and DB, which before went direct and parallel, will, after the refraction in AB, diverge and spread by AP and BQ, so that as the rays do meet with more and more of these tinging particles in their way, by so much the more will the pulse of light further lag behind the clearer pulse, or that which has fewer refractions, and thence the deeper will the color be, and the fainter the light that is trajected through it. For not only many rays are reflected from the surfaces of A and B, but those rays that get through it are very much disordered. By this hypothesis, there is no one experiment of color that I have yet met with, but may be, I conceive, very rationally solved, and perhaps, had I time to examine several particulars requisite to the demonstration of it, I might prove it more than probable, for all the experiments about the changes in mixing of colors related in the treatise of colors published by the incomparable Mr. Boyle, and multitudes of others which I have observed, do so easily and naturally flow from those principles, that I am very apt to think it probable that they own their production to no other secondary cause, as to instance in two or three experiments. In the twentieth experiment, this noble author has shown that the deep bluish-purple color of violets may be turned into a green by alkalizate salts, and to a red by acid. That is, a purple consists of two colors, a deep red and a deep blue. When the blue is diluted or altered or destroyed by acid salts, the red becomes predominant. But when the red is diluted by alkalizite, and the blue heightened, there is generated a green, for of a red diluted is made a yellow, and yellow and blue make green. Now, because the spurious pulses, which cause a red and a blue, do the one follow the clear pulse and the other precede it, it usually follows that those saline refracting bodies which do dilate the color of the one do deepen that of the other, and this will be made manifest by almost all kinds of purples, and many sorts of greens. Both these colors, consisting of mixed colors, for if we suppose A and A in the ninth figure to represent the two pulses of clear light which follow each other at a convenient distance, A A, each of which has a spurious pulse preceding it, as B B, which makes a blue, and another following it, as C C, which makes a red, the one caused by tinging particles that have a greater refraction, the other by others that have a less refracting quality than the liquor or menstruum in which these are dissolved, whatsoever liquor does not alter the refraction of the one, without altering that of the other part of the tinged liquor, must needs very much alter the color of the liquor. For if the refraction of the dissolvent be increased, and the refraction of the tinging particles not altered, then will the proceeding spurious pulse be shortened or stopped, and not outrun the clear pulse so much, so that BB will become EE, and the blue be diluted, whereas the other spurious pulse which follows will be made to lag much more, and be further behind AA than before, and CC will become FF, and so the yellow or red will be heightened. A saline liquor, therefore, mixed with another tinged liquor, may alter the color of it several ways, either by altering the refraction of the liquor in which the color swims, or secondly, by varying the refraction of the colored particles, 
by uniting more intimately either with some particular corpuscles of the tinging body or with all of them according as it has a congruity to some more especially or to all alike or thirdly by uniting and interweaving itself with some other body that is already joined with the tinging particles with which substance it may have a congruity though it have very little with the particles themselves or fourthly it may alter the color of a tinged liquor by disjoining certain particles which were before united with the tinging particles which though they were somewhat congruous to these particles have yet a greater congruity with the newly infused saline menstruum it may likewise alter the color by further dissolving the tinging substance into smaller and smaller particles and so diluting the color or by uniting several particles together as in precipitations and so deepening it and some such other ways which many experiments and comparisons of differing trials together might easily inform one of from these principles applied may be made out all the varieties of colors observable either in liquors or any other tinged bodies with great ease and i hope intelligible enough there being nothing in the notion of color or in the supposed production but is very conceivable and may be possible the greatest difficulty that i find against this hypothesis is that there seems to be more distinct colors than two that is than yellow and blue this objection is grounded on this reason that there are several reds which diluted make not a saffron or pale yellow and therefore red or scarlet seems to be a third color distinct from a deep degree of yellow to which i answer that saffron affords us a deep scarlet tincture which may be diluted into as pale a yellow as any either by making a weak solution of the saffron by infusing a small parcel of it into a great quantity of liquor as in spirit of wine or else by looking through a very thin quantity of the tincture and which may be heightened into the loveliest scarlet by looking through a very thick body of this tincture or through a thinner parcel of it which is highly impregnated with the tinging body by having had a greater quantity of the saffron dissolved in a smaller parcel of the liquor now though there may be some particles of other tinging bodies that give a lovely scarlet also which though diluted never so much with liquor or looked on through never so thin a parcel of tinged liquor will not yet afford a pale yellow but only a kind of faint red yet this is no argument but that those tinged particles may have in them the faintest degree of yellow though we may be unable to make them exhibit it for that power of being diluted depending upon the divisibility of the tinged body if i am unable to make the tinging particle so thin as to exhibit that color it does not therefore follow that the thing is impossible to be done now the tinging particles of some bodies are of such a nature that unless there be found some way of comminuting them into less bulks than the liquor does dissolve them into all the rays that pass through them must necessarily receive a tincture so deep as their appropriate refractions and bulks compared with the proprieties of the dissolving liquor must necessarily dispose them to impress which may perhaps be a pretty deep yellow or pale red and that this is not gratis dictum i shall add one instance of this kind wherein the thing is most manifest if you take blue smalt you shall find that to afford the deepest blue which cateris paribus has the greatest particles or sands and if you further divide or grind those particles on a grindstone or periphery stone you may by comminuting the sands of it dilute the blue into as pale as one as you please which you cannot do by laying the color thin for wheresoever any single particle is 
it exhibits as deep a blue as the whole mass now there are other blues which though never so much ground will not be diluted by grinding because consisting of very small particles very deeply tinged they cannot by grinding be actually separated into smaller particles than the operation of the fire or some other dissolving menstruum reduced them to already thus all kind of metalline colors whether precipitated sublimed calcined or otherwise prepared are hardly changed by grinding as ultramarine is not more diluted nor is vermilion or red lead made of a more faint color by grinding for the smallest particles of these which i have viewed with my greatest magnifying glass if they be well enlightened appear very deeply tinged with their peculiar colors nor though have i magnified and enlightened the particles exceedingly could i in many of them perceive them to be transparent or to be whole particles but the smallest specks that i could find among the well-ground vermilion and red lead seem to be a red mass compounded of a multitude of less and less motes which sticking together composed a bulk not one thousand thousandth part of the smallest viable sand or moat and this i find generally in most metalline colors that though they consist of parts so exceedingly small yet are they very deeply tinged they being so ponderous and having such a multitude of terrestrial particles thronged into a little room so that tis difficult to find any particle transparent or resembling a precious stone though not impossible for i have observed divers such shining and resplendent colors intermixed with the particles of cinnabar both natural and artificial before it hath been ground and broken or flawed into vermilion as i have also in orpiment red lead and bice which makes me suppose that those metalline colors are by grinding not only broken and separated actually into smaller pieces but that they are also flawed and bruised whence they for the most part become opacious like flawed crystal or glass etc but for smalts and verditures i have been able with a microscope to perceive their particles very many of them transparent now that the others also may be transparent though they do not appear so to the microscope may be made probable by this experiment that if you take amyl that is almost opacious and grind it very well on a porphyry or serpentine the small particles will by reason of their flaws appear perfectly opacious and that tis the flaws that produce this opaciousness may be argued from this that particles of the same amyl, much thicker if unflawed, will appear somewhat transparent even to the eye, and from this also that the most transparent and clear crystal, if heated in the fire and then suddenly quenched, so that it be all over flawed, will appear opacious and white. And that the particles of metalline colors are transparent may be argued yet further from this, that the crystals or vitriols of all metals are transparent which since they consist of metalline as well as saline particles those metalline ones must be transparent which is yet further confirmed from this that they have for the most part appropriate colors so the vitriol of gold is yellow of copper blue and sometimes green of iron green of tin and lead a pale white of silver a pale blue etc and next the solution of all metals into menstruums are much the same with the vitriols or crystals it seems therefore very probable that those colors which are made by the precipitation of those particles out of the menstruums by transparent precipitating liquors should be transparent also thus gold precipitates with oil of tartar or spirit of urine into a brown yellow copper with spirit of urine into a mucous blue which retains its transparency 
a solution of sublimate as the same illustrious author i lately mentioned shows in his number forty experiment precipitates with oil of tartar per deliquium into an orange-colored precipitate nor is it less probable that the calcination of those vitriols by the fire should have their particles transparent thus saccharum saturni or the vitriol of lead by calcination becomes a deep orange-colored minium which is a kind of precipitation of some salt which proceeds from the fire common vitriol calcine yields a deep brown red etc a third argument that the particles of metals are transparent is that being calcined and melted with glass they tinge the glass with transparent colors thus the calx of silver tinges the glass on which it is annealed with a lovely yellow or gold color etc and that the parts of metals are transparent may be farther argued from the transparency of leaf gold which held against the light both to the naked eye and the microscope exhibits a deep green and though i have never seen the other metals laminated so thin that i was able to perceive them transparent yet for copper or brass if we had the same conveniency for laminating them as we have for gold we might perhaps through such plates or leaves find very differing degrees of blue or green for it seems very probable that those rays that rebound from them tinged with a deep yellow or pale red as from copper or with a pale yellow as from brass have passed through them for i cannot conceive how by reflection alone those rays can receive a tincture taking any hypothesis extant so that we see there may be a sufficient reason be drawn from these instances why those colors which we are unable to dilute to the palest yellow or blue or green are not therefore to be concluded not to be a deeper degree of them for supposing we had a great company of small globular essence bottles or round glass bubbles about the bigness of a walnut filled each of them with a very deep mixture of saffron and that every one of them did appear of a deep scarlet color and all of them together did exhibit at a distance a deep dyed scarlet body it does not follow because after we have come nearer to this congeries or mass and divided it into its parts and examining each of its parts severally or apart we find them to have much the same color with the whole mass it does not i say therefore follow that if we could break those globules smaller or any other ways come to see a smaller or thinner parcel of the tinged liquor that filled those bubbles that that tinged liquor must always appear red or of a scarlet hue since if experiment be made the quite contrary will ensue for it is capable of being diluted into the palest yellow now that i might avoid all the objections of this kind by exhibiting an experiment that might by ocular proof convince those whom other reasons would not prevail with i provided me a prismatical glass made hollow just in the form of a wedge such as is represented in the tenth figure of the sixth scheme the two parallelogram sides a b c d a b e f which met at a point were made of the clearest looking glass plates well ground and polished that i could get these were joined with hard cement to the triangular sides b c e a d f which were of wood the parallelogram base b c e f likewise was of wood joined on to the rest with hard cement and the whole prismatical box was exactly stopped everywhere but only a little hole near the base was left whereby the vessel could be filled with any liquor or emptied again at pleasure one of these boxes for i had two of them i filled with a pretty deep tincture of aloes drawn only with fair water and then stopped the hole with a piece of wax 
then by holding this wedge against the light and looking through it it was obvious enough to see the tincture of the liquor near the edge of the wedge where it was but very thin to be a pale but well-coloured yellow and further and further from the edge as the liquor grew thicker and thicker this tincture appeared deeper and deeper so that near the blunt end which was seven inches from the edge and three inches and a half thick it was of a deep and well-coloured red now the clearer and purer this tincture be the more lovely will the deep scarlet be and the fouler the tincture be the more dirty will the red appear so that some dirty tinctures have afforded their deepest red much of the color of burnt ochre or spanish brown others as lovely a color as vermilion and some much brighter but several others according as the tinctures were worse or more foul exhibited various kinds of red of very differing degrees the other of these wedges i filled with a most lovely tincture of copper drawn from the fillings of it with spirit of urine and this wedge held as the former against the light afforded all manner of blues from the faintest to the deepest so that i was in good hope by these two to have produced all the varieties of colours imaginable for i thought by these means to have been able by placing the two parallelogram sides together and the edges contrary ways to have so moved them to and fro one by another as by looking through them in several places and through several thicknesses i should have compounded and consequently have seen all those colours which by other like compositions of colours would have ensued but instead of meeting with what i looked for i met with somewhat more admirable and that was that i found myself utterly unable to see through them when placed both together though they were transparent enough when asunder and though i could see through twice the thickness when both of them were filled with the same coloured liquors whether both with the yellow or both with the blue yet when one was filled with the yellow and the other with the blue and both looked through they both appeared dark only when the parts near the tops were looked through they exhibited greens and those a very great variety as i expected but the purples and other colours i could not by any means make whether i endeavoured to look through them both against the sun or whether i placed them against the whole of a darkened room but notwithstanding this misguessing i proceeded on with my trial in a dark room and having two holes near one another i was able by placing my wedges against them to mix the tinged rays that passed through them and fell on a sheet of white paper held at a convenient distance from them as i pleased so that i could make the paper appear of what colour i would by varying the thickness of the wedges and consequently the tincture of the rays that passed through the two holes and sometimes also by varying the paper that is instead of a white paper holding a grey or a black piece of paper whence i experimentally found what i had before imagined that all the varieties of colours imaginable are produced from several degrees of these two colours namely yellow and blue or the mixture of them with light and darkness that is white and black and all those almost infinite varieties which limmers and painters are able to make by compounding those several colours they lay on their shells or pallids are nothing else but some compositum made up of some one or more or all of these four now whereas it may here again be objected that neither can the reds be made out of the yellows added together or laid on in greater or lesser quantity nor can the yellows be made out of the reds though laid never so thin and as for the addition of white or black they do nothing but either whiten or darken the colours to which they are added and not at all make them of any other kind of colour as for instance vermilion by being tempered with white lead does not at all grow more yellow but only there is made a whiter kind of red nor does yellow ochre 
though laid never so thick produce a color of vermilion nor though it be tempered with black does it at all make a red nay though it be tempered with white it will not afford a fainter kind of yellow such as masticut but only a whitened yellow nor will the blues be diluted or deepened after the manner i speak of as indigo will never afford so fine a blue as ultramarine or bice nor will it tempered with vermilion ever afford a green though each of them be never so much tempered with white to which i answer that there is a great difference between diluting a color and whitening of it for diluting a color is to make the colored parts more thin so that the tinged light which is made by trajecting those tinged bodies does not receive so deep a tincture but whitening a color is only an intermixing of many clear reflections of light among the same tinged parts deepening also and darkening or blackening the color are very different for deepening the color is to make the light pass through a greater quantity of the same tinging body and darkening or blackening a color is only interposing a multitude of dark or black spots among the same tinged parts or placing the color in a more faint light first therefore as to the former of these operations that is diluting and deepening most of the colors used by the limners and painters are incapable of to wit vermilion and red lead and ochre because the tinged parts are so exceeding small that the most curious grindstones we have are not able to separate them into parts actually divided so small as the tinged particles are for looking on the most curiously ground vermilion and ochre and red lead i could perceive that even those small corpuscles of the bodies they left were compounded of many pieces that is they seemed to be small pieces compounded of a multitude of lesser tinged parts each piece seeming almost like a piece of red glass or tinged crystal all flawed so that unless the grindstone could actually divide them into smaller pieces than those flawed particles were which compounded that tinged moat i could see with my microscope it would be impossible to dilute the color by grinding which because the finest we have will not reach to do in vermilion or ochre therefore they cannot at all or very hardly be diluted other colors indeed whose tinged particles are such as may be smaller by grinding their color may be diluted thus several of the blues may be diluted as smalt and bice and masticut which is yellow may be made more faint and even vermilion itself may by too much grinding be brought to the color of red lead which is but an orange color which is confessed by all to be very much upon the yellow now though perhaps somewhat of this diluting of vermilion by overmuch grinding may be attributed to the grindstone or muller for that some of their parts may be worn off and mixed with the color yet these seem not very much for i have done it on a serpentine stone with a muller made of a pebble and yet observed the same effect follow and secondly as to the other of these operations on colors that is the deepening of them linners and painters colors are for the most part also uncapable for they being for the most part opacious and that opaciousness as i said before proceeding from the particles being very much flawed unless we are able to join and reunite those flawed particles again into one piece we shall not be able to deepen the color which since we are unable to do so with most of the colors which are by painters accounted opacious we are therefore unable to deepen them by adding more of the same kind but because all these opacious colors have two kinds of beams or rays reflected from them that is rays untinged which are only reflected from the outward surface without at all penetrating of the body and tinged rays which are reflected from the inward surfaces 
or flaws after they have suffered a twofold refraction and because the transparent liquors mixed with such corpuscles do for the most part take off the former kind of reflection therefore these colors mixed with water or oil appear much deeper than when dry for most part of that white reflection from the outward surface is removed nay some of these colors are very much deepened by the mixture and some transparent liquor and that because they may perhaps get between these two flaws and so consequently join two or more of those flawed pieces together but this happens but in a very few now to show that all this is not gratis dictum i shall set down some experiments which do manifest these things to be probable and likely which i have here delivered for first if you take any tinged liquor whatsoever especially if it be pretty deeply tinged and by any means work it into a froth the congeries of that froth shall seem an opacious body and appear of the same colour but much whiter than that of the liquor out of which it is made for the abundance of reflections of the rays against those surfaces of the bubbles of which the froth consists does so often rebound the rays backwards that little or no light can pass through and consequently the froth appears opacious again if to any of these tinged liquors that will endure the boiling there be added a small quantity of fine flour the parts of which through the microscope are plainly enough to be perceived to consist of transparent corpuscles and suffer to boil till it thickens the liquor the mass of the liquor will appear opacious and tinged with the same color but very much whitened thus if you take a piece of transparent glass that is well colored and by heating it and then quenching it in water you flaw it all over it will become opacious and will exhibit the same color with which the piece is tinged but fainter and whiter or if you take a pipe of this transparent glass and in the flame of a lamp melt it and then blow it into very thin bubbles then break those bubbles and collect a good parcel of those laminae together in a paper you shall find that a small thickness of those plates will constitute an opacious body and that you may see through the mass of glass before it be thus laminated above four times the thickness and besides they will now afford a color by reflection as other opacious as they are called colors will but much fainter and whiter than that of the lump or pipe out of which they were made thus also if you take putty and melt it with any transparent colored glass it will make it become an opacious colored lump and to yield a paler and whiter color than the lump by reflection the same thing may be done by preparation of antimony as has been shown by the learned physician dr c m in his excellent observations and notes on neri's art of glass and by this means all transparent colors become opacious or amels and though by being ground they lose very much of their color growing much whiter by reason of the multitude of single reflections from their outward surface as i showed afore yet the fire that in the kneeling or melting reunites them and so renews those spurious reflections removes all those whitenings of the color that proceed from them as for the other colors which painters use which are transparent and used to varnish over all other paintings tis well enough known that the laying of them thinner or thicker does very much dilute or deepen their color painters colors therefore consisting most of them of solid particles so small that they cannot be either reunited into thicker particles by any art yet known and consequently cannot be deepened or divided into particles so small as the flawed particles that exhibit that color much less into smaller and consequently cannot be diluted it is necessary that they which are to imitate all kinds of colors should have as many degrees of each color as can be procured and to this purpose 
both limners and painters have a very great variety both of yellows and blues besides several other colored bodies that exhibit very compounded colors such as greens and purples and others that are compounded of several degrees of yellow or several degrees of blue sometimes unmixed and sometimes compounded with several other colored bodies the yellows from the palest to the deepest red or scarlet which has no intermixture of blue are pale and deep masticut or piment english ochre brown ochre red lead and vermilion burnt english ochre and burnt brown ochre which last have a mixture of dark or dirty parts with them etc their blues are several kinds of smalts and verditures and bice and ultramarine and indico which last has many dirty or dark parts intermixed with it their compounded colored bodies as pink and vertigris which are greens the one a pomping may the other a sea green then lack which is a very lovely purple to which may be added their black and white which they also usually call colors of each of which they have several kinds such as bone black made of ivory burnt in a close vessel and blue black made of the small coal of willow or some other wood and cullen's earth which is a kind of brown black etc their usual whites are either artificial or natural white lead the last of which is the best they have yet and with the mixing and tempering of these colors together are they able to make an imitation of any color whatsoever their reds or deep yellows they can dilute by mixing pale yellows with them and deepen their pale by mixing deeper with them for it is not with opacous colors as it is with transparent whereby adding more yellow to yellow it is deepened but in opacious diluted they can whiten any color by mixing white with it and darken any color by mixing black or some dark and dirty color and in a word most of the colors or colored bodies they use in limning and painting are such as though mixed with any other of their colors they preserve their own you and by being in such very small parts dispersed through the other colored bodies they both or altogether represent to the eye a compositum of all the eye being enabled by reason of their smallness to distinguish the peculiarly colored particles but receives them as one entire compositum whereas in many of these the microscope can easily distinguish each of the compounding colors distinct and exhibiting its own color thus have i by gently mixing vermilion and bice dry produced a very fine purple or mixed color but looking on it with the microscope i could easily distinguish both the red and the blue particles which did not at all produce the phantasm of purple to sum up all therefore in a word i have not yet found any solid colored body that i have yet examined perfectly opacious but those that are at least transparent are metalline and mineral bodies whose particles generally seeming either to be very small or very much flawed appear for the most part opacious though there are very few of them that i have looked on with a microscope that have not very plainly or circumstantially manifested themselves transparent and indeed there seems to be so few bodies in the world that are minimus opacious that i think one may make it a rational query whether there be any body absolutely thus opacious for i doubt not at all and i have taken notice of very many circumstances that make me of this mind that could we very much improve the microscope we might be able to see all those bodies very plainly transparent which we are now fain only to guess at by circumstances nay the object glasses we yet make use of are such that they make many transparent bodies to the eye seem opacious through them 
which if we widen the aperture a little and cast more light on the objects and not charge the glasses so deep will again disclose their transparency now as for all kinds of colors that are dissolvable in water or other liquors there is nothing so manifest as that all those tinged liquors are transparent and many of them are capable of being diluted and compounded or mixed with other colors and divers of them are capable of being very much changed and heightened and fixed with several kinds of saline menstruums others of them upon compounding destroy or vitiate each other's colors and precipitate or otherwise very much alter each other's tincture in the true ordering and diluting and deepening and mixing and fixing of each of which consists one of the greatest mysteries of the dyers of which particulars because our microscope affords us very little information i shall add nothing more at present but only that with a very few tinctures ordered and mixed after certain ways too long to be here set down i have been able to make an appearance of all the various colors imaginable without at all using the help of salts or saline menstruums to vary them as for the mutation of colors by saline menstruums they have already been so fully and excellently handled by the lately mentioned incomparable author that i can add nothing but that of a multitude of trials that i made i have found them exactly to agree with his rules and theories and though there may be infinite instances yet may they be reduced under a few heads and comprised within a very few rules and generally i find that saline menstruums are most operative upon those colors that are purple or have some degree of purple in them and upon the other colors much less the spurious pulses that compose which being as i formerly noted so very near the middle between the true ones that a small variation throws them both to one side or both to the other and so consequently must make a vast mutation in the formerly appearing color end of section fifteen section sixteen of micrographia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Micrographia by Robert Hooke. Section 16. Observation 11. Of figures observed in small sand. Sand generally seems to be nothing else but exceedingly small pebbles, or at least some very small parcels of a bigger stone. The whiter kind seems, through the microscope, to consist of small transparent pieces of some pellucid body each of them looking much like a piece of alum or salt gem and this kind of sand is angled for the most part irregularly without any certain shape and the granules of it are for the most part flawed though amongst many of them it is not difficult to find some that are perfectly pellucid like a piece of clear crystal and divers likewise most curiously shaped much after the manner of the bigger styrie of crystal or like the small diamonds i observed in certain flints of which i shall by and by relate which last particular seems to argue that this kind of sand is not made by the comminution of greater transparent crystalline bodies but by the concretion or coagulation of water or some other fluid body there are other kinds of coarser sands which are browner and have their particles much bigger these viewed with a microscope seem much coarser and more opacous substances and most of them are of some irregularly rounded figures and they seem not so opacious as to the naked eye yet they seem very foul and cloudy but neither do these want curiously transparent no more than they do regularly figured and well-coloured particles 
as I have often found. There are multitudes of other kinds of sands, which in many particulars, plainly enough discoverable by the microscope, differ both from these last mentioned kinds of sands and from one another. There seeming to be as great variety of sands as there is of stones, and as amongst stones some are called precious from their excellency, so also are there sands which deserve the same epithet for their beauty for viewing a small parcel of east india sand which was given me by my highly honoured friend mr daniel colwall and since that another parcel much of the same kind i found several of them both very transparent like precious stones and regularly figured like crystal cornish diamonds some rubies etc and also tinged with very lively and deep colours like rubies sapphires emeralds etc these kinds of granules i have often found also in english sand and tis easy to make such a counterfeit sand with deeply tinged glass enamels and painters colours it were endless to describe the multitudes of figures i have met with in these kind of minute bodies such as spherical oval pyramidal conical prismatical of each of which kinds i have taken notice but among many others i met with none more observable than this pretty shell described in the figure ten of the fifth scheme which though as it was lied on by chance deserved to have been omitted i being unable to direct any one to find the like yet for its rarity was it not inconsiderable especially upon the account of the information it may afford us for by it we have a very good instance of the curiosity of nature in another kind of animals which are removed by reason of their minuteness beyond the reach of our eyes so that as there are several sorts of insects as mites and others so small as not yet to have had any names some of which i shall afterwards describe and small fishes as leeches in vinegar and small vegetables as moss and rose leaf plants and small mushrooms as mould so there are it seems small shellfish likewise nature showing her curiosity in every tribe of animals vegetables and minerals i was trying several small and single magnifying glasses and casually viewing a parcel of white sand when i perceived one of the grains exactly shaped and wreathed like a shell but endeavouring to distinguish it with my naked eye it was so very small that i was fain again to make use of the glass to find it then whilst i thus looked on it with a pin i separated all the rest of the granules of sand and found it afterwards to appear to the naked eye an exceeding small white spot no bigger than the point of a pin afterwards i viewed it every way with a better microscope and found it on both sides and edgeways to resemble the shell of a small water snail with a flat spiral shell it had twelve wreathings a b c d e etc all very proportionably growing one less than another toward the middle or centre of the shell where there was a very small round white spot i could not certainly discover whether the shell were hollow or not but it seemed filled with somewhat and tis probable that it might be petrified as other large shells often are such as are mentioned in the seventeenth observation. End of section sixteen.